Winter Long by Mason Cross. This book is read by Eric Myers. Prologue to Human Siberia. The American walked into Anatoly's at five minutes after one in the morning. He paused at the door to cast his eyes around the interior before selecting his usual seat at the far end of the bar. He knew the heat from the open fire would be welcome once it worked its way past the numbness in his face. There were no other late-night customers tonight, which suited him fine. The bartender caught his eye and nodded, letting him know he would be over in a minute with his usual. That gave him time to take the top layers off and make himself comfortable. He removed the bulky gloves first, and then his headgear, a big wool-lined trapper hat with flaps that came down over the ears. He placed the gloves and hat on the bench beside him, and then unbuttoned his heavy quilted coat. He heaved the weighty garment off his shoulders and dropped it on the bench. Finally, he removed his sweater and allowed the warmth of the fire to begin working its way into his extremities. It wasn't the cold that got to you, he often thought. Not directly. The cold was manageable, as long as you prepared for it. It was that constant preparation that ground you down. The coping, the managing, the careful building up and removing of layers just to be able to survive and function in this environment at this time of year. The constant mindfulness required merely to exist. He had caught a documentary on one of the local channels a couple of nights ago about the space race. Naturally, it was told from the Soviet point of view, favoring Gagarin and Tereshkova over Glenn and Armstrong, but some things were universal. He thought he knew a little of what it was like to be a cosmonaut, preparing oneself to be somewhere human beings weren't meant to be. From the perspective of a late night in early December, it was hard to escape the conclusion that human should be added to that list. The bartender was finally getting around to drawing his beer from the tap when the door creaked open and a gust of freezing wind blew in. He looked over to see two people enter. As far as it was possible to tell from their winter clothing, they were both men, reasonably tall. They wore hats and coats as bulky as his own. Beyond that, it was impossible to know anything about them, age, weight, even race, until they revealed themselves. The bartender swaggered over to him, ignoring the newcomers. He was a brawny Armenian, wearing a quilted checkered shirt that showed tattoos on his neck and creeping out onto the backs of his hands. He looked like a side of beef with a goatee. The bartender placed the beer beside him, and the American nodded. Spasiba, he said in acknowledgement. He kept his eyes surreptitiously on the two newcomers. There was nothing outwardly suspicious about them, probably just local men finishing a shift at one of the nearby factories. They hadn't so much as glanced in his direction, but it paid to keep his eyes open anyway. That was why he always took this seat, with its unobstructed view of the door. Mindfulness living according to one's circumstances. He took a sip of the beer and grimaced, remembering for the hundredth time how much he missed home, or anywhere that wasn't here, for that matter. Tuman hadn't been so bad when he had arrived in the summer, when it was relatively warm. The job paid well and the contract was open-ended. It wasn't a difficult assignment. Some close protection, some investigation, the occasional requirement for mild rough stuff, the kind of job he could do in his sleep. The two men had almost completed the arduous process of shedding their outdoor wear, and he could see that they were both Caucasian, young, and in good shape. His internal warning system upgraded them a couple of notches. There was no point keeping one's eyes open, always selecting a seat with a view of the door, if you didn't evaluate every potential threat. He had a scale that went up to ten, and he mentally assessed everyone he came into contact with on that scale. These two were nothing to cause undue concern, not so far. They had moved up to a three on the scale now, 
almost certainly they were nothing more than what they appeared to be. He logged several instances of a three or four on the scale every month. He took another drink and looked up at the television screen hanging on the wall. It was tuned to Russia Today, all the news that's fit to broadcast. All the news Putin wanted broadcast anyway. They were covering a train crash out in Moscow, but he wasn't really paying attention. He was concentrating on watching the two men out of the corner of his eye. If they had noticed him, they gave no indication. One was watching the TV, the other trying to signal the bartender, who was making a point of keeping them waiting while drying a glass. The American had been here a number of times now, and he noticed the bartender was never so diligent at glass polishing as when there was a customer waiting. But then one of the men produced something from his pocket. It was a large silver hip flask. The man moved his hat on the table to conceal his action from the bartender and then placed the hip flask behind it at a very deliberate angle, an angle that would allow him to watch his position in the reflection without ever staring directly at him. An old trick. Or was it just a coincidence? Five on the scale. He turned away from the television. He fumbled inside his pocket and withdrew his phone, it was a basic old Nokia. Buttons instead of touchscreen, no internet, no built-in GPS. He examined the screen and glanced up at the door as though awaiting a tardy drinking partner. He allowed his eyes to linger briefly on the two men, neither of whom were looking in his direction. They were dressed like every other male between 20 and 60 he'd seen come into this bar. Jeans, work shirt, heavy boots. No. Not quite the same. He risked another glance at the boots. Both of them wore similar footwear, but it was nothing like what the local workers wore. These boots were expensive. The American didn't bother adding another notch to the scale. He simply placed a 500-ruble banknote on the table next to his unfinished beer and got up, pulling his coat on. He left the sweater on the bench and grabbed his gloves and hat, striding toward the door. He heard a voice from behind him as his hand grasped the handle. Tovarish! It was one of the two men. He ignored it. Wrap up warm, the same speaker called in Russian. It's cold out there. He ignored the call, noting as he did that the speaker's accent was almost perfect. Almost. The subarctic chill hit him like a tangible thing the moment he stepped into the night, ravaging the exposed skin on his hands and face. The jeep was parked twenty yards away, on the opposite side of the street. He hustled diagonally across to it and reached into the pocket of his coat for the keys, barely able to hold on to them in the cold. He managed to activate the remote lock and risked a glance back at the bar as his hand found the door handle. The two men were at the doorway. They had taken the time to dress up again properly, so they hadn't been in a hurry, but there was no mistaking it now. They were interested in him. He opened the door of the Jeep and got in. He sighed with relief when the engine thrummed to life as he turned the key in the ignition. With the temperature dropping below minus 20, it was touch and go whether the vehicle would start. It had already let him down a couple of times. Thankfully, Tonight wasn't one of those times. He turned on the wipers, grateful that the layer of frost on the windshield hadn't had time to harden. He pulled out onto the road and drove away as fast as he dared in the snow, stealing glances in the rearview mirror as the bar and the two men receded from view. He kept on the main road for about a mile and then took a right onto a side street. The apartment wasn't far, but he didn't want to go there until he could be sure he hadn't been followed. He couldn't risk leading them to Nika. And who exactly were they? If he was very lucky, they were merely gangsters, foot soldiers for a rival of his current employer, looking to eliminate one part of his defensive capability. If he was unlucky? He glanced back in the mirror 
and saw headlights gaining on him. They had a distinctive angular shape like flattened triangles. The problem with losing a tail in this town was the way Tumen was divided by its two rivers and the Trans-Siberian Railway, creating isolated zones and severely limiting the options for movement by road. He spun the wheel and took an immediate left, followed by a sharp right down an alleyway so narrow that it barely accommodated the wing mirrors. He pulled back onto the next street and crossed the bridge over the Tura, bringing him onto the main E-22 route that led west and would take him clear of the city. His eyes flashed back and forth from the road to the mirror as he accelerated. A car emerged from the alley behind him, same triangular headlights, like the unblinking eyes of a dragon. Shit. This wasn't local gangsters. It was them. A realization hit him in the pit of his stomach. They could easily have slapped a tracker on his jeep while he was in the bar. That would explain why they'd been so unhurried. Hell, they could have been tailing him all day. Or longer. It had been five years. Why now? There was no way he could head back to the apartment. Not now, not in this vehicle. And yet he had to, because in the apartment, behind a false wall, was the only thing in the world that could protect him from what was coming. Or perhaps that wasn't true. If they were coming for him now, after all this time, perhaps nothing could save him. The buildings on either side became lower and more spread out as he approached the city limits. He couldn't lead them back to Nika. He hoped they didn't know about her already. His only chance was to try to lose them in the frozen wilderness outside the city and then somehow double back and disappear. But disappear where? Tuman already felt like the ends of the earth. If they could find him here... Anyway, he thought, returning to the immediate danger, it wouldn't be enough just to lose them. He reached his free hand out and opened the glove box, withdrawing a Smith & Wesson Governor compact revolver, wrapped in two layers of cloth. It was loaded with six forty-five caliber ACP rounds. He shook the gun free from the cloth and placed it on the passenger seat. He nudged the pedal down a little more as he passed the gas station that was the last outpost of the western edge of Tumen. The E-22 highway opened up. Frozen, snow-blanketed fields surrounded him on either side. The city already seemed a long way behind him. There were small dwellings and the abandoned sites of former Soviet collective farms dotted here and there, including one that he knew of that was just off the road about four miles outside town. On some level, he supposed he'd borne the place in mind for a situation just like this one. It was like the cold, he thought. There was never a time when you weren't planning around it, even subconsciously. The other car's headlights followed about half a mile behind him on the straight road, not quite matching his speed. They didn't have to. They had all the time in the world. There was a dip in the road ahead. He cast a brief glance down at the matte black frame of the revolver on the passenger seat and risked speeding up a little more ahead of the dip. The lights in the mirror winked out as he hit the downslope, and he saw the turnoff for the farm fifty yards ahead on the right. He wasn't planning on losing them. Even if they weren't tracking the jeep, it would be obvious he had turned off the road, and where. But he didn't have to lose them. He just had to buy himself a little time. He slowed for the turn, feeling the heavy tires slide a little as he swung out into the road. They held. There was a clutch of barns and darkened farm buildings ahead. He knew this from memory rather than sight. The dark structures registered as a minor irregularity slightly disturbing the alignment of the sky against the horizon. He pulled to a stop beside one of the buildings and got out, leaving the engine running and the lights on. He slammed the door and sprinted around the back of the barn. Immediately, he remembered he had left his hat and gloves in the jeep. It didn't matter. 
The gloves were too bulky to fit through the trigger guard or to fire accurately, and besides, he wouldn't get the chance to freeze to death. Either he would be back in the Jeep with the heater on full soon, or he would be beyond worrying about the cold. He heard the shift of gears as the other vehicle took the turn off the main road in a leisurely fashion and began the approach. He edged around the far side of the barn so he could lay eyes on the approach road, keeping low. He wondered if these buildings were as deserted as they looked, and decided they probably were, given that there had been no sign of life when he drove up. This side of the barn was exposed to the full force of the wind, and the temperature, which he had thought couldn't get any colder, dropped still further. Had to be 25 below. His hands and face were already completely numb. He would have to trust the joints in his fingers to do what his brain told them, even though he couldn't feel them move. At least, he had the coat. Finally, the pursuers appeared, pulling to a smooth stop a short distance behind the jeep. They were driving a silver Mitsubishi Outlander, a little too new and shiny to fit in, just like the boots. He hoped they would think he was still in the vehicle, but he knew they'd be careful. The two men from the bar got out of the Mitsubishi, guns drawn. In the glare of the headlights, he saw they were wearing lightweight winter tactical gloves. He only wished he'd been as prepared. They stayed close to their vehicle for a second, playing it by the book, checking the area. For these brief few moments, he had them at a disadvantage. They knew he was around somewhere, of course, but they didn't know if he was in the jeep or concealed in or around one of the farm buildings. He had picked this spot because there were several potential hiding places. Three or four places he could be, but only two of them to check those places. The pair looked identical in their winter gear. The one who had gotten out of the driver's side nodded at his partner an unspoken signal. He began to approach the jeep, gun extended, while the other one covered the surrounding buildings in smooth, alternating motions, mixing it up, not spending more than a couple of seconds in any direction. Time to take the chance. He stepped out of cover just as the second man was turning away. He raised the revolver and fired, intending to put him down with a headshot. The gun kicked back. In the cold, he barely felt it. The man went down, but it didn't look like he'd hit the head, maybe just clipped the man's shoulder. No time to confirm. He swung around just as the other one was spinning around from his approach to the jeep, ducking down to one knee as he did so. He was ready for this, had the muzzle aimed low as he pulled the trigger twice more. A good hit this time, two forty-five caliber slugs in the center mass. The guy went down. He started to turn back to the first one he'd dropped, but he was too late. He registered the muzzle flash from the direction of the sprawled figure before he felt the bullet. No pain, just a sharp impact in his lower right side. He followed through on the action, squeezing the trigger again and again, putting his last three bullets in the guy on the ground. He dropped the revolver and unbuttoned the midsection of his coat, his fingers too numb to do the job properly. He reached a hand inside and felt the tear in his clothing and the wound itself. He didn't need to see it to know it was bad. The volume of blood coursing over his fingers told him that. He put pressure on the hole with his left hand and started to move back toward the jeep, wondering if he could survive the drive to the hospital. And then his problems really began. From a distance away, he heard the familiar noise of another engine slowing to take the turn. He looked back toward the highway and saw the lights of two more vehicles turning onto the access road. Distinctive triangular headlights. He pressed down on the wound and began to run as fast as he could into the open fields. He wasn't thinking anymore. He just knew that he could not wait and fight, unarmed and wounded. He might just have time to get away, to circle back around to the main road while they were searching for him. Perhaps he would get lucky and a car would stop for him before he froze to death. 
The snow was powdery beneath his feet and impeded his already stumbling steps. He wondered if he was leaving a trail of blood, but he was too weak to check. If he paused to look behind him, he might never be able to start moving again. His breathing became more labored, the freezing air savaging his lungs as he forced more of it into them. The pulse thudded in his head. He knew his heart was beating faster, which was bad news for blood loss. But if he could just keep going, perhaps he could make it. Then he heard the dogs. Frenzied barking, the rapid patter of paws on snow. He turned around as the two black Dobermans closed in on him fast. The biggest one leaped first, bringing him down easily. Jaws closed around his left wrist, joined a second later by another set around his ankle. Again, he felt no real pain, just pressure. He lost track of time then, lying on the snow, staring up at the black sky, listening to the guttural snarls of the dogs. It could have been a few seconds or ten minutes later that he heard the voice. The words were in English this time. You had a good run, but it's over now. The source of the voice appeared above him. Like his predecessors, he wore a coat and thin tactical gloves. He also wore glasses. It wasn't a face he recognized, but that meant nothing. He knew exactly who the man was and why he was here. He heard a whistle and a clicking noise as the dog's handler spoke to them, and they released their grip. He didn't make any move. He had used up the last of his reserves. Get it over with, he said. The briefest smile crossed the lips of the man with the glasses, and then disappeared. Soon. You know what we want first. Go to hell. The man in the glasses held his gaze for a moment, then shrugged and nodded to one of the other men. From the sounds of it, there were at least three of them. Another taller man appeared in his field of vision, holding a cell phone. He crouched down and turned the screen so he could see it. At first he couldn't discern what was on the screen, and then he realized that it showed a video image, in close, on blonde hair. The camera moved out a little and a hand moved the hair to reveal a face. His next breath caught in his throat. Nika. Her eyes were closed, tears glistening on her cheeks. The camera reframed again to show the barrel of a gun pressed against her temple. The man with the glasses crouched down beside him, glanced at the screen, and looked back at him expectantly. He yelled obscenities at them, tried to lift himself up off the ground, but the bigger one easily suppressed him by pressing the sole of his boot down on his chest as he tried to get up. He yelled some more. And then he told them. He told them everything. Not because he thought it would save him, but because it might just save Nika. The man with the glasses listened and nodded. Thank you. Now let her go. She doesn't know anything. The man with the glasses reached out a gloved hand, and the other one passed him the cell phone. Ortega? The tinny voice of the man holding the gun on Nika came through the cell phone's speakers. Copy. You can kill her now. He screamed out as he heard two quick gunshots over the phone. He struggled against the boot on his chest until he saw the barrel of the gun yawning in front of his eyes. And then there was an explosion of light. And then nothing. One month later, Wednesday, January 6th. Chapter 1. Sunnyvale, California. My eyes snapped open, and for a moment, I thought I was still running. I blinked a couple of times and took in my surroundings. Hotel bed, blinds open, 
light from a clear blue sky flooding the room. It took me a second to realize that the illusion of running was caused by the fact I was still breathing hard from the dream. I sat up in bed. The hotel room was temperature controlled to within an inch of its life, but I felt a chill as the cover slipped off and exposed my sweat-drenched upper body to the air. I took a few long breaths through my nose and willed my heart rate to drop to a more medically approved level. Breathing and pulse rate dealt with, I gave myself a diagnostic knock on the head. Wow. There hadn't been a dream like that for a while. Not since the immediate aftermath of Los Angeles. I wondered if proximity was a factor. This was the closest I had been to L.A. since then. And although I'd been too busy to think much about the whole thing recently, it seemed like my subconscious had been doing it on my behalf. My job is to find people who don't want to be found. Ordinarily, a third party engages my services, but I had made an exception for that case. A serial killer the media had christened the Samaritan had been abducting and killing lone female drivers in L.A. Some of the details of the investigation that had been leaked to the media reminded me of Dean Crozier, a man I had worked alongside years before. We had been members of a very effective, very secret military intelligence organization that found a great deal of work for our respective talents. I had a strong interest in keeping out of the orbit of our mutual former employers, so it had not been an easy decision to offer my services to the LAPD. But in the end, it had been the only decision. My fears had proved grounded on both counts. Dean Crozier was the Samaritan, and I wasn't the only one who had made the connection. I remembered the man in glasses, the cold look in his eyes as he held the gun steady. An unfamiliar face. But he knew who I was. Maybe things have changed, he had said. I had gotten myself out of that situation, though, and things had been quiet ever since, except that on some level I was still waiting for the other shoe to drop. A soft cuckoo noise chirped in tandem with the vibration of my cell phone, getting gradually louder. My morning alarm. I rolled over and hit mute. I showered, shaved, and dressed for my appointment a charcoal two-button Brooks Brothers suit, and a light blue broadcloth shirt. I packed my laptop and left the room as I'd found it. I took the stairs to the ground floor, grabbed a bagel from the breakfast buffet, and checked out. Outside on the street, the sky seemed even bluer. A cold day by California standards, but I wasn't the type to complain about the thermometer reading 50 degrees in January. The fresh air soothed the nagging headache the dream had left me with, and I hoped that the images still flashing before my eyes would fade along with it. There was a line of three taxis parked outside the hotel, and I got into the one at the front. I told the driver I wanted to go to Munola House. Before I could give him the address, he just nodded and pulled out onto the road. I guessed Silicon Valley cab drivers were accustomed to making most of their trips from hotels to one tech company or another. I snapped open my laptop and took another look at some of the documents I had downloaded on the company I was about to visit. It sounded like a straightforward job, but they all do at first. I had time to read a couple of articles about Munola in tech journals and one from the New York Times before we reached the neighborhood that was my destination. The area looked something like an expensively designed college campus from 20 years in the future. Lots of well-maintained stretches of lawn and leafy trees. The buildings were all wide two- or three-story structures with smoked glass and steel exteriors, many of them with tasteful sculptures or water features outside. Almost none of them presented anything so gauche as a lot number or a sign identifying the name of their company. Instead, I saw lots of logos, artfully composed monograms, and the like. The driver pointed out some familiar names like Yahoo and Google as we passed their outposts. I was grateful he knew where he was going because 
I would have had difficulty navigating the maze of hieroglyphics. My job requires that I'm good at finding things. But I have my limits. Case in point, the company I was looking for was called Munola. The building was another sprawling glass and steel block, distinguished from the others only by a cartoon image of a smiling cow. I wasted a few seconds trying to work out the correlation between the logo and the name before realizing that I was probably giving it more thought than the marketing team had. This is the place? I asked as the driver pulled to a stop at the bottom of a path of black slate paving slabs that led to the entrance of the building. Mm-hmm, he answered in the affirmative, checking the mileage and telling me the fare. You don't look like you belong here, he offered as I handed over the cash. Too old? I asked, figuring the average age of a software guru was probably about 22. Too dressed up. I glanced down at my suit. Even with my natural inclination to go tieless, he was probably right. I walked the length of the path, noting the security cameras watching me the whole way. The entrance was a double glass door with the cow motif reproduced in frosting on the panels. It was a welcoming image to put on the front door, although the effect was undermined a little by the cameras and the sign warning that all visitors must be checked in. Everyone had to swipe their pass and no tailgating. There was an intercom. I pushed the buzzer, and a female voice answered immediately. Munola, how may I help you? I gave her my name and told her I had a meeting with John Stafford, and she buzzed me in. I entered a small lobby with a flight of stairs leading to the second floor. The stairs were carpeted, and the place had a vague smell of newness, like the recent memory of cut wood and fresh paint. At the top of the stairs was another locked door, although this one had a window into reception that let the receptionist see me. She waved at me, and I heard a click as she unlocked the door remotely. Reception was another small, low-ceiling room with no windows. The receptionist was a blonde in her mid-twenties, wearing a black blouse. She sat behind a high desk. She smiled welcomingly, but before she could speak, I heard an abrupt voice from my right. Carter Blake? I turned to see another door leading to the interior of the building, a short man in jeans and a Led Zepp t-shirt. He had a lanyard around his neck holding a white card, which I assumed was a security pass, but it was facing the wrong way. He had dark hair, glasses, one of those little tuft beards under his bottom lip. That's me, I said. You're with Mr. Stafford? John Stafford was the name I'd been given. It hadn't rung any bells with me when I'd heard it the previous evening but a little googling had revealed he was something of a hot young gun in software. Not a Mark Zuckerberg or anything like that, at least not yet, but the kind of guy who would probably be commanding the front cover of Wired within the next year and Forbes the year after that. The guy with the tough beard sighed, as though accustomed to but still mildly resentful at being defined by his association with Stafford. I'm Greg. John's downstairs. Come on. He had already turned to go back through the door when the receptionist piped in. He needs a visitor's pass. You haven't given him a pass yet? I was just, give him a pass, Haley. I exchanged a brief knowing look with Haley as she showed me where on the form to sign, and then she gave me a red credit card-sized pass in a holder and lanyard. I took it, and thanked her. Security first, I said. Greg snorted. Yeah, a lot of good it did us. I followed him through the door, and we headed along a corridor, through another security door, and down a flight of stairs. The decorators had obviously been commissioned only to cover the public-facing areas. As we got deeper into the building, it reverted to function rather than form. No carpets, Cinder block walls, strip lighting. It felt more like a bunker down here. I supposed it was, in a way. 
We passed a series of doors, and I could hear a faint rumble like the engines on a cruise ship. Greg saw me looking and nodded at one of the doors. It's not all ours. We host for a couple dozen companies. Do they get a room each? The big ones do. We passed through another security door, which was the fifth time we'd had to swipe a pass, by my count, and entered a space not much larger than a phone booth. Greg waited for the door we'd used to swing shut until it clicked. You can't open the next door until the first one locks. This is the highest security area. Munola servers only in the next room. Do you have any idea where he might have gone? I asked to fill the time. He looked unimpressed. Isn't that what you're here for? I didn't answer that. A green light clicked on in the last panel, and Greg swiped his pass. We walked out into the Munola server room. It was difficult to judge the dimensions of the space because everywhere you looked were arrays of locked cages the height of jumbo-sized refrigerators. Inside each cage were the servers. The noise was much louder in here, so much so that I didn't catch Greg's next words. I went out on a limb and guessed it was something dismissive and non-essential. The temperature was noticeably hotter in here, despite the big air conditioning vents in the ceiling that were blowing away, contributing to the din. I removed my jacket and folded it over my arm as I followed Greg. We turned a few corners and made our way deep into the heart of the maze. I couldn't help but think it seemed a little anachronistic, all of these tin boxes whirring away in secrecy behind the sleek, shiny devices we all take for granted these days. A moment later, we arrived at what I assumed was our destination. A man with his back to us, dressed in khaki skateboard shorts and a tennis shirt, was standing in front of an open server cabinet. He was tapping away at the keyboard of a kind of oversized laptop that seemed to have slid out of the section of the server tower just above waist level. Greg called out, but his voice was lost in the din. He reached out and tapped the man on the shoulder, but he ignored it, finishing tapping out whatever he was doing on the keyboard. Ten seconds later, he hit the return key, snapped the lid of the laptop down, and slid it back into place. He swung the grilled door back into place in front of the tower and locked it before slipping the key back into his pocket. Only then did he turn around to acknowledge us. I recognized him from the pictures I had seen on the website and on many of the articles I'd read on the company. Except that in every one of those pictures, he'd been wearing a wide grin that was just on the acceptable side of cocky. He wasn't grinning now. The confident light blue eyes were the next thing you noticed in pictures after the grin. But they were the first thing that stood out today. Only today, they looked different, wounded, but purposeful. His thick, dark eyebrows were bunched close together above those eyes. His shaved head gleamed under the fluorescent lights as he walked toward me, his hand outstretched. I shook it. John Stafford. Carter Blake, I replied. What do you need from me? He answered without hesitation. I need that son of a bitch's balls on my desk. Chapter 2 Sunnyvale, California I've had clients who would have been speaking entirely literally when they made a request like that, but I was reasonably sure that John Stafford was employing hyperbole. I'm afraid that's not part of the service. Stafford didn't smile. Let's talk upstairs. Five minutes later, we had ascended to the second floor again, out of the noise and the heat and the strip lighting, back to smoked glass and expensive design and the smell of newness. The view from Stafford's office window looked out on the leaves on the trees at the front of the building. On the journey back up from the server room, We'd managed to offload Greg, so it was just the two of us discussing the terms of the assignment. Stafford was sitting behind the aforementioned desk, a piece of plate glass balanced on steel legs 
supporting three screens arranged around a flat, wireless keyboard. Far too tasteful a setup for what he had requested a few minutes before. He was a little older than I had estimated from the photographs. In his early thirties, perhaps. Not old, old, but not exactly a spring chicken for this line of work. He looked away from me, glanced at one of his screens, then out of the window and sighed. He considered his response to my initial question. I could see that this was a frustration for him, having to tell somebody else what he wanted done. Technical people can be like that. They're used to solving their own problems, dazzling laymen with their mastery of the occult arts of coding or hacking or whatever. His name is Scott Bryant, he said after a minute. One of my senior developers. He's worked here for the past 18 months. Yesterday evening, he walked into our secure data storage center, which you've just visited, and downloaded some very confidential, very valuable proprietary software belonging to me onto a flash drive. He hasn't been seen since. And you want him located so you can get your flash drive back? So I can get my company's future back, Blake. You've tried the police? A question I generally ask. Often it's rhetorical, but not in this case. Of course, they sent a car around to his apartment, but of course he had cleared out. He's technically wanted, and they'll do their best to pick him up. You know what that means. The same thing it means when they tell a burglarized homeowner they're looking into it? Exactly. They don't get it. They don't care. Because they're not paid to care. Which is why you're paying me to care, I take it. I hope so. I wanted the best, and your name came up. Okay. You're paying me to care, so why don't you start by telling me about this software, starting with how time-sensitive this is. Is Bryant planning to upload it to the Internet? Because if so... Stafford shook his head impatiently. No. This isn't some Ed Snowden thing. This is about money. If he makes this public, it's worthless to him. I nodded. So he'll need to find a buyer or meet up with them if he's found one already. Right. So what is it? What exactly has he stolen? He hesitated as if it took an effort of will to discuss it with an outsider. It's called Me Time. It's going to revolutionize social networking. Think about your Facebook page. If I haven't gotten around to Facebook yet. He stopped and looked at me as though I'd walked off a UFO. But you know what it is, right? Sure, an electronic tagging system that lets you upload pictures of food. For the first time, he cracked a smile. This will blow Facebook out of the water. It'll make Facebook look like a paper journal. So it's potentially lucrative. You could say that. He began to give me an explanation of how unique and special his software was. He started out reasonably intelligibly before descending into technobabble. My attention wandered. From the lower levels, I could hear and feel the rumble of the thousands of servers. It reminded me of the thought I'd had earlier on. I pointed in the opposite direction up to the ceiling. I thought everything was in the cloud these days. Stafford shook his head again. If we'd stored this on a private cloud, there wouldn't have had to be an inside job, Blake. Some hacker in China would have had it six months ago. Physical is still best for security. But no system is without vulnerabilities, correct? I sat back in the chair. I'll need his full employee record, past employment, plus anything else you've got on him. You got it. How well did you know him? He shrugged. As well as any of my team. Kept himself to himself. I don't mean to say he was antisocial. I mean, he would come out for beers sometimes. Stafford stopped and thought some more. I could tell he'd be able to reel off chapter and verse if I'd asked him how good a developer Bryant was, or what his three biggest screw-ups had been over the last year and a half. But forced to consider him as a man, rather than an employee, was a stretch. Single, I think, or... Wait a minute. 
He mentioned a wife once. He stopped and made a visible effort to recall the details. Ex-wife, maybe? Does she live nearby? Stafford held up his hands in defeat. I made a mental note to follow up on that one. Okay, let's think about the software. Who are his potential customers? I'm guessing your rivals? Stafford visibly relaxed, on more comfortable ground again. I can get you a list. We can narrow that down pretty easily. Proving anything is another matter. Great. Get me that and his company record as quickly as you can, and I'll get to work. So we have a deal? One last question. What do you want me to bring back? The software or Scott Bryant? He paused, considering the question. I need both, Blake. He has to go down for this. He waved his hand around to symbolically encompass the building. I have more than 30 people whose jobs depend on this, and Bryant just sold us all out. I sat back and considered it. Understood. It's important to establish the ground rules up front. Now, here's mine. I get half the money up front, half on delivery. Not a problem. The next one is the most important. I work on my own. As soon as you commission me to find Scott Bryant, that's it. I'll come back if I need anything from you. But otherwise, you leave me alone. I'll need regular updates. He slid a tastefully designed business card across the glass desk. I took it and put it in my pocket. Fair enough. But I'll call you. Last rule. I do things my way. That means you trust me to take any reasonable steps necessary in order to complete the job. I'm happy with those decisions being taken on a need-to-know basis, Stafford said after a moment. I smiled. Don't worry. I don't think we'll need to bend too many rules on this one. But you never know. And that's why this rule is important. I won't burden you with the details, and you don't ask how I got the results. Stafford nodded assent. That's it? That's it. Then let's get started. Chapter 3 New York City Emma Faraday nodded briefly in acknowledgement as the doorman stood to attention at her approach. She stepped through the open doorway and looked left and then right. Hank, her driver, was parked at the curb twenty yards from the front door. He was short, bald, and in his sixties. He had seen her first and was already opening the rear door of the black limo. She settled back on the leather seats and fastened her seatbelt as Hank pulled out into traffic. Normally garrulous, Hank seemed to sense that this was not one of those days when his employer wanted to be chatted to. She reached into her bag and retrieved her Surface Pro. Detaching the keyboard, she placed the tablet component on her lap and switched it on. A second later, she had the file on her screen again. She had revisited this particular file on and off countless times over the past nine months and with increasing frequency over the past eleven days. The file provided a partial history of a specific individual. The records were minutely even obsessively detailed up until November of 2010. After that, they were culled from numerous more casual sources, news reports, questions asked of potential witnesses, snatched screenshots from blurry security footage. Faraday tapped on the screen a couple of times and navigated to the photo library. The photographs were arranged in strict date order, and provided a pictorial narrative of the subtle way the subject had changed himself with the camera over the years. Expression, posture, hair length, facial hair, glasses present or absent. Everything fluctuated from image to image, except for the distinctive green eyes, which were the same in the first photograph and the last. A soft ping 
alerted her to a new email message. She tapped the screen again twice, and the image of the subject was replaced by her secure inbox. Except for the most recent arrival, the inbox was entirely clear. The way she liked it. The email was from Murphy, confirming that everything was on track for this evening's operation. The preliminary subject's location had been confirmed and verified. She only wished they could be as certain about the whereabouts of the other subject, the one in her file. She acknowledged the email with a simple, OK, archived it, and closed the inbox window. The subject's photograph appeared back on the screen, the most recent DMV picture, under the new name. As Hank braked for a red light, the sound of a sudden impact drew her eyes away from the screen and to the street outside. A tow truck in the next lane had rear-ended a blue Ford. She watched as the driver got out, berated the tow truck driver, and then shook his head as a symphony of horns chased him back into the driver's seat to move off, reluctantly chalking it up to experience. She looked back to the screen, thinking about what would happen once the ball was rolling. They had a multi-layered series of plans leading off from the outcome of tonight's operation, like a formula. If A happens, then they implement X. If B, then Y and Z. Separate courses of action with their own branches and sequels. In theory, they had covered all bases, but in her experience, the human element always trumped theory. And that could cut both ways. Murphy was beginning to disconcert her a little on this operation. He seemed to be taking an unusual interest to care a little too much about it. She supposed that could be explained by the fact that he had worked with the man in the file. There was an unavoidable personal dimension there. She was uncomfortable with that. But on the other hand, it made Murphy particularly valuable on this operation. In some ways, Murphy had made things less difficult for her than they could have been when she had been brought in to direct the organization a year ago. The change of personnel had been made in unfortunate circumstances. The previous director had killed himself after being diagnosed with terminal cancer. It had been decided that an entirely fresh way of doing things was required. The upper reaches of the DOD had begun to question the veil of secrecy drawn over so many of the operations of the organization, even though they seemed happy enough with the results. The organization was a black box, an entity defined by inputs and outputs, with no one able to see its internal workings. Instructions in one side, results out the other. The detail of what went on in the middle was lacking and that was beginning to make people nervous. So Faraday had been quietly imported from the CIA. Her track record with the agency, including an impressively disaster-free stint as station chief in Baghdad, gave her the skills, the background, and the credentials to take over as director. She understood, too, that the fact she had no dependents and kept any romantic relationships brief and entirely isolated from the job, had worked in her favor. That did not mean it had been an easy transition. The organization was the most closed of closed shops up until that point, run as near to a personal fiefdom as the U.S. military allowed by just one man since the early 1990s. But that was where Murphy had come in handy. He had proved an able right-hand man, quelling potential dissent among the men and occasionally translating her more controversial commands into more digestible language. Freed to focus on the big picture, she had started out with one aim, to keep what worked and to ruthlessly jettison what did not. A year on, she was pleased with the progress. Tonight's operation would begin the work of cutting one of the last remaining ties to the past. So why did she feel so uneasy about it? Hank started signaling and looked for a place to stop as they approached the building on West 40th. 
It was an unassuming thirty eight story glass and steel structure, built within the last fifteen years. It didn't stand out, certainly didn't look as though it might contain the headquarters of a secret military intelligence organization. But then, that was entirely the point. The organization had started out in a windowless sub-basement in the Pentagon, more than two decades before, moving to an office park in Virginia in the late 90s to blend in more fully. After 9-11, the organization had looked ahead of its time. It had been designed as an agile kinetic response to emerging threats, focusing on bringing together the top tier of military and intelligence operators in a small, compartmentalized unit. These attributes put the organization in a perfect position to adapt to the new world. In 2003, it had moved once again to its present location. The shifts in physical distance from the seat of power seemed like an apt metaphor. As Hank pulled to a smooth stop at the curb, she looked down at the file one more time. The green eyes stared back at her from the DMV photograph as though aware of her gaze. The subject had the ideal skill set for the work they did. An expert tracker, good with people in every way that mattered, above average on the firing range, adept in unarmed combat, a strategic thinker, too, able to respond creatively to changing conditions on the ground, both a thinker and a warrior. Carter Blake would be a perfect asset, if she were recruiting. But more likely within 36 hours, he would be dead. Chapter 4. New York City. The 24th floor conference room of the building on 40th Street was overheated, and the absence of windows meant that after a while, you could almost forget you were in the heart of the city. If you spent long enough in here, it was possible to forget what country you were in. It had the feel of a bunker, nothing to distinguish it from similar rooms across the globe. Cornell Stark couldn't help but wonder if that was deliberate, given the subject matter of today's briefing. Stark glanced around him, twelve men in the room all together, and he wondered how many of them knew why they were here. The only reason he knew was because he had been on the Crozier operation, and Murphy had given him a heads-up that this was coming. The men were seated in two rows of six, facing the screen at the front of the room. At first glance, they didn't look like what they were. For a start, grooming choices varied as much as they would have in a gathering of college students. Buzz cuts to longer hairstyles, clean-shaven to bearded. The men were mostly dressed in cargo pants and T-shirts the colors black or dark blue or olive green. None of them was wearing an official uniform of any kind. But a random civilian who happened to open the conference room door and look in would not mistake this group for anything but a team. Not that anyone would be in a position to just walk in here by accident. Stark himself wore boots, black combats, and a black tennis shirt, and he was one of the clean-shaven, short-haired contingent. He had been regular army up until a year ago, and he was still getting used to this. Not just the disregard for strict uniform and grooming standards, but the patterns of deployment, the long periods of downtime followed by a sudden call after which he'd be expected to report within the hour and in peak fitness. Ranks were almost never referred to, the only person who was ever called anything other than their last name was Faraday, the director. Stark checked his watch. Four minutes to noon, which meant the briefing would begin in precisely four minutes. Murphy was a precise guy. And even had he not been, Faraday was going to be in on this one, and Faraday made Murphy look carefree and relaxed. The other men were talking among themselves, waiting to find out why they were here. Some were shooting the shit about what they'd been doing on downtime. Some were speculating carefully about where they were possibly about to be deployed. Stark thought about the common denominators of the eleven men plus himself, and decided Murphy had made these particular selections because, 
for want of a better descriptor, these were the most normal guys in the team. None of them would particularly stick out in a crowd, like the six-foot-eight Davis would have. They were all reasonably at ease talking to people, blending in. Blending in would be important. The only one who didn't quite fit that bill was Usher. Like Stark, he was sitting in silence, observing the others. He was at the far end of the front row, diagonally as far away from Stark as he could be. He wore glasses and was dressed neatly, but in subtle contrast to the others. He wore black jeans, soft shoes, and a white Oxford shirt. That hypothetical civilian, in his or her brief glance into the room, might have had time to note that, of all the men, Usher seemed to sit at one remove. As Stark's gaze lingered on Usher's profile, he sensed he was being watched, and his head snapped around. Their eyes met. Stark smiled and raised his eyebrows, as if to say, Do you know why we're here? Usher's expression didn't change. After a moment, he looked away again, staring at the blank screen on the wall. Usher knew, he decided. Usher had been in L.A., too. There were men in the unit with whom Stark got on very well. There were others who proved more difficult to like. Usher was in neither of those two brackets. He was an enigma. He never spoke about anything not directly related to the job. Even then, he was economical with words, communicating exactly what he needed to as efficiently as possible. Stark had tried to engage with him a couple of times and concluded that, as smart a guy as Usher was, his brain was evidently missing the software that allows a person to interact normally with other people. The conference room door opened, and the conversation trailed off as Faraday entered, followed by Murphy. Jack Murphy was tall and broad-shouldered. Although he was wearing a dark suit, white shirt, and tie, there was no mistaking his military bearing. He was in his mid-forties, and although his days in the field were now behind him, Stark was in no doubt that he could still handle himself in a rough situation. The serious, focused version of Murphy had shown up today. He was the type of guy who could buy a round of drinks and fit in with the crowd at the bar, but he was capable of switching that off and projecting the persona of a cold professional when necessary. Stark wasn't sure which was closer to the real him. He reminded Stark of a politician, which explained why he'd been able to move so seamlessly into the role of deputy director. Not, of course, that anyone referred to him as such. Emma Faraday, on the contrary, had only one side that Stark was aware of. The director was all business all the time. She actively disliked any hint of levity. She discouraged any attempt at small talk. Stark had seen her respond to an innocent comment about the weather with a withering put-down. As far as Faraday was concerned, if it wasn't related to the job in hand, it was a waste of breath. She was shorter than Murphy, around 5'6", light brown hair pulled back in a severe ponytail, a midnight blue shirt under a black pantsuit. She was a little younger than Murphy, too, but still older than the rest of them. Her high cheekbones and piercing blue eyes would have demanded attention even if she hadn't been the only woman in a room full of men. Her permanent frown spoiled the effect somewhat. Thinking about it, Stark genuinely couldn't recall ever seeing Faraday smile in the year she had been in position as director. The conversation immediately died away, and the men straightened in their seats, awaiting illumination as to why they were there. Stark saw Murphy glance discreetly at Faraday before starting to speak. She responded with an almost imperceptible nod. Gentlemen, Murphy began. I'll cut to the chase. You're about to be deployed on a mission to acquire a target. The target in question is smart, he's deadly, and he knows our methods. This is not business as usual. Sounds like business as usual to me, Dixon cut in, to mild laughter from some of the others. 
Faraday fixed the brawny Texan with an arctic stare, but said nothing. Murphy left a pause before continuing. First point of difference. As you may have gathered, given that you're not sitting on a C-130 right now, we're working stateside on this one. The men were too jaded to show much in the way of surprise. But Stark noticed a couple of raised eyebrows from his vantage point. Jennings and Abrams exchanged a glance. They were sitting together, as usual. Their similar builds, hair, and features had led to Faraday mixing them up a couple of times early on, leading in turn to the nickname that both men hated. The Twins. This is real world? Abrams asked. If they had genuinely been twins, Abrams would have been the evil one. Stark had had to rein in his predilection for mayhem on more than one occasion. Real as it gets, Murphy confirmed. Second point of difference. I told you our target knows our methods. There's a very good reason for that. He used to be one of us. Faraday stepped forward as the screen lit up behind her, showing a low-res photograph. It showed a man in his mid to late thirties, dressed in a suit and wearing dark glasses. He was entering the lobby of a building, the picture taken from a security camera. A better quality photograph appeared on the right-hand side of the screen, superimposed over the surveillance pic. This one was head and shoulders, an identity photograph from a driver's license or passport. It showed what Stark assumed was the same man. Dark hair, green eyes, a carefully neutral expression, as though he didn't want the picture to reflect any kind of likeness. Faraday said nothing for a moment, scanned the seated men with her stare. She looked as though she was daring someone to speak before she began. Nobody took her up on it. A couple of you in this room know who this is. For the rest of you, he's from before your time. We knew him under a different name, but he is currently calling himself Carter Blake. Chapter 5. New York City Stark watched Faraday as she paused to study the faces of the men in front of her. They were all listening intently, eyes focused either on her or on the screen. Stark saw Murphy and Ortega exchange the briefest of glances. So Ortega knew about this, too. It made sense. He was one of the longest-serving men in the room. Perhaps he, too, had worked alongside Blake. Ortega was about 5'7", of stocky build, and with a white scar down the right side of his face. Stark had yet to work with Ortega, but his initial impressions left him wary. He was always quick with a joke, but Stark sensed a faint air of desperation beneath the quips. One of those men who seemed to obsess about making sure nobody put one over on them. After a minute, Faraday continued. Blake was with us from 2003 to 2010, involved in actions in the Middle East, Central America, the Horn of Africa, and some more places we don't talk about. He was your classic triple threat. He came in on signals intelligence, but quickly proved even more adept on humint, and he could more than handle himself in combat. He preferred small teams. Faraday paused, corrected herself. Actually, that's something of an understatement. His optimum size of team was one. It seems that's still the case. She turned back to the screen and clicked the pointer to activate the next series of images, flashing up one by one on the screen. Headshots of people Stark did not recognize. News headlines referring to missing people. And then headlines from the LAPD's Samaritan investigation. Since leaving under difficult circumstances, it appears he set himself up as a private contractor, doing similar work to what he was doing with us and offering his services on the open market. The blonde-haired man in the front row cleared his throat. He was more powerfully built than any of the others, his black T-shirt straining over his wide arms. Stark had not worked with him before and couldn't remember his name. Something Polish. Kaminsky? 
perhaps? Similar work, ma'am? Faraday nodded at the blonde. She didn't mind being interrupted for a question, as long as it was a serious one. That's right, Kowalski. He's a locator. He makes himself available to those who need somebody found, who have exhausted the traditional channels or are prevented from using them. He's exclusive, tends to be expensive, and he works through personal recommendations. He's been reasonably smart. That's one of the reasons he's managed to stay off our radar for the past few years. Until now, Murphy said. Faraday nodded and clicked on to the next slide. There was no one in the room who didn't recognize this one. The tall, slim man pictured on the screen had caused this secret unit a lot of trouble the previous year. I assume I don't need to give you Dean Crozier's resume, Faraday said, her gaze dropping to Usher in the front row. She looked from him to Stark, who made sure to meet her gaze with an expression that said she sure as hell didn't. Crozier had also been a member of the unit, whereas the man now called Carter Blake had specialized in locating people, Crozier had specialized in ending them. He had been a little too zealous in the pursuit of that task, so much so that Faraday's predecessor had reserved him for deployment in parts of the world where his brutality would go unnoticed. But still, stories had circulated about him among the other men. That he hadn't confined his killings to designated targets. That he had taken enhanced interrogation to a level that made the Russian FSB look like bleeding-heart vegan hippies. There was even a story that he'd killed his own parents as a kid and had gotten away with it due to lack of evidence. Suffice to say, nobody was overly saddened when Dean Crozier departed the unit for parts unknown. There was an unspoken suspicion that he had been dealt with permanently on the orders of Faraday's predecessor. Unfortunately for a lot of innocent people, that hadn't been the case. As most of you know, Faraday continued, last year, the LAPD and the FBI uncovered evidence of a serial killer who had been operating nationwide for a time span that happened to coincide exactly with the time since Crozier left us. There were things about the killer's M.O. that raised some flags, the military experience, the use of tracking devices and booby traps, and most of all, the use of this weapon in the murders. The screen changed to show a long, curved dagger. Crozier's signature, Faraday added. We couldn't stand still on this. He was out of control, and that was unacceptable. Not for the first time, Stark wondered what was the most unacceptable. The dozens of murders Crozier had committed across the country? Or the fact that it was clear they could not rely on him to keep his mouth shut about his past when he was inevitably caught? Given the parameters of their mission, he had a pretty good idea. We sent three men to Los Angeles, she said briefly, glancing at Stark and the other two she was talking about, Abrams and Usher. They completed the job. Reflexively, Stark looked back to Usher. This time he didn't move, his eyes staring dead ahead at Faraday. The truth was, only Usher knew exactly what had happened out at the abandoned film set in the mountains where Crozier had been found dead, along with his half-sister and apparent partner in murder. During the Crozier operation, we hit a complication, Faraday continued. The morning before we finally caught up with him, the LAPD managed to come up with a suspect all on their own. Needless to say, they got it completely wrong. Carter Blake's image flashed up on screen. It was the driver's license picture again, only this time it was part of a screen grab from an L.A. news channel. Blake's picture was on one side, a blonde newsreader on the other, mouth open, brow furrowed. The ticker along the bottom read, LAPD identifies suspect in Samaritan slayings. The officers concerned at the LAPD have been singularly uncommunicative on this, but we managed to piece things together. It seems we weren't the only ones who worked out it had to be Crozier. Blake did, too, 
and he volunteered his services to catch him. But it was a dumb move, Murphy said, stepping forward again. He had the inside track, but he had to know there was a possibility this could happen. He stayed under the radar for four years. And then this. Stark raised a hand, his eyes meeting Faraday's. So why are we going after Blake? For the same reasons Crozier had to be put down. One, he knows too much. Two, he's a danger to society. All due respect, Stark said after a moment's thought. From what you've told me, that doesn't sound like the case. He was helping the cops. He's not a killer like Crozier. Murphy smiled knowingly and glanced at Faraday, as though to say, Do you want to tell him, or shall I? Faraday didn't return the glance. She just clicked to the next slide. It showed a good-looking couple. The man was in good shape in his mid-forties. He had brown hair, was wearing a dark suit, and a smile as wide as the Mississippi. He had his arm around a woman, a brunette with big, expressive brown eyes, and a smile that was even more dazzling than her companions. They were pictured in front of a sea of smiling faces. In the background, you could make out red, white, and blue balloons suspended in the air. Do you recognize this man, Stark? The tone in Faraday's voice was subtly mocking, and well it might be, because there would be few people in the country who wouldn't recognize the man and woman in the picture. Their faces had been on the front page of every newspaper in the Western world five years ago. Of course I do. Are you saying Blake knows something about the assassination of Senator Carlson? Faraday took her time answering. I'm saying he pulled the trigger. Five years ago, New York City. Excuse me, are you looking for somebody? I turned my head at the sound of the light female voice and saw its owner approaching me across the tiled floor of the lobby with speed and purpose. The first thought that popped into my head was, here comes trouble, although the question and the tone in which she'd asked it were polite, her expression said differently. It seemed to say she had a hundred and one things on her to-do list, and she didn't have time to be dealing with some nobody who had wandered into the wrong midtown office building. She had light blonde hair, and was probably about 5'5", five, five, though it was hard to be certain, since she was wearing heels. She had blue eyes and wore subtle pink lip gloss. She had on a smart charcoal pencil skirt and a matching jacket over a cream blouse. There was a laminated identification pass clipped to the lapel of the jacket. She was carrying an iPad that I guessed had a list of those 101 tasks arranged in strict order of priority. She stopped two steps in front of me, and looked up at me expectantly. Yes, I am, I smiled. My name's... Who? Excuse me? Who are you here to see? I glanced down at the pass on her lapel. In contrast to the way she was looking at me right now, the picture showed her smiling warmly. There was a barcode, and a string of letters and numbers, and a name, and a position. Carol Langford, Director of Operations. You work for John Carlson? Carol Langford sighed, as though resigning herself to wasting a couple more minutes on me than she'd budgeted for. I work for Senator Carlson, yes. Do you know what that means? It means you have a lot to do today? Correct. Today and every other day. Now, if you'll be so kind as to state your business, I can either pass you along to the correct person or help you find your way out. I have a meeting with him. With whom? Senator Carlson. She blinked. No, you don't. How do you know that? I haven't even told you who I am yet. I don't need to know who you are. You don't? She shook her head. Because I do know that you're not the executive director of the Lake George Association, with whom Senator Carlson is meeting in 20 minutes, and you're definitely not Elizabeth Carlson, who's meeting the senator for lunch directly after that. How can you be certain of that? I said, unable to resist the urge to provoke her a little more. It failed. 
Rather than get more irritated, she loosened up, giving me a sarcastic smile. Because Mrs. Carlson is never early for any appointment. I nodded. Inside knowledge. No substitute for it. Before we could circle back to the question of who I was and why I thought I had a meeting with her boss, we were interrupted by her cell phone ringing. Carol raised her eyebrows to excuse herself from the conversation and retrieved the phone, glancing at the display before she picked up. Senator? I'm good, thank you. I was... She paused, and her blue eyes flicked back in my direction. Yes, there is a man in reception, but he... Her gaze took on a more focused edge, and I could tell she was checking description. It felt a little uncomfortable, like being scanned. Yes, that's him. Okay. Now? Okay. She hung up and composed a polite smile that perfectly matched the one on her badge. My mistake. It appears you do have a meeting with the senator. Not a problem, I smiled. I guess somebody screwed up on the scheduling. The smile vanished at about the precise moment the realization hit me that the person responsible for the scheduling was standing right in front of me. Unlikely, she said coldly. The reception desk was set between two rows of electronic turnstiles that guarded access to the rest of the building. Carol Langford asked for a visitor pass for me, and we passed through the turnstiles and into one of the three waiting elevators. She hit the button for the 26th floor, and the doors closed silently. How long have you worked for the senator? I asked, to break the ice as the elevator began its ascent. Almost three years now. Must keep you busy. She looked at me for the first time since the lobby and nodded slowly. Neutral expression. But I could tell from her eyes that she was amused at my efforts to work myself back into her good graces through small talk. The floors on the display clicked past. Nine, ten, eleven. A weird thought occurred to me. The ascending floors were like a clock ticking down to the last time I would ever be alone with this woman, in all likelihood. And for some reason I didn't quite understand, I didn't want that time to be over just yet. You know, I said as though having given it careful thought, if you give me your number, I could call ahead next time, make sure there are no surprises. She looked up at me and blinked, then shook her head in amusement. Really? Not smooth enough, huh? I've heard smoother. Cut me some slack. I'm rusty. I've been out of the country for a while. You have, huh? The floors clicked up. Twenty-two. Twenty-three. I felt the elevator begin to slow. I shrugged. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. Who's offended? She said, which I figured could mean anything. The digits hit 26. The elevator chimed softly, and the doors slid open on a stretch of hallway opposite floor-to-ceiling windows facing east. The sun shone out of a clear blue sky over the East River, flooding the carpeted floor with light. Carol turned left and marched down the hallway without waiting for me. I followed. Without looking back, she spoke all business once again. Care to tell me what you're meeting the senator about? I would if I could, I said. Classified? Even to me, I said. It was the truth. I wasn't sure how or why the senator had found me, but I was intrigued enough to want to find out. We passed several offices before we got to one at the end of the hall with a nameplate that read, Senator John Carlson. She paused at the door and turned back to face me. I'll tell you what, she said. There's a restaurant in Little Italy I like. It's called Teradici's. Think you can find it? I smiled, caught off guard. Sure, I'm good at finding things. She nodded. Eight o'clock, then. But only if you're confident of my ability 
to not screw up the scheduling. Before I could open my mouth to respond, she turned away from me, knocked on the door, and opened it. She showed me into a big office with more floor-to-ceiling windows and a view to the south this time. Books lined the two side walls, and the carpet felt deeper and plusher underfoot than the one in the corridor. There was a big desk in front of the window, and a big man behind it, already getting up to greet us. John Carlson was young and in good shape, especially for an elected official. He wore a striped shirt, his jacket was off, draped over the back of his chair. I was unaccustomed to meeting public figures in person, and there was an odd feeling of disconnect. He looked like he had stepped out of the television screen or off the cover of Newsweek. The same build, features, the same brown hair, brown eyes, tanned complexion I'd seen so often at one remove. It took me a second to figure out what was missing. The 500 megawatt smile. In its place was a look of grim focus, like he'd been preparing for this moment over and over in his head all morning. I think I knew at that moment why I'd been called in. I held my hand out, and he took it, gripping it firmly and doubling up with his left hand as his eyes held mine. A real politician shake. We said each other's names, even though we both knew them already. Thank you, Carol, he said, without taking his eyes off me. I glanced at her and saw her quickly recompose her features from a frown. I got the impression she wasn't used to being dismissed quite so abruptly. She nodded. Let me know if you need anything. The door closed behind her, and Carlson stepped back a couple of paces, perching on the edge of his desk. He indicated the twin upholstered chairs facing the desk. I pulled one of them toward me and sat. He looked down at me, his eyes still sizing me up. I wondered if this was some kind of business manual technique to reinforce power relationships in a meeting or something. Thank you for coming in. I appreciate it. Not a problem, I said. Have to say, I'm curious. You want to know why I wanted to speak to you? I took my eyes off him and looked out at the city for a few seconds before answering. That's just the tip of the iceberg, I said. I'm curious about who told you I was someone you needed to speak to. I'm even more curious to find out how you found me. My apartment in the city isn't held under my name, and I'm out of the country for work a lot. That's all very curious, but the thing I'm most curious about is why you don't want anyone to know you're meeting with me to the extent that one of your closest aides didn't know about it until the last minute. He watched me unblinking while I said all this. After I'd finished, he nodded slowly. Fair enough. I think I can answer your questions with one word. I kept my face impassive. Is it a magic word? For the first time, I saw a hint of the famous Carlson smile. You could say that. I hear you and your cohorts like to think of yourselves as magicians of a kind. All doubt evaporated, and I knew what the word was. I also knew I had to extricate myself from this room as quickly and as cleanly as possible. I cleared my throat and smiled at him. My cohorts? I repeated, hoping my tone conveyed the right balance of confusion and amusement. Carlson nodded again, but his smile was gone. He stood up, and I noticed that there were two plain manila file folders on his desk, one thick, one thin. He reached down and picked the thin file up. There was no label on the cover. He opened it and leafed through a couple sheets of paper. Says here you've been working for Uncle Sam for the last six years. Overseas personnel planning. Nice salary. Lots of foreign travel. Pretty cushy position by the looks of it. It's harder than it looks. Oh, I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that at all, because this is all bullshit. He closed the folder and slapped it on the desk, staring back down at me. 
Why don't you tell me about what you really do? He said. Why don't you tell me about Winterlong? Chapter 6 Sunnyvale, California After leaving the Munola building, I took another cab back into the center of Sunnyvale and found a quiet coffee shop. I ordered a large cup of black coffee and read through Scott Bryant's employee file. There wasn't a great deal to read. It contained the things you'd expect from any company. Bryant's resume, submitted on his application for the job, his sickness and vacation record, details of his salary and benefits. As you'd expect from a company that employed highly skilled technicians, it also contained the successful results of his selection and evaluation tests. And as you'd expect from a company that developed a highly marketable and attractive product that could be stored on a flash drive, there was also a background report. As Greg from Munola would no doubt have pointed out, a lot of good that did. It looked as though the agency that had been commissioned to look into Bryant's background had done a reasonably thorough job. His employment history and educational qualifications were bona fide, matching exactly with what he'd put on the resume. Bryant had graduated in the top 5% of his class at Stanford and had worked for four other Silicon Valley tech companies at steadily increasing pay grades and levels of expertise prior to joining Munola. I didn't recognize the names of any of the four other companies, but I assumed they all had colorful fonts and probably some anthropomorphized animal as part of their logo. A financial check showed he had no significant credit card debts at that time and that he didn't appear to owe anything but a sizable mortgage on a property out in Palo Alto. Was there such a thing as non-sizable mortgage these days? That led smoothly into an evaluation of his personal life. Again, no obvious red flags. Married for four years at that point to Jasmine Mary Bryant, a 31-year-old botanist whom he'd met at Stanford. They had one child, a four-year-old girl named Alyssa. The one question mark was over a six-month gap in his resume. Bryant had taken a sabbatical from the company he was working for at that point, picking up early the following year just before he moved to another company. The report noted that when questioned about it at the Munola interview, he said they had briefly relocated to Seattle while Jasmine's mother was undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer. When the mother-in-law got the all clear, they came back to Palo Alto. Aside from that, there was absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. A stable, ordinary, professional guy. So what had gone wrong? I remembered Stafford mentioning that Bryant had split from his wife. Actually, he had thought Bryant was single at first, then remembered something about an ex-wife. I wondered how recent that was, thought about calling Stafford, and then decided it was unlikely he'd have paid enough attention to Bryant's personal life to know. Besides, there was an easier way to check. I leafed back to the personnel details and checked the address. The house in Palo Alto was there as the initial home address from the time of his recruitment. But there was an amendment about six months ago. Bryant had moved from what Google informed me was a good-sized three-bedroom detached house in an affluent suburban area to a one-bedroom condo in Monte Sereno. Still a nice place in a desirable Silicon Valley commuter town within a half-hour's drive of Munola. So six months ago, something had happened that had meant Bryant had moved out of the family home and into a place of his own. The cops had already given the condo a once-over, according to the report. I wondered if they had checked out the previous address. Given the lackadaisical approach Stafford had complained about, I thought it was worth the cab fare to Palo Alto to find out. I picked up the sheaf of papers, tapped them square, and tucked them back into the plastic wallet Stafford's receptionist had provided. I finished my coffee and took my phone out. I tapped into recent calls and scrolled to a number saved under the letter C. I tapped again and listened to the electronic ringtone. It would be mid-afternoon in Florida, and I wondered if Coop would be in the bar already. 
There wasn't really an accurate description for what Coop did, but agent probably came closest. Or perhaps broker. He was the guy people talked to when they wanted something done. He was the guy who could contact people like me or whoever was most appropriate to the job at hand. Our relationship was based on a carefully balanced combination of mutual trust and don't ask. I didn't know too much about him or how he came to be so well connected, and he didn't ask too much about me. He had no more than a vague idea about where I hung my hat, and I was supposed to know only that he was based somewhere in Florida. It had been Coop who had referred me to Stafford for his usual modest commission. The ring cut out, and I heard distant traffic noise. How did it go? I smiled, straight to the point, as always. Good. I think I have somewhere to get started. Glad to hear it, Coop replied, his already gravelly tones betraying the onset of a cold. I'll process the upfront, and you can let me know when you deliver. Your confidence in me is inspiring. He chuckled. I don't think this is going to be one of your tougher assignments, Blake. A computer nerd on the run? What's the worst that could happen? I shook my head. Stop it. Stop what? Tempting fate. You know what I say. There's always, always something you don't know. He finished. Anyone ever tell you you're one of life's pessimists? You know what the Russians say about that. About what? They say that a pessimist is a well-informed optimist. Cute. I smiled. Take care of that cold, Coop. It's chilly out there. Not in Florida. Even in Florida. We exchanged goodbyes, and I hung up, looking back at the file photo of Scott Bryant. It was an upper body shot of an African-American man in his mid-thirties, slightly overweight, with close-cropped hair and a neat beard. He wore rimless glasses and a burnt orange short sleeve shirt and was flashing a wide grin for the camera. The impression was someone who was pleasant and friendly and a little nerdy. The picture was as unassuming and non-threatening as the information in the background check. But the background check had reinforced an entirely false impression. I wondered if the photograph would too. Chapter 7 South of Portland, Oregon It was torturous, keeping to 50 in the slow lane, but Scott Bryant knew it was worth the frustration to make sure he wasn't stopped. The car itself, a blue 07 Pontiac, bought cash via a pseudonymous eBay account, wouldn't give the highway cops cause to stop him. But if he was pulled over for speeding, he would be forced to show his driver's license, or claim he didn't have one with him. Either one would spell trouble. So although the pace was frustrating, it was necessary. He still had plenty of time, anyway. The buy was set up for tomorrow morning at 11, a little less than 24 hours now. After that, it would all be over, and he'd be on his way to... someplace else. He hadn't decided where yet. That wasn't due to a lack of planning. He had been meticulous about every detail of what he needed to do from now until tomorrow morning at 11. Getting into the server room to swipe a copy of Me Time and then leaving without being challenged had been the most difficult part. Unfortunately, it had been impossible to cover his tracks for long. It was inevitable that they would have discovered his crime by now. He wondered if they had gone to the cops immediately. He had a hunch that Stafford wouldn't want to, but even if he did, he had cleared the apartment in Monte Serino out a week ago. The only other connection he had in California was Jasmine, and she wouldn't be able to tell them anything useful. The thought of her triggered a nauseous feeling of guilt in the pit of his stomach. He had thought about calling her to tell her about what he was going to do. He had wanted to, but deep down, he knew it was better this way. If this didn't work out, it was all on him, and that was the way it needed to be for all their sakes. But a part of him wondered what she would have said anyway. 
so far, everything was going to plan. He had tried to leave nothing to chance. He had cut his credit cards up and put them in the trash. He'd wiped the data on his old cell phone and then smashed it and tossed it into the storm drain at the bottom of his street for good measure. He had a new set of clothes, a new prepay phone, and enough cash for unexpected emergencies. He had food and bottles of water for the journey. He had $20 in singles for tolls. He had planned out every detail from walking out of Moonola yesterday right up until 11 a.m. tomorrow at Wakey's Diner. At 11.05, he'd be leaving with $2 million in cash, walking 100 yards across the street to the bus station and beginning his new life. What happened after that was a mystery even to him. Deliberately so. It was as though it would be tempting fate if he made concrete decisions beyond the culmination of his plan. On a rational level, he knew it was dumb. He remembered how Jasmine had teased him about his superstitions, that somebody who worked with the hard and fast certainties of technology could be in thrall to such primitive instincts. Don't walk under ladders. Step on a crack. Break your mother's back. Never enter through the front door. Never count your money when you're playing. Never accept the winnings in fifties. He knew superstition wasn't related to the part of him that was good at his day job. It was an intrinsic element of the other side of him. The one he had known to keep hidden from Jasmine until it was impossible to hide it any longer. It was funny. For the first time, the two halves of his life had come together because this was the highest stakes gamble he would ever make in his life the highest stakes he would ever play, for the biggest payoff. For some reason, he thought about the guy who had sold him the Pontiac last night, a short, nervous-looking guy who introduced himself only as Bill. According to Bryant's instructions, Bill had delivered the car to an empty parking lot. After Bryant had checked the car over to make sure the tires and lights were all fine, Bill had accepted $850 for the transaction, $800 for the car, 50 for delivery. After they had shaken hands, Bill had tapped his shirt pocket just to make sure the money was still there. Just then, Bryant did the same thing, making sure the me-time flash drive was still there. In 24 hours, less than 24 hours, it would all be over. Chapter 8 New York City Close the door behind you, Faraday said without looking up. She kept her eyes on the report on her screen as Murphy entered the office and took his time getting comfortable in the chair in front of her desk. He unbuttoned his jacket and sat back. He was too damned comfortable in her presence. The other men made sure to respect her position, even Usher, in his creepy, monosyllabic way. But Murphy treated her as though they were equals, they were not. I think that went pretty well, he said in the tone of a husband congratulating his wife after a successful dinner party. Finally, she closed the window on her screen and let her eyes meet his. I'm uncomfortable with this, Murphy. You were okay about it when it was Crozier. That was very different, and you know it. That was reacting to a live situation. This is preemptive. Never heard that raise a problem around here before. She said nothing, just fixed him with a stare, until he smiled apologetically. You really do want to do things differently, huh? That wasn't just a hard-ass new boss act, was it? I don't act, Murphy, and I think we're way past me being the new anything. I realize it's important for your ego to pretend this is still a boys' club, and that's why I indulge you to a point. Dracacus was sloppy. He let men like Crozier and Blake run wild. I'm not going to make that mistake, but it doesn't mean I want to rush into anything. Who's rushing? It took us months to get this close. Without this new lead, we'd be chasing dead ends for the next year. Faraday didn't rise to the bait. Murphy's reference to dead ends was a veiled dig. Faraday had wanted to focus on pinning down Blake's base before they made a move against him. 
from the painfully few confirmed sightings, there was a hypothesis that he was based somewhere on the East Coast. They had a few promising angles of investigation, but so far nothing had panned out. Not until one of the many lines they put out had been tugged, giving them a live and time-sensitive opportunity. Perhaps Murphy had a point, though. In the year or so since she had taken over, she had been entirely comfortable with the vast majority of decisions she had made, the reforms she had implemented. She knew that she was grudgingly accepted by the men, even if none of them warmed to her personally. She couldn't care less about that, so long as they respected her. But if she had a legitimate shot at a genuine threat and didn't take it, well, then the whispers would start. Perception was everything, and she knew Murphy wouldn't hesitate to use that against her if he didn't get his way on this. She sensed he wanted Blake bad, for whatever reason. There was more to it than he was telling, she was sure. But that didn't change the fact that Blake could be very dangerous indeed if the truth ever came to light. So on balance, it was worth going ahead, even if she wasn't entirely comfortable. This is the time, Murphy said again, a flicker of concern in his eyes suggesting that he was worried she might be changing her mind. We remove Blake, and that's it. No one will ever know what really happened to the senator. Faraday bristled. Even now, she couldn't quite believe it, that one of their own operatives had murdered a U.S. senator and his wife in revenge for a botched deal to leak sensitive files. Trakakis, her predecessor, had acted quickly to protect the operation. An Iraq veteran with mental health issues named Evan Froelich had been put in the frame for the assassination and conveniently found dead by his own hand shortly thereafter. They had made efforts to track down Blake and his accomplice back then, of course, but luck and training had allowed them to slip the net. In any case, they had known that it was in the interest of both men to lay low and not make ripples. If that changed, they could be dealt with later later, had finally come. Jesus. If there was ever a need to demonstrate why a change in the regime had been necessary, the Carlson assassination had been it. Two dead civilians, a murderous loose end, and an extremely risky cover-up. She cursed Drakakis for putting her into this position, where the only tenable solution was to finish what he had started. It wasn't the way she worked, but it had to be done. Martinez had been dealt with already. Now there was only one remaining loose end, one last snip. I don't want any blowback on this, Murphy. Is that clear? He leaned forward in his chair, his expression suddenly serious, all business. I have a good team in place for this. We do, I mean. Once we move on the connection in Orlando... We'll have everything in place no matter where Blake is hiding. It's going to be clean and quiet. Surgical. The assurance given, Murphy sat back and smiled again, baring his teeth. All of a sudden, Faraday decided Usher's dead-eye stare wasn't so bad after all. To avoid looking at him, she glanced at her screen and clicked to open Cornell Stark's file. Two photographs at the top of the screen. One from his army days, one more recent. In contrast with Carter Blake, Stark had barely changed in the four-year gap between the images. He had close-cropped, reddish hair, dark, thoughtful eyes, and an identical, focused expression in both pictures, giving nothing away. She cast her eyes down the dashboard stats, fitness tests, psych evaluations, after-action reports. Stark is lead on this operation, correct? Murphy nodded, his brow furrowing slightly, as though wondering if she was about to question the decision. I think he's ready. She looked back at him, fixing him with a cool stare. I agree. Murphy's smile seemed to falter for a second. Was that a slight tinge of jealousy? Faraday had been extremely impressed with Stark so far 
he hadn't put a foot wrong. For the first time, she sensed that her approval bothered Murphy, and as soon as the thought crossed her mind, she knew why that was. Stark was neither one of the old guard nor a green recruit eager to be taken under Murphy's wing. He was his own man. Good to be on the same page, as always, Murphy said after a second. After he left, Faraday thought about Dracacus for the first time in a while. About his last moments in this office. The carpet had been replaced, but she knew there was a large, tear-shaped bloodstain on the floorboards beneath the spot where she was sitting. She could have chosen any other office, of course, but this one had the best view and was closest to the ops room. Faraday put her predecessor out of her mind and picked up the phone. She dialed a four-digit extension that put her through to a desk two floors below this one. Williamson, was the acknowledgement. The technician sounded bored with her own name as she said it. Faraday could hear keys tapping in the background, could picture Williamson staring at the screen, not breaking from her task, giving the call through her headset the minimum attention required. We're moving on Prodigal 2. I need you on shift tonight. Faraday heard a tab snap open in the background and knew it was one of Williamson's ever-present Red Bulls. Good to know. So that means I can forget about working the flights? Faraday thought about it for a moment. No, keep at it. Williamson's shrug was almost audible on the line. You're the boss. That I am, Faraday said, and hung up. If stage one of the operation went well tonight, Williamson's work over the last few weeks would be largely redundant. But it was always advisable to have a backup plan. Chapter 9 Palo Alto, California There are three ways to go on the run. Actually, there are a million different ways, but there are three real options from which to choose before a person starts to think about the details. At one end of the scale, you stay close to home. At the other, you relocate to another country. The third option is midway between the two extremes. The people who try to half-ass the whole thing stick around the area they're familiar with, maybe crashing at a friend's house where they convince themselves no one will think to look for them. Those people are generally the easiest to find. Then you have the opposite type, the ones who go for broke and leave the country, headed for Europe or, more intelligently, a non-extradition country in South America. This option makes a lot of sense, because if you're running away from someone or something, it's a natural instinct to want to put the maximum number of miles behind you to do that. The only problem is that in this day and age, it's very difficult to leave the country without your point of departure and destination being tracked on about a dozen different systems. Fleeing to a foreign country makes finding you a complicated and expensive task, but at least it gives the people who are looking for you a solid starting point. They know you're in Barcelona, or Ecuador, or Timbuktu, or wherever, and they know that without a support network, you're likely to behave in a certain way. The smart people don't do either of those things. The smart people stay in the country, but get the hell away from whatever they're running from. They buy a used car for cash using a fake ID. Or they take the bus or the train. Better, a few different buses or trains to big population centers. They take nothing inessential with them. They pay for everything in cash, they dump their cell phone, and they don't keep in contact with anyone. It's at once very simple and harder than it sounds. Given that Scott Bryant was a Stanford grad who had already pulled off a successful data heist in a high-security data center, I was reasonably confident he wasn't an idiot. That meant he wouldn't stick around town, and he was smart enough to know the cops might have put a hold on his passport. I hailed a cab outside of the coffee shop and gave the driver the address of Bryant's house. Depending on what happened next... 
It might be worthwhile to rent a car, but I wanted to hear what Bryant's wife had to say first. Palo Alto was the next town to the north from Sunnyvale, so it was a short trip on the 101. The house was on Amarillo Avenue, a short distance from the exit off the freeway. I called up the details of the house on my phone on the journey. It had commanded a hefty price tag when Bryant and his wife had made the down payment a couple of years before and would probably fetch even more now. Considering the asking price, it was curiously unimpressive. A wide, one-story building with a covered parking spot, just three bedrooms, a stone patio, and a reasonably spacious yard. Most other places in the country, it would have been an unremarkable residence for a working professional. Here, thanks to inflated Silicon Valley real estate prices, it nosed into a seven-figure purchase price. There was an old lady tending yellow roses in a garden across the street who watched me with interest as I got out of the taxi. I smiled at her and started up the front path. The door opened on a blonde woman wearing jeans, a white blouse, and a polite smile. When she saw I wasn't anyone she recognized, or the mailman, she tilted her head and the smile took on a warier edge. A voice came from behind her. Mommy, who's at the door? Before her mother could answer, a tiny four-year-old girl with her dark hair and a ponytail was trying to squeeze through the gap between the woman's hip and the doorframe to get a glimpse of me. I smiled down at her and looked up again as Jasmine Bryant asked how she could help me. My name's Carter Blake, I said. I'm here on behalf of Munola. I left it deliberately short and to the point because I thought the way she reacted to that sentence would tell me a lot. I was right. The smile vanished and her expression took on an awkward, embarrassed look. I'm afraid my husband doesn't live with us anymore. Interesting. Either she was an excellent liar, or she had no clue what her husband had been planning. I didn't catch a hint of suspicion or guilt in her face, or her voice. Mommy! Just a minute, sweetheart. Sorry. No problem, I said. If this is a bad time... Is Scott all right? Actually, that's what I'm here about. He hasn't been seen at work for a couple of days, and, well, naturally there's some concern. I just wondered if you'd heard from him in the last week or so. She shook her head. We haven't spoken in weeks. She glanced down at her daughter, and her voice went up an octave. Sweetie, there's a pack of cookies in the kitchen. Why don't you go get one? The kid's head snapped up, suddenly serious. Three! One! I'll count! The two of them held a staring contest for a moment before the daughter relented and ran back into the house. Jasmine Bryant watched her get out of earshot and then stepped out onto the porch, letting the door swing most of the way shut behind her. The polite smile had vanished. What did he do? I didn't say he'd done anything. Cut the crap. If they're looking for him, it's because he's done something he shouldn't have done and skipped out, right? That's what he did to me. What are you, a private detective? I'm a consultant. I'm helping them resolve the situation. So there is a situation. He's taken something they'd like to get back. If I catch up to him soon, I think they'll go easy on him. The lie rolled off my tongue before I had consciously thought about it. I'd help you if I could, but we haven't spoken in weeks, like I said. I've seen him twice since I kicked him out of this place. She turned a little and looked up at the house, sighing. And we won't be too far behind him. Do you mind if I ask? He ran up debts north of two hundred grand in Vegas, and now all of a sudden... We don't have the money I thought we did. She laughed bitterly. Hell, we don't have the we I thought we did. You know something, Mr. Blake? I don't think we ever really know anyone. You must be pretty angry with him, I said, feeling only a little like a heel. 
That's an understatement, she said. She was looking beyond me at something. I glanced around and saw the old lady across the street, bending over her flower beds watching us. She hurriedly looked down. Jasmine Bryant kept her eyes on her for another couple of seconds before looking back at me. You probably think you can persuade me to help you find him, just to get back at him, right? I thought carefully before replying. I wish I could tell you it hadn't crossed my mind. She nodded. Well, you can't. I may be angrier than hell at Scott, but I wouldn't sick the police on him just to get even. I'm not the police. I held up my hands, palms out. Look, I don't even have ID. The corner of her mouth curved upward, and then she sighed. He's gotten himself into a lot of trouble this time, hasn't he? My guess? It looks like he made a bad decision on impulse. Did you mean what you said? That they'll go easy on him if you bring him back? I thought about Stafford's request for Bryant's balls on his desk. It wouldn't be easy. But for some reason, looking through Bryant's file, meeting his estranged family, I couldn't believe he was a genuinely bad guy, just one who had made some bad decisions and was in way over his head. I knew Stafford's number one priority was getting the MeTime software back. Surely I could negotiate favorable terms in return for that. I think I can arrange it, I said, as long as we put things right. She stared at me for a minute, then opened the door. You can look in his study if you like, she said. I don't know if it'll do any good. He left in kind of a hurry. Chapter 10 Bryant's study was in the third bedroom, the one with the window that looked out on the backyard. It was small and contained only a computer desk and a bookcase with three shelves, the top two lined with a mixture of mystery novels and coding manuals, the bottom containing magazine folders and ring binders. Jasmine gave me the password for the computer, and I spent half an hour checking the usual things on Bryant's profile. Internet search history showed nothing out of the ordinary. No queries for flights to Timbuktu or research into how to effectively disappear. Either Bryant's crime hadn't been planned far enough in advance for him to have left a trail here, or he had been sensible about not leaving clues behind. I browsed through the file space, not even attempting to look at everything. There were thousands of files, and it would take a team of people a long time to meticulously check each one. If I struck out on leads, it might be worth asking Jasmine if I could turn the computer over to Stafford's people, but I wasn't sure if she would go that far. Instead, I spent some time superficially looking at his file structure. He had been conscientious with his filing, keeping documents from previous jobs, along with a whole lot of stuff from his time at Munola. I happened on a folder buried in the Munola file called Nevada that held spreadsheets with dollar amounts with strange notations that I guessed were Bryant's way of keeping track of his gambling. Unfortunately, it hadn't helped him keep on top of his losses. I was about to give up and start looking through the folders in the bookcase when I noticed a folder within the work section with an unfamiliar title. All of the other titles were either easily understandable or matched the names of companies I'd seen on his resume. But this one stood out. It was titled Aella. I clicked into the folder and found documents similar to the ones stored under the names of other companies he'd worked with. Meeting notes, system requirement specifications, source code files, contracts. I took a break from that to Google the word Aella. It was the name of a software company based in Seattle. I clicked back into the Aella folders and looked at a few of the files. Bryant's labeling convention was so diligent that it took me a matter of minutes to find the information I needed. He had worked for Aella as a freelance consultant, managing on a project that had rolled out over a six-month period the previous year. The dates matched precisely with the time Bryant was in Seattle, supposedly 
because of his mother-in-law's chemo. So for some reason, Bryant hadn't wanted to tell his then-employer about what he was really doing in Seattle, hence the sabbatical. It didn't take a rocket scientist or a tech genius to work out the reason. He didn't want his employers to know he was taking on a lucrative fixed-term project for a competitor. I printed out a copy of one of Bryant's invoices, detailing the hours billed and showing Aella's address, folded it, and put it in my pocket. I knelt down by the bookcase and started going through the binders and magazine files, just to be thorough. I found some mortgage statements, family documents, birth certificates, but nothing work-related. As I replaced the last binder on its shelf, I felt a little resistance at the back. I pulled it back out and reached in, feeling my fingers wrap around a small lump of plastic. I pulled my hand out to see that it held a small cell phone. I came out of the study a minute later. From the doorway, I could see across the hall and through the open kitchen door. Jasmine was sitting at the table with her daughter, who was playing a game on some kind of handheld device while Jasmine drank coffee. The sunlight was streaming through the Venetian blinds, bathing the room in golden stripes. For a brief moment, it looked almost as though all was right with the world. Jasmine heard the study door open and met my gaze. Any luck? I don't know, I said truthfully. I held up the phone. Is this your husband's? She squinted at it before shrugging. I guess so. Maybe an old one. Do you want to take it? It might be worth having a quick look if it isn't password protected, I said. Three, nine, one, one. Both Jasmine and I looked down at Alyssa who'd chirped up without bothering to look up from her game. Excuse me, I said. Three, nine, one, one. That's Daddy's pin on most things, except the cable. She looked up and blinked at me. It's my birthday. I'm nearly five. Jasmine and I exchanged an amused glance, and I held the phone out to her. Got a charger? Ten minutes later, I was scrolling through Bryant's emails, looking for something that might confirm my suspicions about his direction of travel. I had been lucky that he had never bothered to wipe this old device when he upgraded, because it was still linked to his personal Microsoft profile, although not his Munola account, by the looks of the emails. I was unlucky in that he didn't seem to have conducted any email conversations about his plans to skip town with Stafford Software. That was hardly surprising. But it's always worth checking to make sure the person you're looking for hasn't made that one mistake in among the hundred other things they've been careful about. I gave up on the emails and thumbed through some of the photographs on the phone. I went back to the Seattle period and found some touristy shots of the Space Needle, the Pike Place Market, and the zoo. Alyssa, looking much younger, Jasmine and Scott looking much happier. Did you enjoy Seattle? I asked. I liked it okay. And your mom's doing okay now? Jasmine studied me for a second. Why do you ask? Your husband told the company she had cancer. That's why you moved to Seattle for a while, while he had to take a sabbatical. She sighed. My mother hasn't been sick a day in her life. She lives in Ohio. I nodded sympathetically and closed the photo gallery. I decided to look at one last thing. The calendar. Like the emails, it automatically backed up from the Microsoft profile. I didn't expect to find anything, so I was surprised when I saw three recent appointments this week. I tapped on the first one. It was a one-hour appointment at 6 p.m. the day before, titled Shopping. There was no location or additional notes, but that matched exactly with the time Bryant had stolen the MeTime software from the server. The second one was three hours later. Again, there was no location, and the title of the appointment was simply Car. Could he have been saving vague-sounding appointments in his calendar 
as a way of making sure he kept to a timeline? Shopping could be a code for stealing the software. Car, picking up a rental, perhaps, or buying one secondhand in order to skip town without leaving a trace. There was one final appointment in the calendar for 11 a.m. tomorrow. No location, just a vague title again. It said simply, Delivery, E-W-K. For a moment, I wondered if the three letters stood for an airport or perhaps an abbreviation for a building. And then I thought about what I'd found out about his work for Aella. I knew exactly what they stood for. Bryant had made his one mistake, and with everything else I now knew about him, I was pretty sure it was going to lead me straight to him. Chapter 11 New York City Faraday took a break from staring at her computer screen and closed her eyes, massaging the center of her forehead with her thumb and index finger. She swiveled around in her chair and looked out at the skyline, wondering if it would snow tonight. The news said a major blizzard was coming later in the week, but for now the night sky was clear. That was good. It would be a late night tonight, and the last thing she needed was to make it later if her driver was delayed. She swiveled back around when there was a knock at her door. She raised an eyebrow when Murphy entered, the usual ironic twinkle in his eye absent. Not like you to knock, she said. Stark's team is all set up, he said. You asked me to let you know. She nodded, noting that he had passed up the opportunity for a snappy comeback. Definitely not himself. Again, Faraday thought about how different Murphy had been since the Crozier thing. Ever since they had gotten a lead on the man now calling himself Carter Blake, there had been a subtle change in him. When Faraday had been brought in to replace Dracacus, she had found Murphy a reliable asset, but one who never seemed to take things too seriously. He approached each task with an unflappable air, giving you the sense that he didn't really care about the outcome. The ongoing hunt for Blake was different. Whenever the subject came up, he was serious, focused, like now. Faraday got up and followed Murphy out. They crossed the corridor, and Murphy keyed in the daily code to access the ops room. It was a large, windowless room that felt a little like a cross between a movie theater and NASA mission control. There was a well-lit area up front, with chairs arranged around a horizontal table screen. After that, there were four rows of computers arranged on descending levels to the bottom of the room, where the far wall was taken up completely with a screen, divided up into nine rectangles. A different image could be shown on each one, or they could combine to display a single image. Right now, the top six rectangles were showing what Faraday assumed was a live satellite feed. It displayed a series of buildings arranged around a swimming pool, the underwater illumination making it shine like a sapphire in the midst of the sprawl. Although there was space for more than a dozen staff members at the computers, only three were occupied. Faraday walked past the closest two and approached the farthest station from the entrance. He's at home, she said, addressing Williamson. Williamson glanced around at her. Her eyes moved from Faraday to Murphy and then back to Faraday. Finally, she nodded. As of 28 minutes ago. Williamson was in her early 20s. She had shoulder-length dark hair and a doughy, pale look about her that spoke of too many hours indoors staring at screens. Two unopened cans of Red Bull were sitting on her desk, ready for action. She lacked the slightly nervy, eager-to-please demeanor of her co-workers, but in a way that was completely different from Murphy's wry condescension. She wasn't attempting to undermine Faraday or make herself look good. She just had no concept of wanting to impress other people. Faraday liked that about her. That, and the fact that she never failed to deliver, no matter how difficult the task. 
Stark only checked in at the forward base five minutes ago, she continued. What kept them? Pile up on I-4. Bad one. Couple of people dead. Williamson paused, picked up the nearest Red Bull, and popped the tab. She took a long gulp and put it down, turning back to the screen. That meant major slowdowns on the 408. Thanks to that, we're a half hour behind schedule. Okay, but aside from that? Good to go. Faraday turned to Murphy. This is the best lead we've had on Blake in eight months. If this goes wrong, it sets us way back. Murphy wasn't looking at her. He was staring straight ahead at the big screen on the wall. It isn't going to go wrong. He won't be able to ignore this. Faraday looked back at Williamson. Send the message. Five years ago, New York City. Why don't you tell me about Winterlong? In retrospect, the senator's opening question to me was almost funny. It was a regular laugh riot, because it turned out that Senator Carlson knew more than I did. A lot more. The second manila folder on his desk had contained classified reports, unedited after-action briefings, photographs. It was a meticulously compiled history of an entity that was not supposed to have a history. Winterlong had no past. It simply had the here and now and what had to be done. It was a small elite unit set up for maximum effectiveness with minimum footprint. We carried out the jobs that could not be done on the record. I was familiar with some of the operations recorded in the file. I had taken part in some of them. I knew some rules had been bent and broken from time to time, and had broken a few of them myself. In the early days, it had been easy to convince myself that those rules were breached advisedly and with necessity. We played a little rough sometimes. We went places where we weren't supposed to be, places where there could be no negotiation, no admission of authorization, should we be captured. We specialized in off-the-books work. When going through standard channels wouldn't get the job done, that's where we came in. Invisible, unaccountable, deniable. Off the books. Except that there was a book, and Carlson had it. And it turned out I didn't know the half of it. Whether by luck or design, I hadn't been involved in any of the missions that had led to the worst things in that file. And as soon as that thought crossed my mind, I remembered a conversation I'd had with Drukakis a year or so back and knew it was by design. We had been alone in his office following an operation in Karachi. I'd raised my concerns about another member of the team, one... Dean Crozier. Crozier had an enthusiastic approach to the use of violence. It was more than a tool of the trade for him. It was an end in itself. You're uncomfortable with him, Drakakis had said after I described what I'd witnessed in Karachi. Drakakis was in his late fifties, tall with receding gray hair and the beginnings of a paunch. One of that missing generation of soldiers who had been too young for Vietnam and too old for Gulf War I, who had completed a long career climb without ever serving in a real war. That's an understatement. He's a killer, sir. He'd raised an eyebrow at that and started to make some wry comment, but I continued before he could get it out. He's dangerous. He's feeding an addiction out there. Trakakis had nodded. You're still fairly new. And perhaps I've been remiss in not explaining certain facts of life to you. Well, I'll make up for that now. You see, this is a team, and a team depends on chemistry. You understand that? I'd said nothing, having a good idea of where he was going. Thing about chemistry, it takes the right mix of elements to get the result you need. Different sorts. Take you, for instance. You're good at what you do. That goes without saying. If you weren't good, you wouldn't be here. But you have something important in your character, too. You're... 
He stopped and searched for a way to explain it. You're one of the White Hats, is what I'm trying to say. And Crozier? He's one of the Black Hats. He chuckled. That boy just might be the blackest of the black, in fact. He paused and narrowed his eyes. You know where I'm going with this, son, don't you? I considered my answer. You're saying it takes white hats and black hats, sir. His lips stretched over his nicotine-stained teeth in a wide grin. That's exactly right. It takes both kinds. Of course, if I had my druthers, I'd use people like you all the time. Solid, dependable, upstanding. But it can't always be that way. Sometimes you need a black hat. Do you understand that, son? I had thought about it and nodded, even though I didn't truly know that I did. After seeing Carlson's file, I knew for sure that I didn't understand. And Dracacus had known that I wouldn't, which was why he'd shielded me from it. Carlson's file confirmed all the worst misgivings and suspicions I'd had and then some. Torture, for starters. Not just waterboarding and other examples of so-called enhanced interrogation, but the kind of thing that would have made the more enthusiastic members of the Spanish Inquisition wince. Indiscriminate extrajudicial killings. Not just of legitimate or gray area targets, but anyone who happened to get in the way when no one was looking. The instances of abuse and murder trailed across the globe to every hot spot in which I'd been deployed, and more besides. Worst of all, it wasn't restricted to confined or even suspected bad guys. Civilians were fair game. Not just as collateral damage, but deliberately targeted in order to flush out another target, or worse, simply to send a message. As I leafed through the pages in the file, I passed through skepticism to denial to horror. I had been blind. I had accepted that we needed to operate outside the system to get the jobs done that couldn't be done any other way. I was okay with that. I knew where the line was, and so far, I hadn't had to do anything that crossed that line. But in reaching that accommodation with myself, I had chosen not to think about what that principle could lead to. The way that the lack of rules, the lack of oversight, could be abused by the wrong kind of men. Men like Crozier, in particular. But he was only the most extreme example. The Greater Good an old-fashioned, perhaps naive concept. But it was why I had joined Winterlong. Or perhaps that wasn't the whole story. I had been attracted by the challenge, by the freedom, that we were stopping supposedly untouchable bad guys and unquestionably saving lives allowed me to overlook some of the compromises. Only now, looking at the seemingly endless array of images in front of me, did I realize that the same setup had been a lightning rod for those with darker motivations? I got about two-thirds of the way through the file before I lost my stomach for it entirely. I closed the file and dropped it back on Carlson's desk. Eye-opener, isn't it? The senator said. How does it make you feel, soldier? Are you proud of that? I'd been looking down at the floor almost unaware there was still someone in the room with me. But at the sound of the disgust in Carlson's voice, I looked up at him, anger burning in my eyes. It makes me feel sick. This isn't... I gestured at the folder, trying to form my feelings into words. I gave up after a minute and sat back in the chair. How did you get this? Carlson was watching me with interest. I kind of expected you to deny it all. Tell me these documents are faked. I shook my head. It's not fake. Exaggerated, then. We locked eyes for a long moment. Without breaking the stare, I reached for the folder. I looked down and leafed back to a particular photograph. A 
photograph taken in a burnt-out bunker somewhere in Iraq. Crozier's work from the look of the knife wounds inflicted on the handcuffed bodies. Senator, I asked, turning the photograph toward him. How the fuck do you exaggerate that? His eyes alighted on the photograph and looked away instinctively. He nodded in agreement and took the folder from me, closing it again. There's a pattern in this file, he said. Certain names have come up again and again. Yours is not one of those names. And that's why we're having this conversation? It's not the only reason we're having this conversation, he said after a moment's thought. You asked me how I got this. You seem like a smart guy, so you probably already know the answer. I got this from the only place it could have come from. Inside. Exactly. I'm not going to tell you who, naturally. At least, not until I know that you're willing to come on board with this. To be honest, going this far with you is a risk I'd rather not take. A couple of faces flashed in my mind's eye, but I knew it would be pointless to start playing guessing games. I knew one thing. Whoever had leaked this file to Senator Carlson was the same person who had told him I would be approachable. Then why take the risk? I asked. Because we need more. The evidence in this file gives us the men on the ground. That's not good enough for me. We need something on the people in charge, and I think you can help get me it. I didn't know why I'd be in a better position to do it than Carlson's other mole, but I put that to one side for the moment, because I had a much more pressing question. What makes you think I'm willing to come on board? Carlson's lips widened a minuscule amount in an approximation of a smile. Nothing much, soldier. Only the shade of green you turned when you started looking at those pictures. After leaving the senator's office, I took the elevator back down to the ground floor and walked across the tiled lobby to the same door I'd used to enter the building. I started to walk, not thinking about where I was going, just knowing I needed to walk. I needed fresh air, as fresh as it gets in Manhattan, at any rate, to clear my head, and I needed space to think. The sun was declining in the west, shining into my eyes along West 40th, so I turned in the opposite direction and headed east. I passed by Bryant Park and crossed Fifth and Madison and kept going until I was in sight of the East River. I looked across the water. The UN building rose high on my left. The traffic soared past on the FDR Drive. The senator's proposition had been simple. He wanted me to do nothing out of the ordinary. He wanted me to carry on exactly as normal until the next assignment. But when that assignment came, he wanted me to keep my eyes open for an opportunity to get him the evidence he needed. I wasn't sure exactly what form that evidence might take. The senator had taken a big risk by reaching out to me, maybe bigger than he knew. But then, he had been right. Because I wasn't considering whether to do what he wanted. Despite myself, I was already thinking about how. The pictures from the files flashed before me. I tried to push them aside, but they kept muscling back in. I tried to focus on the cars passing on the FDR with their oblivious occupants, heading home after what they probably imagined was a hard day at the office. I felt detached from the world, like I had been standing on the deck of a ship on calm seas, and out of nowhere, a wave had picked me up and tossed me overboard. I was nothing and nobody. I stood there for an hour, thinking that every certainty I'd thought I could count on had been washed away, and now I was standing with no idea who I was or where I was going. The shadows were growing longer, trailing the onset of evening. Suddenly, I remembered a voice from a few hours ago, 
and another lifetime. Teradicis. Tonight, eight o'clock. I looked at my watch and saw that it was a quarter to seven. I may not have known who I was or where I was going anymore, but I knew there was somewhere I was supposed to be at eight o'clock. For now, that would have to do. Chapter 12. Seattle. It was almost four in the afternoon when I left Jasmine Bryant's house, which meant the first available flight was an Alaska Airlines service, leaving San Francisco International at 7.30 and touching down in the Seattle-Tacoma airport a little more than two hours later. Ever since the Samaritan case, I'd been more hesitant than usual about flying, because it was the one mode of travel where you were forced to leave a trail. But then again, I hadn't encountered any problems so far, and by paying cash at the terminal and using a driver's license as ID, there was nothing to make me stand out from the millions of other passengers moving around the United States. I climbed onto the plane on a mild, dry evening in San Francisco. A couple of hours later, I stepped out into a cold, rainy night in Seattle. The temperature was just above freezing, and the wind chill drew gasps from the departing passengers as they adjusted to a new season in the space of seconds. The contrast felt like we'd jumped forward in time from early fall to winter. Only, that wasn't an ideal comparison, because winter would never really come to California. SeaTac was located ten miles south of the city proper. I took a taxi into town, looking out of the window for the familiar sights to orient myself. The space needle stood out, lit up brightly against the night sky. My first time in the Pacific Northwest, though I'd long enjoyed its influence on wider society in the form of good coffee and rock music from Hendrix to Cobain. I knew that Scott Bryant's meet was set up for 11 in the morning, which gave me just over 13 hours to work out where the meeting would be. Seattle is the biggest city in the Pacific Northwest, more than three million inhabitants in the metropolitan area, and probably around three million in one places to arrange a quiet meeting. I knew it would be a waste of time focusing on where, when I could get what I wanted by thinking about who instead. Aella had been the major thing that stuck out about Bryant's background, largely because it had been the one thing he had made the effort to hide from his record. A rival software company he had worked for in secret, in a town he'd spent time in a year or so before. A town that was 800 miles away, the kind of distance it would take you most of a day to drive, enough time to check into a hotel, get some rest, and arrive fresh for an 11 a.m. appointment. When I had examined Brian's documents stored from his time freelancing for Aella, one name came up repeatedly. Eric W. Kellner. It hadn't taken more than a couple of clicks to ascertain that Kellner was the CEO of Aella. E.W.K. Sometimes it doesn't take much to lay waste the best laid plans. Sometimes it only takes three letters. My research also told me that the company name was taken from Greek mythology, belonging to an Amazon warrior killed by Hercules. Aella meant whirlwind, and if Eric W. Kellner didn't play ball, that was exactly what he was about to reap. Finding people who don't want to be found can be a challenge. The process involves a certain amount of skill, the employment of certain tricks of the trade, and often, most important, the ability to exploit the minor mistakes of your target. This particular job wasn't over yet, but so far it hadn't been difficult to pick up Bryant's trail, thanks to his mistake with the synced calendar. The point is, finding someone who doesn't want to be found almost always involves effort. But finding someone who isn't expecting anyone to be looking for them that's a breeze. One of the advantages of living in a democracy is the fact that political donations, in theory at least, have to be transparent. Successful businessmen make political donations, sometimes to more than one candidate or party. 
They do this for the obvious reasons. They want their business to remain successful and unencumbered by bureaucracy. Federal law requires that they register their donation on a publicly accessible database, providing their name, place of residence, and the amount and party they donated to. It's a stalker's dream. In the time it takes to hit a few keys, you can find the home address of any individual with a political consciousness. There are a couple dozen other effective techniques for snagging a home address, but this is one of the easiest, and it doesn't even require subterfuge. 90 Seconds on the Portal told me that Kellner had donated the maximum $2,000 to the GOP in the run-up to the last election, and that he resided at 1232 Forest Avenue in the affluent West Mercer Island neighborhood. Twenty minutes and a taxi ride across the Lacey v. Murrow Bridge later, I was standing on the sidewalk outside. I gave the driver twenty bucks and told him to circle the neighborhood for ten minutes. I didn't think I would need longer than that. The rain had eased off, so I waited for the noise of the engine to die away before I turned to look up at Kellner's place. The three-story home built into the hillside was in darkness, except for one window, and water dripped from the eaves and ran in streams down the sloped driveway. The door was opened a few inches by a tall woman in her mid-twenties with red hair cut in a bob. Not a natural red, more like the color of a London bus. She had obviously decided her natural color wasn't exciting enough and had opted for something more eye-catching. It was striking in contrast to her very pale, almost pure white skin. She held the door open six or seven inches in a way that categorically did not invite me in, while her gray eyes looked me over in a politely questioning way. I wasn't anyone she recognized, and it was too late in the day for a Jehovah's Witness. Yes? I'm sorry to drop by so late, I said. I wondered if Eric was home. It's kind of important. She held the door in position and kept her eyes on me as she called Kellner's name. A muffled acknowledgement came from within the house. I couldn't make out the exact words over the sound of the rain, but I assumed Kellner was asking who it was. She widened her eyes, prompting me. Scott Bryant, I said without hesitation. Scott Bryant, she yelled, still not taking her eyes from me or moving her hand from the door. I heard hurried footsteps on polished floorboards, and another hand appeared at the edge of the door, pulling it open as the redhead released her grip. Kellner was in his fifties, bald, thirty pounds overweight, and wearing a blue shirt over jeans. He was too old for his partner and way beneath her league. His expression was irritated as he started speaking, obviously spouting a line he'd arranged in his head on the way to the door. I told you not to... He stopped dead as he realized I wasn't who he was expecting. Then his lips started to form into the start of a question. I was guessing it would have been, who the hell are you? But he stopped himself. I watched him process through the unexpected development with a knowing smile on my face. I wanted him to think I knew absolutely everything. I wanted him to pin his hopes on being able to cooperate with me as fully as possible to extricate himself from this situation. Everything okay, hon? The redhead asked after glancing from his face to mine and back again. Yes. Yes, give us a second, okay? She shrugged, gave me another look up and down, and moved back into the house. Kellner stepped out into the night and closed the door behind him. What do you want? I want to make a deal. I don't know what you're talking about. Really? You want to mess around with something like this? He pressed his lips together, clearly deciding... He wasn't going to make this any better by doing more talking. I'm looking for Bryant. As you've probably guessed, I'm working for his employers. He took it in, still keeping his mouth tight shut. My instructions are very specific. Mr. Bryant took something 
and they want it back. They're only interested in him. If you help me out, this conversation stays entirely between us. I don't get paid any extra for making trouble for you. He opened his mouth to make some sort of angry denial. I cut in before he could build up a head of steam. Having said that, if you don't help me out, I'm going to have to use what I know about you to find him another way, and I know it all, Eric. All about you, and Bryant, and me time. I'd played my hand, and I was relieved to see he stiffened at the mention of me time. I probably could make some trouble for him if it really came to it. If nothing else, I could let Stafford know exactly who had tried to buy his stolen software and let him focus his considerable resources on digging up the proof. I kept my face entirely impassive and watched Kellner's eyes, narrow and seething. I could imagine his brain working feverishly away back there weighing up the sacrifice of billions of dollars in future income against losing everything he had tomorrow. His jawbone stood out as he gritted his teeth. His whole body was tensed, as though he was barely suppressing the urge to attack me, our physical mismatch notwithstanding. But then something clicked into place, and he came to his decision. His jaw unclenched, and he seemed to lose a couple of inches in height, nodding after a moment. I don't know what you're talking about, of course. I've never heard of Scott Bryant, and I assume you won't be relaying this conversation either to him or to his employers, whoever he or they may be. I pretended to think it over for a second before nodding in agreement. You assume correctly. I don't have much of a choice, do I? I don't see that you do. 11 a.m. Wakey's Diner, First Avenue. It's across the road from the bus station. I took out my phone and tapped the address in. It existed, which was a positive sign. What if he doesn't show? Kellner asked. I answered without looking up from the screen. Then I guess I'll just have to think of something else. But I think he'll show. That is, unless anyone tells him not to. His lips straightened into a thin, humorless smile. I don't think there's any danger of that. Good. Then we have nothing to worry about. He put a hand on the doorknob and twisted it down, pausing before opening it again. I won't see you again, will I? I affected a look of polite confusion. Won't see who again? He nodded understanding and opened the door, stepping back inside and closing it firmly without another word. I looked down at the address I'd typed in. The date and the time tallied with what I knew, and the location across from the bus station made sense. Bryant would want to make the exchange and get as far away as he could, as quickly as he could, and leaving as little trail as he could. I walked back down to the main road and waited a couple of minutes until my cab appeared at the corner. I got back in and told him to take me back into the city, to the nearest hotel to the bus station on First Avenue. I was looking forward to a night's rest before I attended my appointment with Mr. Bryant. Halfway into the journey, my phone rang and turned the prospect of a restful night into an impossible dream. Chapter 13 The call showed up as a withheld number. I toyed with the idea of ignoring it and then decided to pick up. It was Coop. That surprised me, because we both like to keep communications to a minimum. At first I thought he had some new information on Bryant, but I knew it was something else when I heard his voice. There was a tone I had never heard from him before, and it took me a second to work out what it was. Confusion. Coop had received an email a half hour before. The sender's address was a generic Gmail account. The subject line read simply, 
for the attention of J. Cooper. That got his attention right away, because this was the email address through which prospective clients contacted him. Without exception, those clients knew him only by a pseudonym. He told me he had opened the email and found a very brief message and a PDF attachment titled Martinez. I felt a tingle at the base of my spine at the mention of a name I hadn't heard in years. But I kept listening as he relayed the content of the message. What happened to Jake Martinez? Carter Blake would want to know. And that was it. No sign-off, no instructions, no hints as to the identity or motives of the sender. Coop had double-clicked to open the PDF and had known immediately that he would have to tell me about this. What is it? I asked, though I had a pretty good idea already and I knew I wasn't going to like it. It's a scan of an Interpol black notice, he said. He didn't need to translate the lingo. I knew all too well what a black notice was. Looks like it was circulated three weeks ago on a male Caucasian body, found dumped just outside of a town called Tumen in Siberia. No identification. But the labels on his clothing were mostly American and European, and he was carrying a pack of Marlboros. No ID on his prints. And no one locally has come forward to claim him. I cleared my throat and tried to keep my voice level. Cause of death? You knew him, didn't you? Coop said. I can hear it in your voice. How did he die? I repeated, annoyed at Coop despite myself. Executed. Two nine-millimeter bullets in the head, one in the gut. They beat him first by the looks of this. Broken fingers, dog bites, too. I closed my eyes and rubbed the bridge of my nose, picturing the body in my mind's eye. You still there? Yeah. Send it over. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah. I knew him. We worked together. I guess that. This isn't good, is it? Certainly not for Martinez. Coop forwarded me the email and the attachment. There were two pictures at the top of the Interpol document. The first was a computer-aided composite of a man in his mid-thirties with brown eyes and dark brown hair. The second showed the same person, apparently. It was a graphic close-up of a dead man lying on a blood-stained patch of snow. Evidently, he had been there long enough to freeze solid. The two holes in his head looked like black marks, as though he were the victim of some kind of medieval plague. The face was distorted by the gunshot wounds and the cold, but it still looked human enough for me to be sure that this was Jake Martinez. What was left of him, anyway. I remembered something Martinez had said the last time I saw him. All we're doing is delaying the inevitable. There were a lot of reasons why Martinez or anyone in our former line of work might show up dead. There was only one reason why somebody would have gone to the trouble of contacting me through Coop to tell me about it. Winterlong. Martinez and I had come to an arrangement with them five years ago, a mutual understanding that we would leave each other alone. The picture of Martinez dead in the snow told me two things. That arrangement was now null and void, and they would be coming after me next. Chapter 14 Seattle Something had changed. I thought about an abandoned house in the Santa Monica Mountains. The man with glasses the eerily calm face I'd seen several times since in my nightmares. What he'd said. Dracacus isn't here anymore. Perhaps I'd been fooling myself for the last few years, thinking that if I only kept my head down and stayed out of their way, 
they would let sleeping dogs lie. Even as I thought about it, I knew I had never truly believed that. The Samaritan case had put me back on the agenda for them, as I had feared it would. Covering up Dean Crozier's history with Winterlong would have been expensive and resource-intensive. They wouldn't risk having to do that again, particularly with two loose ends who might decide to start talking at any moment. Better to tidy up quietly on their own terms. Our low profiles and the probability of us maintaining our silence had kept us safe until now. But Martinez's face on the Interpol black notice told me that period of detente was over. There was no doubt in my mind. The mention of my name in the accompanying email could mean nothing else. It was them. And I was next. The only question was, how long did I have? No one in the world knew where I was, since even I hadn't known I would be going to Seattle until a few hours previously. My name would show up on the passenger manifest flying from San Fran to Seattle. But that would be a needle in a haystack unless they knew where to look or were prepared to bring in other agencies. I didn't think they would want to do that if they could avoid it. That brought me back to thinking about the reason I was here. I had a job to do, and I was close to completing it. I had the time and place of the buy, and in a matter of hours, I would have Bryant. After that, once I had returned the stolen software to Stafford and secured the balance of my fee, I could go to ground. I would head east, to the place I was keeping the very thing that Winterlong wanted. I thought about Martinez, an unidentified body in the Siberian wastes. I thought about the small suburban house where I'd last seen him, about our agreement. We hadn't expected to hear from each other ever again. I thought about why Coop had received the email and knew that they expected it to flush me out. Did they expect me to come after them? Charge blindly in to get revenge for Martinez? If so, they had the wrong guy. I dialed Coop's number again. Trouble? he asked, not wasting time on a hello. You could say that. How did they get your email address? I don't know, Blake, and I can't say I like it. I'm sorry. It might be a good idea to clear out, lie low for a while. And after this call, don't worry, I'll get rid of the phone. And I think you're right. I think I'll make arrangements to be someplace else as of tomorrow. That's a good idea, I said. Email when you get settled. We'll work out the Munola thing. You on the right track? I'm getting there. Always a pro, no matter what. I smiled. I'll talk to you soon. Be careful, Coop. I always am. I hung up and stared at the screen of the phone. It wouldn't hurt to take the same precautions I'd advised Coop to take. I switched the phone off, removed the battery, and put it back in my pocket. A second later, I changed my mind and asked if the driver minded if I opened a window. I tossed the phone out as he turned the next corner. It was after midnight when the cab drew up in front of a budget hotel on First Avenue. You in town long? The driver asked. I figured he was making a last-ditch effort for a good tip, having been unable to lure me into a conversation for the length of the trip. I shook my head. Not long. I handed over the fare, plus ten. As I stepped out of the car, the rain began again. Thursday, January 7th. Chapter 15. Orlando. Coop's eyes opened gradually. It was still dark. He had fallen asleep facing the digital alarm clock on his bedside table, so he didn't have to move a muscle to know that it was 3.57 a.m. He didn't think he had been having any kind of disturbing dream, and he hadn't woken naturally before eight o'clock in any of his fifty-nine years, as far as he was aware. So what had woken him? 
He kept his eyes on the luminous digits and listened. The low hum of the air conditioning. The distant hum of the traffic on the 408. Too early in the year for crickets. A dog barked somewhere, blocks away. But then, something else. A scratching noise coming from the hall, from the front door, from the lock of the front door. Coop, still hazy from the deep sleep, snapped fully awake. He hopped out of bed with a dexterity that belied his years and physical condition, and moved quickly across the carpet to the partially open bedroom door. There was a lock on the door, activated by a twistable knob on the inside. One of the many benefits of living in a hotel suite, rather than a place of his own. He used to keep the door locked at night, a precaution he had neglected recently. But then, if the door had been fully closed, he would never have heard the scraping from the front door. He closed the bedroom door, holding down the handle so that the catch wouldn't make a noise, then gently released it and twisted the lock. Assuming whoever was working on the exterior door knew what they were doing, this one wouldn't trouble them much, but it would buy him another few seconds. Just as the lock clicked softly home, he heard an answering click from outside as the front door finally surrendered. He stepped back into the room, circumnavigated the bed, and took the Colt 45 from the top drawer of the bedside table. He clicked the safety off, and then opened the sliding glass door that led out to the balcony. No time to get dressed. So as he stepped out onto the concrete in his shorts and vest, he gave thanks that he lived in Florida and not in New Hampshire. The balcony was a solid chunk of rough concrete, with a four-foot-high wall guarding the two-story drop. The balcony extended along the front of the building, and all of the rooms and suites had doors that opened onto it. This time of the year, they would likely all be closed and locked, but perhaps he'd get lucky. As he calculated his next move, his mind was working on the identity of the person or persons who had just infiltrated his suite. He was a couple of decades past being as careful as he used to be, but that didn't mean he could afford to write this off as a simple burglary. After all, he maintained contacts that many people would kill for. He had in excess of $3 million in his various bank accounts, not counting the transactions he held temporarily for some of his contractors. There were plenty of reasons why this home invasion could be very personal. And then there was Blake. That email he'd sent him earlier. The dead man in the snow. Coop moved quickly along the row, trying his neighbor's sliding doors one after another. All were locked. And all were in darkness but one. The last on the row, Tom Mitchell's place, was casting the flickering blue light of a television onto the balcony. Tom was forever falling asleep in front of the late show. Coop heard a click from behind him that he knew was the sound of his own sliding door being unlatched and prayed to be lucky. He reached out and grabbed the handle of Tom's door. It was open. He darted through the gap and slid it closed, knowing he was too late to complete the action without being heard. Sure enough, Tom was passed out in his armchair in front of the wall-mounted plasma screen, his head rested back, his throat issuing a mucus-strangled croak. He coughed himself awake as Coop stepped in. <clears throat> what the? Coop opened his mouth to respond, to tell him that they both needed to get the hell out of there, when he saw movement reflected in the glass of one of the picture frames on the wall. He ducked and ran for the open door into the hall as he heard a series of rapid cracks as bullets fired from a silenced pistol penetrated the glass door. He heard thuds as they punched into the drywall, following his path across the field of fire. Tom Mitchell's blood splashed his arm as he made the door and tumbled into the hallway. Definitely no random home invasion. Don't think. Don't look back. Just move. Coop unlocked the front door and swung it open. Diving out into the corridor, gun pointed back along the corridor in the direction of his own door. Whoever they were, they had extinguished the hall lights. 
but in the moonlight spilling out from his own open door, he could make out a dark-clad figure pressed against the wall outside. He didn't bother to take aim, just fired three quick shots as he fell back in the opposite direction. The noise was deafening, shattering the silence of night. He hoped it would wake the place up, get them all dialing 911. If they had someone covering the door, they'd likely have people on the standard front and back exits from the hotel. He just had to hope whoever it was didn't have the inside knowledge to be covering the sole remaining exit as well. He ducked through the door to the stairwell, wondering if he had managed to take out the man outside his door at least. The bullet hole that appeared in the wall next to his head answered that question. Shit. Coop barreled down the stairs barefoot, keeping the gun trained at upper body height as he rounded each corner. He hit the ground and kicked the door to the lobby open, before passing it by and continuing down to the basement. As he descended the last of the stairs, he thought about the fact Charlie would be working the front desk. His final night shift of the week. They would kill him if he got in the way, like they'd just killed Tom. Maybe they'd kill him even if he didn't get in the way. Can't think about that now. Just run. The keypad lock on the door at the bottom of the stairs delayed him for about a second and a half. Charlie had supplied him with a four-digit code months ago in return for half a bottle of Jim Beam. The basement was lit by fluorescent strip lights and cluttered with stacked boxes of catering supplies and sacks of dirty laundry. Coop closed the door behind him as quietly as he could and spent a second with his ear to the door listening, trying to keep his breathing steady. He heard footsteps reach the ground floor and the lobby door bang open again. They'd bought it. For the moment. He moved fast across the space to the east wall. There were long, narrow windows at ground level looking out onto the alley alongside the hotel. The windows were wire mesh glass to thwart people from breaking in, but thankfully there was nothing to keep people from opening them from the inside. Coop forced himself to stop as he reached the windows. He scanned the narrow field of view. He saw nothing but it was difficult to tell since the alley was lit only by the overspill from the streetlights out front. It didn't really make a difference. This was it. His only chance. He unlatched the nearest window and pushed it up. It creaked and complained as it swung up. He placed his gun on the ground outside and hauled himself up and out, scraping his bare legs badly on the steel frame. He gripped the gun again, and maneuvered himself with some difficulty to his feet, breathing really heavily now, the blood pounding in his ears. No time to think about heart trouble, just time to run. He forced himself to be still for a moment, letting his eyes sweep over the darkness of the alley, confirming he was alone. When he was as satisfied as he could be, he edged toward the street and flattened back against the wall when he reached the corner. He paused another second, and then risked a glance around the edge. He could see lights on in some of the rooms, the results of the shots he had fired a minute ago. With any luck, some of the neighbors had already called the cops. The hotel entrance was sixty yards away beneath a red awning that stretched out over the sidewalk. There was no one outside the entrance, which meant, if he was in luck, there were only two of them, and they were still inside. Maybe they'd worked out that he'd headed for the basement. If so, that locked door wouldn't hold up to a bullet. No matter what, he didn't have long. Where the hell were the cops? Suddenly, he was aware of the ridiculousness of his situation. Standing outside at four in the morning, in his shorts, holding a gun, and trying to work up the guts to make a move. The street was empty so he heard the engine before the car made the turn two blocks away. Coop shrank back into the shadows, but kept his eyes on the headlights as they approached. It was a taxi. The for-hire sign lit up. He felt a surge of hope and suppressed it, reminding himself he still had to convince the guy to stop for an old guy in his underwear. Waving the gun was a no-no, even if he actually tried to use it to force the driver to stop, 
it would likely have the opposite effect. Too many cab drivers had gotten shot in Orlando for the driver to take the risk of cooperating with a carjacking. For the same reason, he couldn't try to conceal the gun behind his back. It would be a dead giveaway. The way he was dressed was enough of a strike against him. But the vehicle was only a half a block away now, just passing the hotel entrance and the red awning. He was out of options, and this was it. In another 30 seconds, the men with guns would come from the front door or through the basement window or from somewhere else. He made the decision. He dropped the gun and stepped out onto the street, raising a hand as the taxi approached. The taxi slowed and pulled in. Coop got in close and quickly opened the back door. Warm out tonight, huh? The driver said without looking back. So much for him not noticing. Yeah, Coop grimaced. The husband come home early? Something like that. Coop asked to go to a cheap, anonymous hotel he knew on International Drive and hunched down in the seat, keeping an eye out the back as they pulled away. As he watched, a figure appeared at the door, staring intently at the taxi as it pulled away. Shit. Had he gotten the license plate? How long would it take them to get to their cars and follow? He turned back to face front, addressing the driver. Actually, I've changed my mind. You know O'Shaughnessy's bar? The driver made no indication that he had heard. Through the half-open window next to him, Coop heard sirens at last. Thank God. That would give the bastards something to keep them busy. Just as Coop was about to ask the question again louder, the driver answered. You got an address? You don't know it? It's on Poinciana Boulevard. Jimmy O'Shaughnessy's establishment officially closed at two, but it was a rare night Jimmy didn't stick around until dawn shooting pool with the regulars behind locked doors. Coop would be able to borrow clothes and money. That was another point. His wallet was still in the back pocket of his pants in the hotel, which meant he had no way to pay for the ride. This driver was going to have to continue to be understanding, and Jimmy was going to have to be in. He kept glancing at the road behind them as he tried to plan his next movements, at the same time as trying to process the ordeal he had just narrowly survived. It had to be something to do with the dead man in the snow. It had to be. And that meant it had to do with Blake. He had to get a hold of Blake. Blake would know what to do. So many competing thoughts crowded his head that he didn't notice the driver was headed in the wrong direction for a good couple of minutes. He didn't snap out of his own thoughts until the cab made a sharp turn down a blind, unlit alley. The headlights lit up a seven-foot-high corrugated iron fence as the car slowed and stopped. And then the driver switched the lights off, plunging them into darkness. Hey, what are you... Coop froze as the silhouetted man in the driver's seat turned around and raised a gun, a pistol, elongated by a suppressor. He was still thinking about the gun he'd left behind, thinking that he wouldn't have had time to reach for it anyway, when the muzzle flash lit the interior of the car up. The last thing he saw was the cold disinterest in his killer's eyes. Chapter 16 Did you have to kill him? Stark hissed as soon as he got close enough. He holstered his weapon as Abrams opened the door and got out of the taxi, still holding the Glock. He glanced at the corpse in the back seat, as though confirming the veracity of the complaint before responding and then shrugged. Kill or capture? Wasn't me who let him get away, Stark? Stark let that one pass. He had been concerned that a three-man team was insufficient for this assignment. Not that there was any question of the target getting away for real, of course, but with more men, they could have achieved their goal without killing anybody. Of course, if Usher hadn't taken so long on the goddamn lock, 
it might have helped too. Instead of taking the bait, he leaned down so that his eyes were level with the nearest window that looked in on the back seat. He surveyed the aftermath. The old guy was definitely out of competition. He was sprawled across the seat, his still open eyes staring upward. There was a neat circular hole in the center of his forehead. Blood and chunks of gray matter were splattered all over the back window. Stark shook his head. The guy was in his underwear, for Christ's sake. It was... undignified. He couldn't help admire the old guy. He had made a solid attempt at giving them the slip, and from a standing start, too. They should have brought more than three of them to cover all exits. If Abrams hadn't been circling the block... A horrible thought occurred. Jesus. What did you do with the real driver? Abrams looked up, his eyes narrowing. I wasn't supposed to kill him either? He held the look for a moment, then chuckled. Shit, <laughs> Stark, lighten up. I took it from a gas station two miles away. You'll be long gone before the cops think to look in this particular alley. You better hope so. This isn't Mogadishu, Abrams. Rain it in. Whatever you say, boss, Abrams said evenly. Stark got the distinct impression he was enjoying this, even knowing the importance of discretion. He was comporting himself with all the restraint of a drunk looter during a Super Bowl riot. Let's hope Usher got what he needed, Stark said. They rendezvoused with Usher half a mile from the alley. He had brought the van and was sitting in the front, the light from a laptop screen illuminating his face. He glanced up at their approach and unlocked the doors. Stark and Abrams climbed in. In the distance, they could still hear sirens. He looked at Stark and Abrams in turn. Stark had already brought him up to speed with the results of the chase via the in-ear comms equipment they all wore. Clean up. Abrams gave a thumbs up. I left the car at the bottom of an alley. You'd need to go deep in there to even see it. And even then, it's too dark to see the body until you get up close. Usher nodded and looked back at the screen as the progress bar completed, the screen double reflected in the lenses of his glasses. The man I killed in the hotel will keep their attention for a while. Stark didn't comment on that. More collateral damage. If this was their idea of restraint, he hated to think what these two had been like going after Martinez in the ass end of Russia. Usher had connected a portable hard drive to the USB port of the laptop and was watching another progress bar at about two-thirds of the way to completion. How long do you need? He asked. Another minute. He left this. He handed Stark a cell phone. Last call was two hours ago, and an email a minute later. The black notice? That had been Murphy's idea. The action had two aims, to flush out the target and to spook him. Stark hadn't been sure about it for that very reason. All else being equal, he preferred his targets not to know when the wolves were on their tail until it was too late. But then, Murphy had an extra insight into this target. Besides, every other suggested method of tracking down Carter Blake would take a lot longer. They couldn't be certain that Cooper or his files would lead them to Blake, but they could rely on Cooper contacting him. It had already taken them months following the revelation that Blake was still active to identify this one link to him. Jefferson Cooper, a specialist agent in this field who brokered deals between those with difficult assignments and those willing to undertake them. Cooper, Coop to his close contacts, was ex-CIA. Cooper had left the agency in the late 90s, spent some time as a consultant for some civilian military companies, and was now earning a nice little living as a man who knew people. He was careful, both to stay below the radar himself and to ensure he didn't keep anything to tie him to the various contractors he was in touch with. His address book, if he had one, 
would be full of ex-spooks for hire. But Blake was something a little different. Stark thumbed through the recent calls on the phone. None of them had names. Some were saved in the phone book as single initials and numbers. The last call in the log was to a number saved as B2. What was the email address he sent it to? He asked Usher. Very generic. He made that call and then he forwarded the picture. No additional text from him in the email. It had worked. The name and the picture had triggered Blake's curiosity. It has to be Blake, right? Stark said. He calls him, tells him about the black notice, and then Blake asks him to forward it. That means we have his cell number. Which means we have him in about two minutes, Usher agreed. What are you going to do? Call him? Abrams asked. Usher's eyes narrowed, as though he couldn't work out if the other man was making a joke. He tapped away on the laptop, paused, then tapped a few more keys in. He switched his phone off, but we have the last ping from a cell tower a couple of hours ago. Where? Stark asked. Seattle. Figures. Around the corner would have been too convenient. He looked through the windshield. Let's get the hell out of here. We know where he is. Now let's clip his wings. Usher went around into the back. Stark followed, while Abrams jumped into the driver's seat and twisted the key in the ignition. They rolled out onto the road and headed toward the freeway. Chapter 17 Seattle Stark's team was in the air before the blood had dried. A chartered jet waiting on standby took them directly to Seattle. Thanks to Abrams, they had no need for the equipment they had in place for the restraint and sedation of a prisoner, which at least removed one potential headache. They touched down at SeaTac a little after 7 a.m. local time. Stark had managed to sleep for most of the flight, jolting awake only when the wheels hit the ground. He was grateful. He had made good use of downtime, while avoiding dwelling on the fact of being 36,000 feet in the air in a metal tube. The chartered flight was faster than a commercial service, and just as quick as a military jet would have been, with the advantage that there was no need for an official paper trail. Faraday was keen that this operation like the Crozier op, attracted as little attention as was possible. Stark suspected Abrams hadn't received that memo. They disembarked from the jet, and Abrams picked up a rental car. Stark sat in the back as they headed for downtown, watching the sun come up over the Emerald City. Blake was out there somewhere. The last ping from his cell had been around midnight local time not long after he had spoken to Cooper. Fifteen minutes later, Abrams pulled into the basement garage of a downtown Marriott. They took the elevator straight to the 10th floor conference suite. The entire floor had been booked for three days, at what Stark assumed was great expense. But again, it was off the books. They joined the forward team, who had flown in a couple hours earlier. They had already fully established the field ops room. Laptops, maps on the wall, strategic area priorities already mapped out in neat bullet points on one of the wall-mounted whiteboards. Dixon looked up as they entered. The big man made a show of standing to attention. Welcome to Seattle, he said. Business or pleasure? Stark ignored that, eyeing the whiteboard. Anything on his cell? Any emails back to Cooper? That's a negative. Dixon said. Let's hope he's still here. Stark was certain he would be. They had let Blake know they were on to him, but he couldn't know just how close they were. And he would find it more difficult than expected to leave town, in any case. All right, first thing. Somebody needs to point me in the direction of the coffee. Second thing. He's not going to find himself. Stark looked at the whiteboard again mentally prioritizing the locations, 
and dividing them between the ten men in the room. Chapter 18 Seattle By 10.30, Wakey's was in the quiet lull after the breakfast crowd and before the lunch crowd. It had an old-time feel that set it apart from the chain places. Parquet flooring, lots of dark wood, and red leather upholstery on the booths. There was a lunch counter running the length of the place, facing windows that looked across First Avenue to the bus station. I wondered if Scott Bryant had bought his bus ticket already. I assumed the deal was a cash buy. Anything involving bank transfers would be too traceable for either party. Industrial espionage had come a long way in the past century, from folders pilfered from locked filing cabinets to gigabytes of data on a piece of plastic smaller than your thumb. But the preferred payment method hadn't evolved at all in that time. I took one of the stools at the lunch counter and looked at the menu printed on boards above the window. I had gotten there early to make sure I was in place for Bryant's arrival, but it would be an efficient use of the time to eat as well, since I had skipped breakfast. Ever since Coop's phone call at midnight, my appetite had taken a leave of absence. On my way to the diner, I had stopped at a coffee shop to check my email. The coffee shop had tablets bolted to each table, so you could browse the internet over a cappuccino. There had been nothing from Coop. A burly cook wearing a white short sleeve shirt and a backward ball cap approached and asked for my order. I ordered a steak sandwich and a black coffee and watched as he prepared the sandwich filling on the griddle in front of me. As he mixed peppers and onions into the pile of chopped steak, I savored the aroma and turned on my stool so I could survey the rest of the clientele. Six other people besides me. An elderly couple taking their time over their food, chatting to each other. Three teenage girls, all with heads down, staring into their phones. And a big guy in a plaid shirt, occupying one of the booths on the far wall. I wondered if this diner had been selected for the meat because it was quiet. Maybe Kellner had picked it, or perhaps the choice had been Bryant's, drawing on the experience of his sojourn in the city. I turned back around just in time to see the cook plating up the sandwich. He slid it in front of me in a smooth, practiced motion. While I ate, I kept a discreet eye on the three areas I'd selected to ensure I could see. The door, the street immediately outside, and the entrance to the bus station across the road. I finished the sandwich and started on the coffee. The old couple finally finished up and asked for the check. One of the teenage girls looked up from her phone long enough to tell her friend she was leaving. The two compatriots glanced up from their screens for a second to smile their goodbyes. Two guys in suits came in, took the next booth down from the plaid shirt guy, and opened their respective MacBooks. At five to eleven, I asked for another coffee and the check, in case I had to move quickly. The cook came back with both at the same time. I laid cash down on the plate and was starting on the second coffee when a familiar face passed by. Scott Bryant was on the street outside, glancing into the diner and straight through me as he walked. He paused a second at the door, as though psyching himself up, and then pushed it open. Bryant stopped again inside the door and surveyed the interior. He had made some effort to alter his appearance. He had shaved the beard and ditched the glasses. He wore a long black overcoat and one of those hats with flaps at the sides. A good choice. It covered his hair and his ears, and it was certainly appropriate to the climate. I had seen a dozen passers-by wearing hats like that in the time I'd been in the diner. He gripped the handles of a canvas laptop bag in his left hand. The bag also fit right in, but I knew it was functional. Nobody was going to hand over a substantial amount of cash for a $5 flash drive without first making sure it contained exactly what they expected it to. He let his gaze sweep around, taking in the guy in the plaid shirt, the remaining two girls, the MacBook guys, and me 
and deciding none of us was a threat. Satisfied, he made his way to the booth nearest the door, which was unoccupied. He took the seat facing the door and removed his hat, keeping the coat on. From my position behind him, I was able to watch him for a while, enjoying his nervous mannerisms as he drummed his fingers on the table and hesitantly ordered a beer before changing his mind and asking for a mineral water. I gave him a couple more minutes just to let him really start to worry that no one was going to show up. I was about to make him wish nobody had. I drank the last of the coffee and got up. I walked across the parquet floor to Bryant's booth. His head snapped around as he heard me approach. He couldn't have looked guiltier if he'd had the word thief scrawled across his forehead in marker. Before he could make a move, I put my left hand on the back of the seat and my right on the table, positioning myself so he would have to get physical if he wanted out of the space. You're really not very good at this, are you, Bryant? He backed a couple of inches further along the booth seat. The leather upholstery squeaked as he moved. He looked up at me, barely concealed panic in his brown eyes. Who the hell are you? I let the question hang for a moment, then indicated the seat opposite him with my hand. If I sit down, you're not going to do anything stupid, are you? He thought about it, glanced past me at the door as though considering making a break for it, then shook his head slowly, keeping his eyes fixed on mine. I believed him. I dropped my arms and slid into the seat across from him. We watched each other across the table for a minute. There are a lot of ways it can go when you finally come face to face with a subject, dependent on a number of variables. If at all possible, you want to close out the business in hand without any kind of physical confrontation, although for obvious reasons, sometimes that's impossible. I try to plan the encounter out in advance, but in most cases, you don't really know how it's going to go until you see the whites of the subject's eyes. Sometimes, not even then. I was looking at the whites of Scott Bryant's eyes now, and I knew I was in a good position. If he had been inclined to use violence, it was likely he'd have done so immediately. If he had a plausible get-out-of-jail card, he would have been talking it up already, or at least acting confident. The man across from me looked like he knew it was all over, and I had barely spoken to him. That's why I knew silence was the correct technique. He didn't have a clue who I was, how I'd found him, or what I was about to do. He knew why I was here, of course, to intercept him before he sold me time to Kellner or one of his staff. Beyond that, nothing. He didn't know if I was a cop or a federal agent or a bounty hunter. He didn't know if I was carrying a weapon. He didn't know if I had orders to take him to jail or to put a bullet in his head. I wanted all of these possibilities to swim around his head for a while before I got down to business. Eventually, he broke the silence. You're not... Kellner? Who I was expecting. That's pretty clear. He let out a sigh that had an uneven timbre, like he was trying not to shiver. So, what now? Do you have the software? He said nothing for a moment, perhaps hoping I would give more away, and then nodded when he saw I wasn't going to. He reached into his inside pocket and removed a small white envelope. He tore the top off and put his hand inside, removing a small blue flash drive between his thumb and forefinger. He took his eyes off me for the first time and looked at it like an alcoholic regarding a drink he'd just been ordered to put down the drain. Any other copies? I asked. No? I didn't believe that, but it wouldn't make any difference. Put it down. He hesitated, then did as instructed, gently laying the drive on the polished wood of the tabletop. 
I left it there, sitting back in my seat, as though the main business was concluded, and we could both relax now. Stafford? he asked. I nodded. You must have known he would come after you. I didn't think I had made it that easy. Who told you? No one told me, I said. I do this for a living. He stared at me for a moment, as though trying to decide whether I was lying. I don't suppose you're going to let me just walk out of here. I shook my head. It doesn't have to be as bad as you think, though. He almost smiled. What, he's going to give me a slap on the wrist and say no more about it? Probably not, I admitted. But you're in luck. No harm done yet. So if we go back now with the software, it doesn't need to mean jail time. He shook his head firmly. It was the first decisive movement I'd seen him make since I laid eyes on him. Uh-uh, no way. I'm not going back. I reached over and plucked the flash drive from the table, holding it up to the light. Amazing things, aren't they? Twenty years ago, you'd have needed a half ton of floppy disks to store this much data. Now you can keep it in the watch pocket of your jeans. Do you have a name? His tone had gained a little steel, now that he was resigned to losing his meal ticket and, in all probability, his freedom. When it suits me. Okay, Mr. Man with no name. You got Stafford's data back. I'm sure he'll be very pleased with your work. What do you need me for? You know what I need you for. The data isn't enough. He needs to make sure you can't sell this to somebody else from the copy I know you've made. He said nothing, waiting for me to continue. I explained my proposal. Stafford would get the software back, plus a signed statement admitting to how, when, and why Bryant had stolen it, and confirming he hadn't given a copy to anyone else. It's the only way he can be sure me time's protected, I finished. If anybody hits the market in a few months with a reverse-engineered version of the software, he can prove exactly where it came from. The resigned look in Bryant's eyes had changed while I had been talking. Because now he saw the out for himself. Now he was thinking, calculating. But he would need me to cooperate, testify, if it came to it. That's right, I said, sensing I was getting through to him. But only if you already gave a copy to someone else. Did you? He shook his head. But you made a copy. The corner of his lip curled upward a little, despite himself. Of course I made a copy. So, by a stroke of luck, you're in a reasonably advantageous position. In return for no jail time, you sign a sworn statement saying the software has gone no further. He knows you're on the level, because you'll go to jail if it shows up somewhere else. But he needs that guarantee. If he presses charges, you have no reason to cooperate. Bryant picked up the glass of water for the first time. He tilted it back and drank it in one, his throat muscles working as the liquid went down. When he was finished, he wiped his mouth and stared back at me. And what if I don't believe you? What if I just get up and walk out of here? He glanced from side to side, taking in the rest of the clientele. You going to stop me with all these people about? I'll yell kidnap. Go ahead. They can call the cops. I'll explain the whole situation to them. What'll happen then? He was silent for a minute, trying to think of every way out and knowing there was only one possibility. You can make this happen? I nodded. Why should I trust a man with no name? A fair question. My name's Carter Blake. You bring me time back with me, and there's no jail time. 
I was making a promise that I hadn't cleared with Stafford, of course. But I knew Stafford was a pragmatist, and he wouldn't be able to dispute the logic. The only reason for him to turn down this deal was pure vindictiveness. And a man would have to be pretty vindictive to jeopardize two billion dollars. Okay, Blake. You have a deal. He held his hand out. I shook it. I wish I could say it was nice to meet you, he added. Five years ago, New York City. Given the way our conversation had been occupying my every waking thought over the last couple of weeks, I was surprised by how much I wasn't thinking about Senator Carlson. Carol and I were in Central Park, walking at a leisurely pace through the zoo on the Park Avenue side. The leaves of the trees had already started to turn brown and drop, but a sudden upswing in the temperature had arrested the onset of fall for a brief moment. We had both removed our coats, and Carol smirked as I draped hers over my arm along with mine. An officer and a gentleman, huh? I stopped mid-stride and affected a concerned look. You're right. How sexist of me. Here. Carol ignored the coats offered in my outstretched arms and kept walking. I'll let it slide just this once. Very understanding of you. That's me. Very understanding. An officer and a gentleman. The choice of words hadn't been accidental. I thought about our first date. The way she had held out to the end of the main course before really starting to question me. Guessing a little too accurately about my background. You're definitely military, she declared, after I'd politely evaded another of her questions about what I did for a living. My dad was in the military. It's difficult to hide it completely, though you do a pretty good job. I just smiled. Interesting. Tell me more. Why don't you tell me yourself? I'm more interested in your version. She had pouted her lips theatrically, and then risen to the challenge. You're recently back from overseas. But I already told you that. I haven't finished. You shaved when you came back. I can tell from the tan line. I'd taken another drink and motioned for her to continue. So your hair's a little long, too. That and the fact you had a beard tells me you're not regular army or navy, which means some kind of special ops? I grinned. I remember being surprised at how much I was enjoying her company and how much I didn't mind the interrogation that would normally make me uncomfortable. I can see why Carlson keeps you around. How'd I do? She looked serious, like the competitive part of her really had to know. Not bad. But I'd rather talk about something else, if you don't mind. She cocked an eyebrow. And what's that? I held her gaze for a moment. Coffee or dessert? She didn't hesitate. Both. She had been content to let me keep my cards close to my chest on that first night. Maybe she had even enjoyed the mystery. But I could tell from her periodic digs, like the officer in a gentleman crack, that my reticence was beginning to niggle her. We walked in silence for a couple of minutes, soaking up the unexpected warmth of the November sun and watching the other people doing the same. The joggers and the families and the nannies with high-end prams walking the offspring of some of the residents of the rarefied apartments that overlooked it all. This was the fourth time we'd been together since my first meeting with Carlson, and we had already established that neither of us was the type to be concerned by a lull in conversation. Fourth date, but all of a sudden, I realized there was a different feel to this one. For the first time, we hadn't arranged to go to dinner or a movie or any other approved date activity. This time, we had just decided to go for a walk, because spending time together seemed to be what we did now. 
I wondered if that subtle difference had occurred to Carol. The realization felt good, but quickly brought with it a stab of apprehension. Because the more time we spent together, the more she and I became we. The quicker we would reach that point where we had to talk about where this could go, rather than just enjoying the moment. And just like that, I was thinking about Carlson's office and Winterlong. I had made it the best part of an hour. Definitely a new record. I was still awaiting the next assignment. My phone had been quiet for weeks, and I was beginning to wonder if the unease I was feeling about that was more than just paranoia. I had been thinking about what would happen after I made my move, if and when the opportunity arose. There would be no question of me sticking around, waiting for Winterlong to hunt down their turncoat. I would have to disappear for good, leaving everything behind. Everything and everyone. What are you thinking about? Carol was looking up at my face as we walked, and I realized my expression had given away the fact I was brooding on something. Nothing in particular, I lied. Just thinking. Thinking about when you're going to tell me what you've been talking to the senator about? That caught me by surprise. She had asked me about the meeting over dinner on the first night, and I had deflected the inquiry with something vague about my work overseas being of interest to Carlson. She hadn't pressed me that night, and she hadn't asked again. Until now. And the way she said it, revealed she knew the senator and I had spoken on more than one occasion. Don't look so worried, she said, while I was still trying to come up with a response. Need to know, huh? Something like that, I said. He'd have to tell you himself. Not exactly a lie, but a disingenuous response. I knew there was no way Carlson would share our conversation with Carol or anyone else. Not yet, anyway. I figured, she said. Hey, isn't that creepy? What? Carol had stopped walking and was looking up at the little animatronic figures emerging from the clock tower above the three archways that led out of the zoo and back into the park. The clock was chiming while an off-key tune tinkled away. It is creepy, I agreed grateful that she had chosen to change the subject. She kept looking at the clock for a moment as the song played and the tourists and the nannies and joggers passed us by. It's getting late, she said. We left the park and got the subway at 5th and 59th, heading down to Carol's apartment in the East Village. It was a one-bedroom walk-up, which would have been a cheap place to rent for a folk singer or a poet in the 60s, but I guess nowadays it would absorb the bulk of her salary. We'd talked on the way about where to eat, then decided it would be fun to stay in and cook. Carol wasn't much of a homebody. This was her first day off in three weeks, and she apologized that she wouldn't have much in the cupboard. We picked up some supplies at the Italian grocery store on the corner and took everything up to her place. Her apartment was small, but neat. You could tell a lot about the occupant with a cursory glance. It was a place to sleep and occasionally relax, but it didn't feel quite lived in. The only real personal effects were a large bookcase, taking up one wall of the living room and a television in the bedroom. I recognized the spare utilitarian ethic from my own place and wondered for a second if this was another reason we were unconsciously drawn to each other. As though to prove the point, she picked up a remote control from the coffee table, pressed a couple of buttons, and a Sam Cooke song started up from hidden speakers somewhere. Wonderful World. My favorite soul singer. And something else we had in common without knowing. Chemistry is a funny thing. Just like Drakakis had said. I like to put on music when I come in. More relaxing than just turning on the news. You know what I mean? 
I nodded at the other door leading off the living room. Kitchen in there? She nodded and then looked at the bag of groceries. Yeah, but just put them down here. I did as she asked, and all of a sudden, she was in my arms, her right hand on my cheek, pulling me in for a kiss. When we broke for air a minute later, I smiled. I thought you were hungry. There's more than one way to be hungry, she said playfully. We kissed again, breaking earlier this time as she grabbed my hands in hers and tugged me back toward the hallway, quickening her steps as we fell into the bedroom. We tumbled onto the bed, her pulling my shirt out from my belt and fumbling with the buttons as we kissed some more. She pulled her T-shirt over her head before putting her arms around me again. A patter on the window distracted us for a second as the rain started up out of nowhere. I looked back at her, wondering if this was a good idea, when so much was still in question. She seemed to sense my hesitation, and nodded. We kissed again. Chapter 19 Seattle I had been alert for the possibility of Bryant making a run for it when we got outside the diner, but he played along, resigned to the new itinerary. There was nowhere to run, not really. He knew it as well as I did. He had already proved he wasn't the type of person who could disappear without a trace. Now he was without resources, friends, or even the chance of a payoff. He would last a week on the run tops. All he could do was delay his arrest and sacrifice the chance to cut a deal with Stafford that might keep him out of jail. So, do you have the plane tickets already? He asked as we got into a cab headed for SeaTac. I shook my head. I always buy them at the airport. More expensive that way. In some ways. The journey passed in silence for a couple of minutes, as the cabbie negotiated the surface streets and turned onto the on-ramp for the Alaskan Way viaduct. Should be a smooth trip this time of day, fellas, he called back as we merged into southbound traffic. Twenty, twenty-five minutes. The mention of time reminded me that I had really expected to hear from Coop by now. I made up my mind to call him right after we bought the tickets. So, I guess we're going to be traveling companions for the next few hours, Bryant said after a minute, settling into the seat and seeming to relax for the first time since I'd seen him. Looks that way. It doesn't have to be awkward, does it? I looked over at Bryant. His demeanor surprised me. He seemed to have accepted the reversal of his fortunes with good grace and was content to sit back and enjoy the ride. I didn't know if he was putting up a front, either for my or for his own benefit, but I had to admit, I kind of admired his attitude. It made me think I'd made the right choice, offering a deal to Jasmine Bryant and to him. Not on my account. I guess you do this a lot, huh? I thought about it. This tends to be different on every job, but yeah, I find people. It's what I do for a living. You're an expert then. So, how'd I do? What do you mean? How close did I get to getting away clean? From me? I asked. No offense, but not very. As soon as I knew where you were headed, and that you hadn't made the sale yet, I knew I could get you. And how did you find that out? Trade secret. Let's just say everybody makes mistakes. He shrugged and looked out at the cars coming the other way on the other side of the barrier. Great. I wanted to make the sale last night. Kellner put me off, said it would be better to let things cool down a little. I didn't say what I was thinking, that Kellner had been playing it safe, waiting to see if Bryant was going to get caught and he had been right to do so. He shook his head at his bad luck. I could have been long gone. I didn't say anything to that. I knew better than most that it's more difficult to truly disappear than people realize. 
if the sale had gone through before I had tracked Bryant to Seattle, it would have made things a little more difficult for me. Not to mention a lot more difficult for Kellner. But I would have found him sooner or later. And besides, he had already left enough of a trail to lead me to his prospective buyer. In that sense, Bryant's loss was Kellner's gain. Since the deal hadn't gone through, there was nothing concrete to tie him to any of this. I was grateful to be thinking about the work, about something that was largely under my control. The traffic on the highway started to bunch up a little at the exit for SeaTac. Bryant was still staring out of the window, watching a 737 take off, headed out over Puget Sound. I knew he was wishing he were on that plane, and not the one we were about to catch. Why did you do it? I asked quietly, so as to be sure the driver would not overhear. Bryant turned, and I saw a flash of embarrassment in his eyes that I had caught him gazing at the plane and guessed what he was thinking about. Did Stafford pay you extra to provide counseling? Why do you think I did it? For the money. Same reason you took this job. What's the difference? Money isn't the whole story for me, and I doubted it was for him either. I shrugged. I guess one difference is I knew what I was getting into. He stared back at me for a moment, and then turned back to watch the airport buildings as they passed. You know what? I've changed my mind. Let's skip the small talk. Chapter 20 The driver led us out at the drop-off lane in front of departures. I paid him and grabbed Bryant's laptop case from the seat between us. He didn't object. As we passed through the doors into the terminal, he looked at the case and realized it was the only item of baggage I was carrying. He spoke to me for the first time since the cab. You travel light, huh? I had left my stuff at the hotel. Retrieving it before we flew back to California would have meant a delay I didn't feel I could afford. With a bird in the hand, I decided I could afford to replace the clothes and the travel toiletries, and the laptop was clean. I wasn't just thinking about not giving Bryant more time to change his mind about cooperating. I was starting to get more than a little concerned that I hadn't had an email from Coop yet. I knew he would be busy, but I had expected to have heard something from him by now, even if it was just to tell me he hadn't received any more emails with photographs of unidentified dead bodies. That made me think of something I had forgotten to ask Bryant. I take it you have ID? I asked. He patted his coat pocket. Driver's license and passport right here. Be prepared, huh? He looked so rueful that I almost wanted to apologize for catching him. I reminded myself that he had brought this misfortune entirely on himself not caring about the fact he might bankrupt his boss and put his co-workers out of a job. He shook his head. I thought I was being so smart driving up here, staying off the grid. Flying is too traceable these days, you know? Not that it matters now, I guess. Bryant couldn't know that he was starting to make me nervous. He was right. Flying was too damn traceable. Right now, my priority was to get Bryant back to Stafford, get paid, and get clear. I had been reasonably relaxed about how much time I had the night before. Now I wasn't so sure. A two-hour flight to California would probably be okay. After that, I would heed Bryant's advice and get the hell off the grid. I knew where I had to go, and I realized now I would have to do it the long way. I told Bryant I had to make a call, and we found a solitary phone booth tucked away in a corner beside the restrooms like a forgotten heirloom. He raised an eyebrow, obviously surprised I wasn't using a cell phone, but said nothing. He stood a couple of feet away from the booth as I picked the handset up. I hadn't used a payphone in a while, but probably not as long as most people. Payphones still have their uses. One of these days, they'll rip out the last one and put it in a museum, 
and there will no longer be any such thing as a truly anonymous call. Given that my phone was at the bottom of Lake Washington, it was helpful that I have a good memory for numbers. My first call was to Coop's cell. It went directly to voicemail. No personalized message, just the operator's default request to leave a message or call back later. I hung up before the message ended. The low-level anxiety I had been feeling had increased. The next call was to a number I hadn't memorized, but hadn't had to. It was the direct dial on the business card Stafford had given me the day before. Why the hell is your phone switched off? Was the first thing he said. It's been giving me problems, I said, before cutting to the chase. I told him I had made some progress and that there was a very good chance I could get the MeTime software back to him, its secrets intact. The hook baited, I laid out my suggestion. Bryant and I would return to Moonola with the software. Stafford could confirm no more copies were in existence, and in return for a detailed and signed statement from Bryant, Stafford would agree not to press charges. His response was immediate. Not a chance. He's going to jail. That was the deal. The deal was, I'd do whatever I need to do to find your guy, I reminded him. I couldn't have gotten this far without making certain assurances to certain people, and I can't go back on that now. If you're willing to compromise a little on this, you get everything you want. No harm, no foul. Stafford was quiet, thinking it over. The other option is easy. I return the fee and maybe Bryant sends you the software back by mail. Or maybe he doesn't. This is a good deal, Stafford. His reply sounded like it came from between gritted teeth. How soon can you be here? This evening, say, five o'clock at your office? All right, Blake, he said. I guess it'll have to do. I hung up and looked at Bryant, who had caught enough of my end of the conversation to know whom I'd been speaking to. He went for it? Another satisfied customer, I said. Just about. There was a nearby ATM, and I withdrew another $500 for the tickets. The blonde attendant on the United Tickets desk gave us a glassy smile as we approached and asked us how she could help us. I asked for two tickets on Flight 468, the next plane to San Francisco International. She looked down and tapped rapidly on the keyboard in front of her. She checked the screen, and her fixed smile took on a sympathetic cast. She inclined her head sadly. I'm afraid we only have seats in business left on that. Business is fine, I said. Might as well go out in style, Bryant said. All of a sudden, I was on edge. I don't like flying at the best of times. It's the only type of travel where you have no option but to go on record. You have to provide your name and use photographic ID. Like Bryant had just said, too damn traceable. But I needed to get him back to California and get moving. It would take only a couple of hours by air, and by the time anyone wanted to check up on it, all they would have would be San Fran as a starting point of where to look. The alternative was to drive, which would take most of a day. The attendant hit some more keys and turned to face us again. The smile dialed back up to full wattage. That'll be 672.18, including tax. May I take your credit card, please, sir? Can I pay cash? Back to sympathetic. We no longer accept cash, I'm afraid. I sighed. This was a recent innovation at the larger airports, designed to create a faster and more efficient airport experience for customers, or something like that. But I knew I was leaving a trail anyway, so... One more breadcrumb wouldn't make it any worse. I handed over the Amex card I keep in my wallet as a last resort. Thank you, Mr... She paused as she read the name on the card. Blake, and I'll need photographic identification for you and your traveling companion, too. We handed over our driver's licenses, and she deftly arranged the credit card and the DLs on the desk in front of the keyboard like a croupier dealing a hand. 
two hours, I reminded myself, as she started to tap our details into the system. Just two hours. And then the attendant's demeanor changed absolutely. In the course of our conversation, she had modified her smile as appropriate to the information she was giving us, but suddenly the bulletproof customer service facade had vanished like fine mist on a summer's morning. She was reading something on the screen she was not used to seeing, and she was frowning. I felt the thousand needle points dance up and down the length of my spine as her eyes moved away from the screen and back to us. She remembered to smile only at the last moment, but her attempt was brittle, fake in a very different way from before. I apologize. We're having some problems with the system. Do you mind waiting here while I contact my manager? You idiot. I cursed myself. So much for two hours. Actually, I'll come back. We'll go get a coffee. I held out my hand for the cards. The attendant didn't move. Bryant was looking at me, a bemused expression on his face. So there was a technical glitch. So what? I need to keep your identification until... until the technical issue can be resolved. If you could please just wait here a moment, I'm sure it won't take long. There was no point wasting any more time. I grabbed Bryant's arm and started walking away. What's wrong? She said it would only take a minute. I could hear the attendant calling after us, her excuse me's gaining in volume and urgency. People standing in line at the other ticket desks were starting to turn and stare at us. We're getting out of here, I said. Now. But you said, what do you mean we're getting out of here? Why? Because I'm on the no-fly list, and that's very bad news. Chapter 21 It was bad news for more than just the obvious reason. Appearing on the no-fly list doesn't exactly make you a VIP in and of itself. There were about 6,000 names on the list last I heard, and it was growing every year. So in terms of notoriety, it's not quite the same as hitting the FBI's 10 most wanted. But it's not a good sign. You don't get on the list by jumping bail or committing a run-of-the-mill crime, which was how I knew it was my name and not Bryant's that had set off the alarm bells. It means that you've made it through a number of filters of persons of interest and have been designated as a live risk, someone who should not be allowed to board an aircraft. That my name was on the list meant that they were more serious about getting me than I'd appreciated. It meant somebody had pulled strings with the FBI. If I know anything about the feds, it's that they're not exactly ultra-compliant, no-questions-asked types. So not only was Winterlong on my trail, but they wanted me bad. Bad enough to create some ripples. Right about now, someone was receiving a phone call to let them know that someone by the name of Carter Blake, answering my description, had just tried to buy a plane ticket at SeaTac. The only question now was, how close were they? Did I have time to get Bryant back to San Francisco by alternative means, or should I just cut my losses and go? I glanced around as we walked. The terminal was a high space, bounded by 60-foot-high windows. There was a raised mezzanine level accessed by stairs and escalators, and a food court and stores beneath. There were lots of people crowded around, waiting for their gates to be announced, saying their goodbyes to friends and relations. I decided that heading immediately for the front entrance would just make us stand out more. Instead, I made for the busier area around the stores at a quick walk. Bryant was keeping pace with me. That made me realize that he really did understand his best chance was to stick with me. If he had decided to stay at the ticket desk, there would have been nothing I could have done about it. Blake, what's going on? I thought I was the master criminal here? I ignored him. I glanced behind me and saw two burly security guys in white shirts and navy chinos approaching the United desk. The woman was pointing in our direction. Fortunately, we were already obscured by the crowd. I hoped there was another way out through the food court. Seriously, 
tell me what's going on, or you can forget me going any further. I'm not getting mixed up in some terrorist thing. A lady with white hair and pink-tinted glasses gave a sharp intake of breath at the mention of the T-word as we passed. Keep your voice down, I hissed. This isn't a terrorist thing. Then what? I used to work for some people. They don't like me very much. I can buy that, and I've only known you for an hour. We need to get out of here. No. Sounds like you need to get out of here. He sounded vaguely amused. I guess I would have in his position, too, if I had no idea how much danger we were both in. We passed a Starbucks and one of those generic airport bar and grills. I saw a sign for the restrooms and a fire exit. It was better than nothing, though I expected the door would be alarmed. We, I repeated. If airport security gets a hold of us, they'll put us in one of those little rooms for a few hours until they hand me over to my people and you over to the cops. Why are you saying all this like it's my fault? Bryant, shut up. He opened his mouth again before deciding to take my advice. I looked over my shoulder, glad to see no sign of the security twins just yet. I glanced around the stores again, seeing a clothing store. That gave me a better idea than hoping there was a back exit we could sneak out of. Give me your coat, I said. What? Just do it. He shrugged the overcoat off and handed it to me. I removed my own coat and draped both over my arm, heading for the clothing store. The space within was full and cluttered, thanks to the spatial limitations of an airport concession. Folded T-shirts and sweaters were stacked on shelves around the walls, and heavier garments like coats and dresses were hung on racks, crammed together across the modest floor space. The cashier was serving a customer, an old man in a gray fedora. I made my way to the farthest rack and hung the coats up over a pair of turquoise dresses before making my way to the front again. On the way, I passed a couple of racks of coats. Glancing at them long enough only to make sure I didn't select anything too small or too large, I plucked two raincoats from the rack, one green, one blue, and made my way to the register. The cashier had finished serving the guy in the fedora, but a large woman was now approaching the register carrying a plastic bag T-shirt. We were about equidistant on our approaches, and the cashier glanced at both of us with an indecisive smile as if to say, you two figure out who's next. Seeing the look, the woman quickened her pace pointedly. I did likewise. I didn't have the time to wait in line, and I definitely didn't want to attract even more attention by shoplifting the coats. I beat her to the counter by a nose. Listen. I hate to do this, but I'm running really late. Do you mind? The woman pursed her lips, stepping in front of me and actually physically butting into me. I most certainly do. You should have arrived in better time, shouldn't you? I glanced at the price tag and took two hundreds from my wallet. I dropped them on the counter with a look of apology to the cashier. Mission accomplished. I brought the coat back out and handed one to Bryant, his face wrinkled up at the sight of the cheap raincoat I'd just overpaid for. I like that coat. Well, now you can like this coat instead, I said. I pointed back out at the main terminal space. Walk straight across there. Don't run. I'll meet you at the taxi stand in three minutes. He rolled his eyes, but nodded assent, walking out in front of me. We'd be exiting through the front as two lone men in raincoats, rather than sneaking out through the back, as the pair the United Check-In woman would have described to the guards. I hoped that would be enough of a diversion. I gave Bryant thirty seconds, and then followed him. As I cleared the ring of travelers hanging around the food court and the shopping area, I saw the two big security guys again. They were scanning the faces in the crowd, speaking into their radios, and wearing the unmistakable expressions of people who are trying to identify someone they've never laid eyes on from somebody else's description. Of course, the place was scattered with security cameras, which would make it easy to track our movements and our escape method later, but not in enough time to stop us.
I saw Brian exit through the revolving door ahead of me as I passed within ten yards of the nearest security guy. He was talking calmly into his radio, eyes darting around the crowd. I looked around and saw three other security officers closing in on the shopping area. All I needed was ten more seconds to reach the exit and safety. And that was when I saw the man in glasses. Chapter 22 I had seen his face only once before, but I knew I would never forget it as long as I lived, however long that turned out to be. It was a face that promised nothing good, the face of a tax inspector interviewing a suspect about a discrepancy, or an uncaring doctor about to give a patient bad news. The blue eyes behind the round lenses seemed to study everything that passed before them like a predator dispassionately regarding its next meal. Pitiless countenance aside, the rest of him blended into his surroundings, from his neat haircut to the black overcoat worn over a button-down shirt, black pants, and polished shoes. If he had had a briefcase, he would have looked like an executive on his way to or from a meeting, but he carried nothing. Nothing that wouldn't fit beneath his coat. Our eyes met, and it was too late already. The flicker of recognition flashed behind the glasses, and I pictured the last time I'd seen this man, pointing a gun at the head of an LAPD detective named Jessica Allen. It felt like we stared at each other for an hour, though it couldn't have been more than a split second. I turned away and started walking quickly, following in the direction Bryant had gone. I quickened my pace to just short of a run as I approached the exit doors, not daring to look back and not even worrying about the airport security anymore. It had been too late the moment Coop had sent Martinez's black notice. I knew that now. That had been the reason for the email. Not just to rattle me, but to find me. They must have known my general location for hours. Were probably staking out the airport as one of the most likely places to find me. That phone call about the no-fly list had probably come directly to the cell phone of the man in glasses. As the automatic doors gave way at my approach, I saw the people behind me faintly reflected in them. The man with glasses was a dozen paces back, another man now walking alongside him, watching as he pointed me out. The second man was around the same height, short reddish hair, dressed similarly. I passed through the doors. The rain had started up again, harder than before. Bryant was there, poised to climb into the open back door of a cab at the front of the stand. I glanced around. It was less busy than I had been hoping at this exit. Most people had scurried for cover from the downpour. There were only a few people making their way to the public pickup points farther on. That was bad. Fewer people meant fewer witnesses. Are we good? he asked, completely oblivious to how much more trouble we were now in. Get in, I yelled, running toward the front passenger side. Carter, Blake! I heard the shout from behind me, knew it was either the man with glasses or his friend, whom I hadn't gotten a good look at. Police! Stop where you are! I ignored it and yanked the door open, sliding in. Bryant was already in the back seat. Maybe we should... That's not the police, I said as I heard the voice again. Closer, louder. Stop, or I'll shoot. The taxi driver was looking over the head restraint, past Bryant, and through the back window at the two approaching men he assumed were plainclothes cops. He turned to look at me, alarm in his eyes. What is this? We have to get out of here, I said. They're not cops. I glanced back and saw the man in glasses pointing the gun straight at us. I yelled, Get down! as I ducked. Bryant reacted quickly. The driver, not quickly enough. Three shots shattered the back window, safety glass spraying over the interior. I heard a fleshy impact as the driver took a bullet in the side of his throat. He slumped over, his eyes rolling back in his head. His body was held up by the seatbelt as a torrent of blood coursed down the front of his shirt. Staying down, I slammed the car into drive and lunged headfirst into the driver's footwell 
slamming the palm of my hand down on the gas pedal with my left hand while I gripped the wheel with my right and yanked us out into the lane. The wheels spun and then caught, jerking us out onto the road. I corrected the steer blind, hoping we wouldn't hit one of the concrete pillars outside of the terminal. Two more shots punched into the car, one of them passing through the back window and exiting through the windshield, the other hitting the driver's side wing mirror. I gritted my teeth as we sideswiped another vehicle, a glancing blow not enough to slow us down. I risked putting my head up in time to avoid plowing into another car and course corrected enough to keep us on the straight before ducking down again as I heard two more shots. Bryant's suddenly high-pitched yell came from the back. What the fuck, Blake? I ignored him and stabbed my finger at the button to release the driver's seatbelt, taking my other hand off the wheel long enough to scrabble at the door handle and push it open wide. I grabbed the wheel as the car started to list to the left and yanked it hard right. The driver's body tipped over and out onto the road. I took my other hand off the gas, shuffled across into the driver's seat, and stamped my foot down on the pedal to bring us up to speed again. The exit road curved around on itself before leading out, but there was a line of low bushes directly ahead that offered a shortcut. I floored the gas and braced myself as we hit the verge and plowed through the line of bushes, swinging onto the road that led out of the airport in front of a shuttle bus. I felt impact as Bryant slammed into the back of my seat, face first with a yell. Seatbelt! I yelled, daring to glance in the rear view for the first time. The shuttle bus had slewed into the verge to avoid us, neatly blocking the exit road behind us. That was good, but I knew we wouldn't get far in a shot-up stolen taxi. We passed under the freeway bridge, took the curving on-ramp at 60, and merged onto the freeway. The cold air sucked through the bullet holes in the windshield and breezed through the smashed rear window. Bryant was looking back out of the window in disbelief. They shot at us. They just shot at us. Why would they? I kept my eyes on the road, looking out for signs for the next exit. The real police would be on our tail soon enough. I told you, they're not cops. Well, who the hell are they? They can't just start shooting at us, can they? They're people who don't give a shit if you think they can't start shooting at you. They're people who won't stop until we're dead. I thought about that. Bryant was as deep in as I was now, marked for death by association. I'm sorry. Where are we going? You'll know as soon as I do. Chapter 23 Seattle Stark walked over to the driver with the idea of checking for a pulse. He realized there was no point when he got within ten feet of the sprawled body. His head jerked around as he heard a scream. A large woman in a raincoat looked out from the shelter of the parking structure across from the taxi stand. Oh my God, is he dead? Please stay back, ma'am, Stark commanded, waving her and the other people who were emerging from the shelter to gawk away. They were very lucky that these bystanders had been too busy getting the hell out of the way to pay close attention to what had happened. He returned to where Usher was standing. The pair of them holstered their weapons and waited patiently in the rain, keeping their hands visible. With any luck, Blake's name triggering an alert moments before would mean the cops could be quickly persuaded they were on the tail of a dangerous fugitive. Still, it was a hell of a mess. Faraday would be pissed. Was that a good idea? Stark asked. It was Usher who'd started firing first. Stark had backed him up only reluctantly, aiming for the tires. By that time, Blake had gotten the car out of effective range. We'll take care of this. That wasn't what I asked, Stark said. You killed the driver. Four airport security guards were approaching them, guns drawn. Stark was pleased to see they didn't look scared or tense, just wary. The way he and Usher were dressed, their demeanor, and the fact they'd put their guns away, was enough to put the cops at something like ease, as far as was possible in this kind of situation. The two of them looked like feds of some variety, so 
they got the benefit of the doubt. How different from the reaction they might have gotten in other parts of the world? Usher turned to look at him, speaking quietly. Blake killed the driver. The combination of the intense stare and the calm, flat voice put Stark in mind of a hypnotist. He knew Usher wasn't trying to convince him it hadn't been his bullet that killed the driver. That would imply he cared. No, he was just making sure Stark knew the official story. Of course, an autopsy and ballistic tests would eventually confirm that the driver had been killed by a bullet fired from outside the vehicle. But that would take several hours. By the time that was confirmed, they would both be long gone, never to be seen by local law enforcement again. Questions would be asked, demands would be made, but nothing would reach the unit or usher. The blame would be filtered up through various government agencies until it evaporated entirely. Keep your hands where I can see them and identify yourself, the closest security guard called out. He was a tall black man in his forties, gray hair at his temples. Calm, experienced looking. He obviously sensed they were authorized personnel of some kind because he hadn't yelled at them to lie on the ground yet. Stark was glad they weren't dealing with an unpredictable rookie. Officer, I'm going to produce my identification, okay? Usher said. The officer nodded. Slowly, left hand, right hand where I can see it. Usher did exactly as ordered, moving carefully and deliberately. He produced an ID wallet and held it up for the cop to look at. We're with the Department of Homeland Security. I'm Agent Black. This is Agent Burroughs. The lead cop stepped forward, his body language already relaxing. The other three kept their guns on the two men while he examined the ID. It would pass muster because it was indistinguishable from a real DHS ID. He handed the ID back to Usher. Okay. What's going on, Agent? Thank you, Usher said. We've been tipped off that a couple of terrorist suspects were about to board a domestic flight. Sure enough, one of them was flagged on the no-fly list about ten minutes ago when he tried to buy a ticket. We made a visual on the suspects, but before we could make the arrest, he paused and gestured at the body lying on the road fifty yards away. They killed a cab driver and stole his vehicle. We need to run them down as soon as possible. These men present a live risk. A dozen more security personnel had arrived while they'd been talking. Two paramedics were examining the body of the driver with no great urgency, one of them shaking his head. They won't get far. Any particular reason we weren't informed of your operation today, Agent? the cop said, a hint of sarcasm in his voice. Stark pitched in, deciding Usher's matter-of-fact condescension was not the ideal tool to extract themselves quickly from this situation. I'm sorry, officer, we had people at various locations across the metropolitan area. We couldn't be sure they'd be here until United's database triggered the no-fly alert. We'll need the pair of you to wait right here. I'm afraid we don't have time, officer, Usher said. This is a matter of national security. We'll be pleased to cooperate once... The officer shook his head and held a hand up to stop Usher. I've got shots fired in my airport and a dead civilian. Nobody's going anywhere. Stark sighed inwardly, although he'd been expecting this. He turned to Usher. Do you want to make the call? Usher kept his eyes on the officer. His eyes had narrowed and his tone was even frostier than usual. I'll make the call. Chapter 24 Seattle We left the freeway and I pulled off the road at the first opportunity, which turned out to be the entrance to a business park. We passed several rows of units. I saw a tire place, an auto repair center, and a bunch of different wholesalers. Nobody was out front of any of them, apart from a guy in coveralls stacking tires with his back to us. I slowed down a little 
and took a few random turns until we ran out of open businesses and found ourselves surrounded by boarded-up units. I found a blind alley between two derelict units just wide enough to admit the taxi and nosed it in as far as it would go. There was an opaque roof of corrugated plastic sheltering the alley, and by ramming the car straight into the junk at the far end, I managed to make sure its full length was under cover. I got out and gave myself a once-over. Some of the taxi driver's blood had gotten on my left side, but thankfully it wasn't obvious against a dark suit. Some of it had soaked into my shirt cuff, so I rolled both shirt sleeves up so they weren't visible. When I saw Bryant had made no move to join me, I opened the back door. Come on. He was staring straight ahead, looking a little sick. He hadn't spoken since the freeway, and I wondered if he was in some kind of delayed shock. I didn't have time for that. While I felt bad that events hadn't exactly gone to plan, my sympathy for Bryant had limits. Bryant, now! He broke the thousand-yard stare and looked up at me before nodding slowly and sliding out from the back seat. His nose was bleeding a little from the collision with the head restraint, but it didn't look broken. I headed back for the mouth of the alley, not wasting any more time on persuasion. Bryant followed behind, not needing to be told the third time. He had retrieved his laptop case from the back seat. There was a bullet hole through the dead center. When he saw it, he looked like he was going to throw up. Could have been worse, I reminded him. Is there anything saved on that? Search history? Email password? Bryant shook his head. It's brand new. Just for the demo. Good. Leave it. The rain had abated for the moment, but from the look of the sky, it was temporary. We turned the corner, and I looked up and down the road between the row of units. All were shuttered or boarded up, and there was nobody else in sight. I knew we had to keep moving, but there was something I had to do first that couldn't wait. I asked for Bryant's phone, and he handed it over. It's okay, he said. It's clean. No contract. Untraceable. Nice idea, I said, if you hadn't synced it to your personal Microsoft account. I turned away from him as his jaw dropped. The ID we'd left at the United desk meant that our pursuers knew Brian's name. Eventually, they would be able to trace devices registered to his online account and probably be able to use that information to locate this phone. But that would take them a while, and I'd make sure we left it here after I made one last call. Everybody makes mistakes, he said quietly, repeating my words from earlier. Goddamn right they do, I said, more to myself than him. I didn't call Coop's cell phone this time, although it was part of our understanding that we didn't know where each other was based. Old habits die hard. I had spent some time a while back tracking down the specific hotel in Orlando in which he resided, even managing to pin down the name he stayed under. I found the number of the Sunset Apartments on Google and hit the button to call. The voice that answered sounded harassed, impatient. At first, I mistook that for standard-issue snooty concierge behavior. But when I asked to speak to Mr. Gray in room 204, there was a full two seconds of silence. Excuse me a moment, sir. There was a pause as the receiver was cupped with a muffling hand, hushed voices relaying the information of whom I'd asked for. It sounded as though he was asking for direction. The voice was artificially bright when it came back on. May I ask who's calling, sir? Tell him it's Mr. Kubert. Bryant was watching with interest and mouthed, What's up? I ignored it. Another pause. Phone muffled again. I heard a scuffing sound as the phone was passed to someone else. This is Detective Mike Malone, Orlando PD Homicide. Who's speaking? I felt as though I'd been delivered a gut punch. I hung up, turned the phone off, and removed the SIM and memory cards. I dropped the phone on the ground, and stamped down on the screen with the heel of my shoe. 
Bryant opened his mouth to protest, then thought better of it when he saw the look on my face. All of a sudden, it looked like the clock was running down. The drizzle began again as we walked, lighter than it had been at the airport. We made our way back through the maze of units, taking a different route than the one we'd driven in by. As we got nearer the entrance, we found more places open for business, a cake supplies outlet, an auto parts store, a remaindered books warehouse. I was hoping there might be a used car lot, but no such luck. Finally, we found our way back to the main entrance just in time to hear sirens on the freeway a quarter mile back. I froze and watched as two police cars flew over the bridge crossing the road we were on and continued past the exit. That was a break. Either no one had seen us leave at the first exit, or the information hadn't been conveyed to the cops on the ground yet. In truth, I wasn't as concerned with the kind of cars that announced themselves with sirens and flashing lights as I was about the anonymous black SUV that might appear at any moment. The men at the airport had much more information about who we were and why we were running than the cops, and that would mean they'd stand a better chance of catching up with us. The road we were on was quiet, but I could see steady traffic passing at the next intersection, about 200 yards away in the opposite direction from the freeway bridge. We covered the distance quickly. All around were vacant lots and low buildings, too open, too exposed. As we reached the corner of the intersection, I saw what I thought was a bus stop on the other side of the road. As we got closer, I realized it was a light rail stop on the airport line and, a break at last, a northbound train was approaching. The sign above the windshield told me it was headed to downtown Seattle. Back to square one. I avoided eye contact with the driver, who paid almost no attention to either of us as we paid cash for two tickets into the city. Bryant sat down first, taking the closest empty seat to the front. He glanced around warily at the other passengers as though expecting another attack. When the doors closed and the train moved smoothly off, he finally spoke. So, what now? Now, we get the hell out of town. We? You think I'm going anywhere with you after you almost got me killed? No way. Deal's off. I sighed. This has nothing to do with the deal. They're looking for us both now. What the hell do you mean? I never even met you before this morning. They don't even know who I am. They saw you with me. That means you're a potential lead to me. You don't want to hear about what they'll do to find out what you know. He opened his mouth to protest, but I kept talking. And they know exactly who you are now. We had to leave our ID at the ticket desk, remember? He looked like he was trying to think of another argument before shaking his head in frustration. Shit. Tell me about it. This is your fault, you know. I'm going to get killed because of you. Don't look at me, Bryant. If you hadn't swiped me time, they'd be shooting at me in an entirely different state right now. The train slowed for the next stop. A couple of streets from us, we saw a police car run through an intersection, lights on. Bryant and I exchanged a glance. So where do we go until the heat's off? He asked quietly, once we were moving again. The heat's never going off. God damn it, Blake. Do you have anything good to say? Sure. The good news is... I have a plan. Five years ago, New York City. Carol had arranged to pick me up at one o'clock that afternoon, but there was a conversation I needed to have with her boss first. I contacted the senator via the prepay cell phone I had been using for this purpose and asked for a meeting. He paused, then said he would shuffle his diary around a little and suggested meeting in Battery Park in a couple of hours. I got to the meeting point at Pier A ten minutes early, but Carlson had beaten me there. 
He was dressed in a long winter coat and hat. For a guy able to project his personality so forcefully on television, he was doing a creditable job of blending in. I didn't waste time on pleasantries. I want out. Carlson stared back at me, his face betraying no emotion. After a second, he nodded his head to the side, indicating that we should walk and talk. What do you mean? he asked after we walked a few paces. I mean, out of all of it, you, them, everything. I'm not going back. He took a moment to let that sink in. The temperature had plummeted in the last few days, and the wind blowing off the harbor was freezing. Small groups of tourists and couples wandered past, on their way to the Liberty Island ferry. Are you going to say something? Or are you just here for the exercise? I said, when we had covered a couple hundred yards without him saying anything else. Carlson stopped and looked across the harbor. Seems to me that choice isn't one that's open to you. How do you figure? You told me yourself. People don't leave winter long. My other contact tells me they're starting to get suspicious. What makes him think that? I had long since stopped trying to get a name out of Carlson. Little things. Nothing dramatic. They're taking a few more precautions. Codes being changed more regularly. More meetings of the senior staff. Does your guy think they're on to him? I caught myself just in time before I had said us. I still wasn't sure there was an us. Carlson shook his head. No. He doesn't think they know anything specific. But that doesn't alter my point. You don't just walk away from Winterlong. I've made arrangements, I said, not just because of this. On some level, I think I've been preparing for this for a long time. Carlson turned his head to look at me, saying nothing. I have an apartment where I can lie low for a while. I know a guy who can set me up with everything I need, driver's license, employment, and financial history, passport if I need it. You would need money. I have money. I could walk away from you right now, and five minutes later, I wouldn't exist. Winterlong helps on that. Everything about me is classified anyway, from my record to my medical history to my fingerprints. They've done the work for me. I'm no one. Easy enough to be a different no one. Is it? He turned away again. I need you on this. You have another guy. And what do you think will happen to him if you disappear? That kernel of suspicion is going to pop. Best case scenario, his hands will be tied. Worst case, it's not my problem. He paused and started walking again. I thought about turning and walking in the other direction, but in the end, I followed. You've been seeing Carol, I understand. She told you that? Not directly. But it's obvious to anyone who knows her she's seeing someone. She's happier. Are you going to walk away from her, too? Who says she can't come with me? He gave me a look of disappointment. You aren't really that naive, are you? Besides, it wouldn't be much of a life for her leaving everything behind, always looking over her shoulder. I believe you when you say you could do it, but Carol? He shook his head. I said nothing. After a moment, Carlson continued. And if you leave her, how do you know they won't try to trace you through her? Because nobody knows about me and her. The second it was out, I realized that wasn't true. Carlson knew, and if he knew, maybe other people did too. How sure are you about that? Carol arrived at one o'clock on the dot in a car she had rented for the weekend. Her idea. She had taken a couple of rare vacation days, and we decided it would be nice to get in the car and drive out to Long Island. 
with no particular plans in mind. Carol was enjoying the novelty of driving, and I was happy to let her take us the whole way. It gave me time to think about everything. We took Route 27, deciding after we got going to press on all the way to Montauk. We arrived a little after six and took a walk along one of the white sandy beaches before dinner. The view would have been clearer in the summer, but the gray skies and the rough sea had a rugged beauty all their own. I was thinking about everything Carlson had said earlier, and one thing in particular. She's happier. Carlson was a politician, of course. Manipulating people to get his own way was his stock in trade, and yet I couldn't quite get it out of my mind. She did seem happy. We both did. And that was something I should have avoided. What are you thinking about? I smiled. Actually, I was thinking about you. She didn't return the smile. You've been quiet today, the whole drive up here. Something's different. Nothing's different, I said, perhaps a little too quickly. She looked down at the sand, and I could tell she was about to say something she had been building up to, rehearsing in her head all day, perhaps. She had been quiet, too, on the drive out. What has he asked you to do? I can't talk about it, I said. It was the first time I had said that straight out, rather than deflecting her subtle inquiries. But she had never asked the question so directly until now. It's dangerous, isn't it? It's to do with whatever it is that you do? When it's all over, I'll be able to tell you everything. I promise. Assuming I stick around that long. Her expression said she wasn't kidding. Will you? We held eye contact for a long moment, and then she broke into a smile. But it was hard to read the smile. I hate you. Normally it takes people a lot less time to say those three words to me. You're exceptional. She rolled her eyes, and I felt a little of the tension dissipate. She reached for my hand and took it in both of hers. Seriously, you won't do anything to put yourself in danger. No more than usual. She nodded, as though that would have to be good enough for now. I doubted this conversation would get any easier the next time it came up. It was deep into the off-season now, so there were plenty of accommodation options. We took a room in an inn within walking distance of the beach. Neither of us felt like going out for dinner, so I picked up sandwiches and cold beer and brought them back, just missing the rain as it started up. We ate in the room, talking about everything that wasn't the senator or what I did for a living. Afterward, we sat on the couch and watched the rain shower down on the wooden deck outside. Carol put on some music on her phone. A Sam Cooke record again. You'll be careful, she said again. I know what I'm doing. She stared past me out at the rain for a while. That's the thing, though. There's always something you don't know. I was roused by the buzzing of my cell phone. Reluctantly opening my eyes, I saw that it was still dark outside and the rain was still falling. The buzzing continued. I knew what the call meant. Very few people had my number. In a second, I would have to break this spell and go back to the world, back to Winterlong. I looked at Carol, still dozing, her head on the pillow beside mine, a lock of blonde hair trailing down over one eye. The corner of her mouth curled up in a smile, as though she was having a pleasant dream. More than anything, I wanted to let the phone ring out. I wanted to hurl the phone out of the nearest window and forget all about Winterlong. It buzzed again. I moved my arm out from under Carol's head gently. She opened her eyes part way and murmured a sleepy, Hey. Hey back.
I got up and dug the phone out of my pants pocket. The screen showed a withheld number, of course. I walked across to the window and hit the button to pick up. What's going on? This is your wake-up call. Do you require a newspaper? The voice belonged to Murphy. My voice must have given away the fact that I had just woken up. I sighed. Just tell me when and where. Three hours, the usual place. Back your toothbrush. I looked back into the bedroom. Carol was sitting up in bed, smiling back at me. Everything okay? I hung up on Murphy. Nothing was okay. Nothing at all. Chapter 25 I had told Bryant I had a plan. In retrospect, maybe a plan was stretching it. Plans rely on detail, reflection, the weighing up of risk. What I had was a goal, to keep moving and to stay out of my pursuer's way long enough to retrieve the one thing I might be able to use against them. I began to tense up on the ride back into the city as more and more passengers joined the train. So far, none had given us a second look, but I wondered if our faces had been released to the news. There was no way to access the Internet to check. All of a sudden, I was really feeling the lack of a phone. It was hampering forward planning in a strange city, giving me no way to look up maps or transit options as we traveled. I consoled myself with the thought that, had I not ditched the phone, my forward planning might have been hampered permanently. Briefly, I thought about Stafford. He would not be pleased when I failed to deliver Bryant at the appointed time. I reminded myself that an aggravated client was pretty close to the bottom of my worry list. As a precaution, we sat apart for the last few stops, so as not to present a matched pair. The next step was to make some effort to alter our appearances. In particular, I wanted to ditch the two raincoats as fast as possible. The only reason I hadn't already was that we would be far more conspicuous not wearing coats on a typically rainy Seattle afternoon in early January. We left the train at University Street, the second from the last stop. We turned onto 3rd Avenue, and I spotted a branch of Macy's a couple blocks away. A department store was ideal for our purposes, and not just because of the range of goods. There would be lots of different exits, lots of ways to thwart surveillance. I asked Bryant if he was carrying any cash. He was, since he had already been on the run for a day longer than I had, and with more prep time. I gave him instructions and told him to meet me at the exit, at the opposite side of the ground floor, in 15 minutes. The in-store signs told me those doors would bring us out on 4th Avenue. He nodded, and we split up. I realized that this was the first time I'd given him a real option about whether to stick with me or pull a fade, and wondered if he'd be dumb enough to run. In all honesty, it would make things easier for me. Who knew? Perhaps my pursuers would leave Bryant alone, correctly assuming that he knew nothing. Then I thought about the gun pointed at Jessica Allen's head in L.A. The man with the glasses didn't like loose ends. He might try to get information out of Bryant, or he might simply put a bullet in his head to tidy up. Either way, they would find him, and he would have no chance to defend himself, if he even saw them coming. The ground floor was mostly taken up by the cosmetics department. I crossed the floor through an atmosphere composed of a thousand mixed scents, noting the positions of the store cameras. Another good thing about a department store of this kind. The building had been renovated, extended, and refitted time and again over a century or so. Plenty of camera blind spots. I found a perfect such blind spot in an alcove that led into a choice of two routes. I pulled the coat off, balled the light fabric up in my hands, and stuffed it behind a large potted plant in the corner. I waited a few seconds for a group of senior citizens to pass by, and then tagged along with them as they headed for the elevators. 
it would be far from impossible for someone to piece together my movements from the different cameras later. But it would take time. I left the group at the elevators and took the stairs to the sixth floor, which I noted from the store directory held both the menswear department and customer restrooms. I passed through the AV department on the way. Some of the display televisions were showing news channels with footage from the airport. I tried not to stare at the screens, but was reassured that I didn't see my own face or Bryant's. The on-screen text looked pretty vague. Shooting at SeaTac. I selected jeans, a flannel shirt, a winter coat, gloves, and a pair of boots, together with cheap hair clippers, batteries, and a pair of non-prescription glasses. I paid cash and headed for the restrooms. There was one guy washing up at the row of sinks, taking his time. I waited for him to leave, then took his place at the sinks. I took a second to examine myself in the mirror, running my fingers through my hair. It had been getting a little long anyway. I inserted the batteries into the clippers and set the cut length to a number one, just short of an induction cut. I got to work. Five minutes later, I'd flushed the clumps of my hair down one of the toilets and changed into the new clothes in the cubicle. I stood on the toilet seat and lifted one of the ceiling panels. I stuffed my suit, shirt, and shoes into the crawl space. I tried not to think about how much I had paid for that suit. I put the glasses on, unlocked the door, and made for the stairs again. When I reached the 4th Avenue exit, I thought at first that Bryant had taken the option to run. Then I realized that he had done a pretty good job of changing his look himself. He wore a long black overcoat, a green sweater, and a beanie hat. I thought again about John Stafford, expecting the two of us in California in a couple hours' time. He was going to be waiting a while longer. What now? Brian asked. I looked across the street and saw a road sign directing traffic toward King Street Station. Now, I said, we get the hell out of town. Chapter 26 New York Faraday drummed her fingers on her desk as she waited for the connection. She disliked waiting for a call to be put through to one of her operatives at the best of times, and this was far from the best of times. And then the quality of the silence on the other end of the phone changed subtly, and she knew he was there. Tell me what the hell went wrong at the airport, Usher. I don't think anything did go wrong. David Mendez begs to differ. Usher mulled that over for a second, as though it were a trick question. Who's David Mendez? The taxi driver who wound up dead in the middle of the road? Usher didn't continue along that line of discussion. We located the target. He could have been anywhere in Seattle, but one of our surveillances paid off. I'd say we made very good progress. Had we had a little more notice, then what? You wouldn't have shot up a civilian airport and still managed to let your target escape? I decided this was supposed to be Sub Rosa Usher. I'm not popular with Homeland Security or the Pentagon right now. Seattle PD are pissed, and I expect the FBI will be too when they find out they can't touch this. I'm investing time and favors keeping a lid on something that should have been taken care of quietly. I thought you were good at quiet. There was silence at the other end of the line. Faraday could feel herself beginning to lose her grip on her temper and wondered if there was anything she could say that would rattle Usher. In many ways, he was the model operative. He followed instructions to the letter, always doing exactly what was asked with single-minded, sometimes brutal efficiency. But for some reason, Faraday worried about him. She wondered what would happen the day they gave him an order he didn't like. Most of the men in the unit were killers. They had to be. But she could honestly say that Usher was the only one who made her uneasy. And that 
was unacceptable. She made a mental note that a tougher line would have to be taken with him. He would have to be kept on a tighter leash in the future, but not until Carter Blake was in custody or in the ground. Usher, are you still there? When he spoke again, his voice was level, reasonable. We had a shot. The decision was made to take it. The decision was made. Like it was out of his hands. Faraday sighed. I don't want to have to clean up any more messes, all right? There's only so far you can push need to know. When they all topsy that driver, they're going to want to know why they can't speak to the shooter. Usher said nothing. Faraday sighed inwardly, wondering what solution she'd expected him to suggest that would make this all better. Okay, you're in touch with the rest of the team? We've rerouted everyone back to base. He was referring to the temporary operations center they'd set up in a Marriott hotel downtown. We're IDing potential search zones right now. News says the police have no trace of the taxi. Thank God for small mercies. If they do pick up Blake, we'll need to extract him from custody, of course. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but not without my authorization. Is that clear? It's clear. That's good. Now, tell me you're making better progress than our friends in the police. Blake is still in the area. He can't have stayed on the freeway long in that car. So we're working off the first couple of exits as a starting point. I think he'll try to lie low. If he wants to get out of Seattle, he has limited options. He can't rent a car without his license, and he certainly can't fly. That narrows down the options a little. Good. It's just unfortunate that he knows how close we are now. Usher said nothing. Okay, she said after a minute. Get to it. And Usher... Yes? Try not to kill anyone else. Chapter 27 Seattle If I had been in any doubt when I received the email showing Martinez's body, the shootout at the airport had cleared it up. I was on Winterlong's kill list and it didn't look like they were choosy about when or where it happened, or who got in the way. I knew why they wanted me dead. It was because I possessed something that could, perhaps, take down the whole organization. Five years ago, that had been my bulletproof vest. Now it seemed it was no longer enough to protect me. Martinez had had the same bargaining chip after all, and it hadn't kept him alive. That meant they had found him and somehow forced him to give up what he had. Or maybe they had taken a gamble, decided he wouldn't have trusted anyone else with knowledge of where he had stashed it. It was the same problem I had faced. As soon as anybody else knew about it, it lost its value. One thing was clear. I needed to get my hands on that bargaining chip. If I couldn't stop them from coming after me, I could make damn sure they'd have too much on their plate to worry about me. The only problem? The Munola assignment had taken me about as far away from home turf as it was possible to get without leaving the country. Flying or renting a car were both now out of the question. Stealing a car would only make it more likely we'd be picked up by the cops, which almost sounded like a good idea, except that the police would hand us over five seconds after somebody waved the Patriot Act in their faces. I needed a way to cross the country as quickly as possible, without having to show identification or otherwise draw attention to myself. We didn't have time to hitchhike, so that limited our options to the bus or the train. A bus would be too small, with too few passengers and nowhere to hide. That left one option. Amtrak ran seven long-haul routes out of King Street Station every day. The eastern-bound service, which was called the Empire Builder, ran over 2,000 miles to Chicago, across the Rockies, taking almost two full days to reach its destination. 
Chicago would get us close to where I needed to be and perhaps even allow me to get Bryant to something like safety. The plan wasn't perfect by any means. The unavoidable fact that my travel options had been so curtailed meant that this mode of travel could be predicted. I just had to hope that the man in glasses and his friends would be spread thin enough to give us a chance. The train would give us some important advantages over a bus or any other kind of mass transit. Personal space. We could hole up for the two days, eat meals in quarters, and be on the lookout just in case. King Street Station wasn't far from Macy's. Its hundred-year-old red brick tower stood out from the more modern skyscrapers that towered over it. We were in luck. The Empire Builder's single departure for the day was scheduled for 4.40 in just over half an hour. The ticket desk stretched around one corner of the large, high-ceilinged waiting area. There was a bank of screens in the middle of the concourse, some of them displaying departure and arrival times, one tuned to a news channel. I gave in to my curiosity, slowing my pace a little as I passed. I tried not to look too interested, but then again, there were plenty of other travelers grouped around the screens. Some were watching the news with interest, just as many were more concerned with whether or not their train was going to be delayed. There was no sound, just the same few camera angles refreshed in a cycle. I guessed some were live, and some, like the footage of an ambulance unhurriedly leaving the scene, were from earlier in the day. The views alternated between some stony-faced cops guarding crime scene tape, a wide shot of passengers staring resignedly at departure boards, and a shot of the airport drop-off area from farther away. Thanks to the restricted airspace around the airport, the only image missing was a helicopter view of the crime scene. The ticker along the bottom of the screen provided the basics of the story on a loop. The heading had changed to Terror at SeaTac? I liked the question mark. It suggested that nobody knew exactly what had happened. Nobody who was cooperating with the media, anyway. The bullet points scrolling by hadn't been updated much in the last hour. One dead in shooting. Police seeking two unidentified male suspects. Air traffic disrupted. I watched the updates and the images for long enough to be satisfied that, even if the police knew our identities, they had not released them to the press. Otherwise, there would be names and pictures on the screen. Winterlong was keeping us to themselves for the time being. I didn't know whether to be grateful or not. The news changed to another story then. The weather alert in the Northeast. There was a big blizzard due to hit New York State and surrounding areas at some point in the next two days. Emergency planning was in full effect. I hoped that wouldn't cause me any problems. I examined the ticket desk. I could see security cameras covering each of the stations. The one at the far end was a little smaller than the others, and a cluttered shelf meant there was a partial obstruction in front of the cam. I picked that one and asked for two Chicago-bound tickets on the Empire Builder. The bald, bespectacled guy behind the desk barely glanced at me tapping away at his keyboard. Coach seats? Do you have any cabins left? I wasn't sure of the exact terminology, but I needed a door I could lock at night. He didn't look up at me, just said, A super liner roomette? Does it have a door? Yes. Okay, then. He kept tapping away and then told me how much it would be. I got a reaction at last when I slid $900 bills across the desk. I waited for him to tell me they only accepted credit cards, like the woman at the United desk. But then he shrugged and counted the bills out before pushing my change back along with the tickets. Cash purchase. No ID. Maybe I would travel this way in the future. If there was a future. I made my way back to where Bryant was waiting. So, where are we going? East, I said. Specific. Nice. We're headed to Chicago first. I know someone there who might be able to help. Chicago's cold this time of year. 
Well, we have two days to acclimatize. We waited until the last possible moment to board the train, climbing onto the coach car next to the front locomotive, three cars ahead of the one we were booked onto. The hum of the idling engine kicked up a notch as soon as the doors closed. Brakes hissed and metal squealed as the lumbering behemoth slowly started to break free of its inertia. The train swayed as it picked up speed, and we crossed through the next couple of cars. The first fully seated, the next containing sleeping roomettes. The cars were double-decked. I checked the number on the ticket as we passed into the next one and found our roomette in the middle of the lower level. The door opened onto a small space, no more than four feet deep by seven wide. There were two seats facing each other that converted into a bed, along with another bed which folded down from the wall for the top bunk. A picture window, almost the full width of the room, showed the last of the platform passing by as we moved out of King Street. I heard Bryant whistle skeptically behind me as he caught up and surveyed the roomette. Tell me you don't snore. Don't worry about it, I said. We won't be sleeping at the same time. I ducked under the low door frame and stepped into the tiny space. It would be a long two days. I had no gun, no phone, and virtually no money left. But at least I was reasonably sure that nobody besides Bryant and me knew exactly where we were. Dusk was already beginning to fall. I sat down on the nearest seat and watched as the train passed by the towers of Seattle, headed east into the cold. Chapter 28 We rolled on at a steady 50 miles an hour. Once we had cleared the city, Bryant announced that he could use a nap. He pulled down the top bunk and climbed up into it, grunting as he adjusted his body into the tight space. I sat down on the seat underneath, watching as the world rolled past outside. It was the first time I had just sat and looked out of a window for as long as I could remember. I had no laptop to work on, no files to read, no phone. I didn't even have a book to read. I had no easy way of checking on the news or anything happening in the outside world. In a way, I savored it. Of course, the circumstances were not of my choosing, but it felt like a gift, an opportunity to take stock, to plan my next move. I like to work alone. It's not just part of the sales pitch. I'm at my best when the only person I know I need to rely on is me. However, there are times when you need someone else to help out, and my current situation dictated that this was one of those times. I needed to get Bryant somewhere safe, and that somewhere had to be away from me. The question I kept asking myself was, was it right to endanger yet another person, one of the few people I cared about, even if I needed their help badly? I counted the people who had died already either because they could provide a lead to me or just because they'd gotten in the way. Martinez. Coop. The taxi driver at the airport. I didn't want to add another body to the list. The suburbs of Seattle were soon gone, and then we were out on what was once called the Great Northern Railway. We pushed east, across Washington State, passing through Edmonds and Everett as the sky became fully dark, reaching the long tunnel through the Cascade Range sometime after six o'clock. Once we'd passed through nearly three miles of darkness at the heart of the mountain range, we emerged into what seemed like another season again. Snow blanketed the ground, the rolling landscape of white seeming to emit a soft luminescence in the dark. I made up my mind. Our eventual destination was serendipitous. It seemed like fate was offering an opportunity. Bryant was still sound asleep in the bunk. I got up and opened the door. The passageway was empty in both directions. I checked I had the key and pulled the door shut, listening as the lock clicked into place automatically. 
The lounge car was five cars down. It was lined with windows that curved upward into the ceiling, where passengers could hang out during the day and take in the view. At the far end was a wall-mounted payphone, which, naturally, didn't take coins. There was a small shop, and I picked up sandwiches, two bottles of water, and some fruit, as well as a prepaid phone card. There were some paperback novels on sale, so I bought the latest Stephen King and a couple of other books with interesting covers. Staring out of the window was all very well, but I might as well take full advantage of this impromptu vacation. I used the phone card to dial a number from memory. I hoped the person I was calling hadn't changed her cell number. I smiled when the ringing stopped and a familiar voice answered. Hello? I cleared my throat and tried to sound as casual as possible. Hey, remember me? There was an uncertain pause, and I wondered again if I'd made a mistake. Blake? Special Agent Elaine Banner sounded surprised to hear my voice. I didn't know whether it was a good or a bad surprise. We hadn't spoken since I had helped her track down a prolific serial sniper named Caleb Wardell in Chicago. In the course of that job, I had saved Banner's daughter's life and Banner had saved mine. That's the kind of experience that builds mutual trust. Or so I hoped. How comfortable are you talking on this phone? It's secure, she said, though she and I knew that was relative. It was secure only as far as the balance of probability said nobody looking for me would be tapping a federal agent's phone hundreds of miles away. After a second, she added, But let me give you another number just in case. She read out what I guessed was the number of her personal phone, and I memorized that one as well before hanging up and redialing. A minute later, we were talking again. So what do you need? Same old banner. No time wasted finding out if this was a social call to catch up after all these months. I wasn't sure she'd have welcomed such a call from me in any case. I'm in a little trouble, I said. I quickly explained the key events of the last few hours. The photograph of Martinez's body that told me I was being hunted. Coop's murder down in Florida. The shooting at the airport. That explains it she said when I mentioned the airport. How do you mean? The SeaTac thing. Homeland Security have a lid on it tighter than two coats of paint. Lots of speculation. No IDs on the suspects. Now I know at least part of the reason. Let me guess. Need to know national security? All that kind of thing? That's about right. What the hell did you do, Blake? I mean... Homeland Security is after you? No, not Homeland Security. Somebody who can make a call to Homeland Security and has enough pull for some no-questions-asked cover from them. For the time being, at least. On second thought, I don't want to know. I mean, I can just about give you the benefit of the doubt that you're not a terrorist. Which is why you remain one of my very favorite FBI agents. Skip it, she said. Just tell me what you need. I did as requested, giving her the basics. No more information than she needed, and leaving out where exactly I was. Not because I thought Banner would tell anybody, but because it was in both our interests if she didn't know too much. Finally, I explained that I was carrying some excess baggage in the form of a 200-pound fugitive software developer and that sticking together wasn't likely to result in a pleasant outcome for either of us. She listened, not interrupting again after the airport part. When I finished, she was quiet for a moment. I wondered if she was thinking or just considering whether or not to hang up and forget she had ever met me. To tell the truth, I wouldn't have blamed her if she had. I hated to ask her for help, but with Coop dead... She was one of the only people in the world I trusted to be able to help us without putting herself in harm's way. And she was certainly the only one within easy reach of any of the stops on the Empire Builder route. 
bad luck seems to follow you around, Blake, she said at last. That it does. And then she started talking, and I realized she hadn't been considering not helping me. She had just been working everything out in her head. Okay, I have an off-the-book safe house we might be able to use. Let me make a few calls. It'll only be for a few days, Max. A few days is great. In a few days, I'll have made this go away, or I get the picture. How close are you right now? I turned and looked out the window at the dark landscape rushing past. We're taking the long way, I said. We'll be there in two days. Saturday, evening time. There was a pause, and I could tell she had already worked out how I was traveling. She had the grace not to mention it. That's good. Gives me some time to set things up quietly. What number do I call you on? You don't. This has to be our last conversation until Saturday night. All right. So you better tell me everything you need now. I laid out what we'd need to safely stash Bryant away, plus a few more requests that would entail Banner breaking a few more state and federal laws and putting her career in jeopardy. At the end of it, she simply said, Okay, let's say seven o'clock. You remember the last place we saw each other? Of course. I wasn't likely to forget for a couple of reasons. This was going to be a different kind of meeting altogether. See you then, she said, getting ready to hang up. I stopped her. Banner. Thank you. I'll see you on Saturday. The line went dead. I held the handset for a moment before replacing it. The odds were still stacked against me. Even if everything went to plan in Chicago, I still had a long way to go to get clear of this. A hell of a long way. But for the first time in 24 hours, it felt like I'd managed to wrestle back some small measure of control over my destiny. Five years ago, Kandahar, Afghanistan. It had been hotter the last time I had visited Kandahar. The daylight hours were still relatively warm, even in November, but the nights brought bone-chilling temperatures when it was clear, and sometimes snow. We had passed the wrecks of old Soviet-era armor on the way in. Tanks and BTR-60s, lying abandoned in the desert like a warning. It had been less than three weeks since I had received that unwanted call from Murphy, but it seemed like a lot longer. In truth, I'd been keeping too busy to think about Carol all that often. I hadn't even thought too much about my conversations with Senator Carlson, because so far, the job we had been assigned had reminded me of why I did what I did. It was one of those operations for which Winterlong was perfectly equipped, a bomb maker building his notoriety through a series of deadly coordinated attacks across Afghanistan and across the border into Pakistan. All the indications were that he had the skills and ruthlessness to escalate to worse, and potentially on U.S. soil. His nom de guerre translated as the wolf. The trouble was, that was virtually the only thing that was known about him. Whereas the U.S. military's other high-value targets had their images and vital statistics plastered over posters and printed on cards, carried by troops in the field. The wolf was an enigma. The local CIA operatives and others had been trying in vain to identify the wolf for the best part of 18 months. Along the way, some had speculated that there was no wolf, that it was a propaganda exercise, capitalizing on a general upswing in the professionalism and effectiveness of the Taliban insurgents. But the investigation teams clearing up after the many suicide attacks credited to the wolf, showed that there was a consistent signature, a hallmark to each of his atrocities. A bomb disposal tech who had defused one of his efforts in downtown Kabul had given him another name, the Michael Jordan of bombers. The guy was good. There was a seemingly inexhaustible supply of angry young men willing to drive his bombs into military checkpoints or crowded marketplaces, 
and it was difficult to do anything about that short term. But if the source of the lethally effective car and truck bombs could be traced and eliminated, it would save a lot of lives. But it had been 18 months, and nobody could find the wolf's lair. The best intelligence we had suggested his base of operations was Kandahar, in the south of the country. Cross-referencing the bombing locations had suggested that, as did an intercepted message that suggested the wolf made his home somewhere in the city. So as time went by with no results, the sense of frustration began to reach higher in the command pyramid until somebody made a call and six men were chosen. The assignment was standard. Go in with a small team and as much time as we need, build the intelligence, zero the target, put him out of action. Throwing manpower at the situation hadn't worked, so the powers that be had decreed that it was time for a subtler approach. There were two shooters. Dixon, 250 pounds of muscle, with a penchant for using knives, and Murphy, the oldest member of the team. Murphy was a little less physically imposing than Dixon, but more than made up for it in understated intelligence. There were two signals intelligence specialists. Martinez was tall, a little younger than the rest of us, and either aloof or just quiet. Collins was smaller and more wiry, with premature gray hair. Collins was in operational command, but by the nature of the setup, that didn't mean much from minute to minute. It just meant that he had final say when more than one potential course of action presented itself. That left myself and Ortega on front of house, as we called it, meaning we handled human, or human intelligence, the people part of the equation. Ortega was a little shorter than average, with a straight scar down the right side of his face and a mean streak a mile wide. I had worked with only two of the other five men before, and I didn't particularly like either of them. Murphy was a skilled operator and amiable enough, but I knew I could trust him about as far as I could spit him. As for Dixon, from our brief encounters, it was clear he was one of Dracacus's black hats. In a unit as secretive as this one, with every mission hermetically sealed, there was a whole lot I didn't know about the guy. But the rumors fit well with my impression of the man and with the file Carlson had shown me in New York. Something was broken inside him, and I was starting to think it was the character trait that made him most useful to our superiors. But we had a job to do, and until I figured out an exit strategy and a way to give Senator Carlson what he needed, this job was one that needed doing. After two weeks of painstaking work building on the existing intelligence, I had finally shaken loose a promising lead. The only problem was, I was required to follow up on it alone. Sneaking in someone else as backup simply wasn't worth the risk in terms of the mission. Moving around the city in daylight hours was never the preferred option, so I was still unsure that I'd made the right decision as Murphy dropped me off at the street corner my contact had named. I hadn't written the directions down, but I knew where to go from here. Keep your phone on, Murphy said quietly as I stepped out of the car onto the street. The omnipresent smell of dirty car fumes assaulted my nose. I'll see you back at the safe house at 1400. I nodded. I certainly hoped I would. The street corner was at the far end of a bazaar, beside a fruit store with its freshest and most colorful wares displayed outside to tempt passers-by. I walked to the farthest of these and pretended to examine a mountain of pomegranates, then turned and raised my eyes to the second floor of the building across the way. There was a row of small windows, each one above a door on the ground level. I counted along the row, three windows from the right-hand side of the building, there was a red vase in the center of the ledge. My eyes dropped down to the door immediately below. I patted the right-hand side of my chest gently to reassure myself that my Beretta M9 was still there and waited for a gap in the traffic to cross the road. The door was plain and unadorned, apart from a circular handle. 
I twisted the handle and found it unlocked as expected. It opened onto an unlit passageway, stone floor, stucco walls. I closed the door behind me, as per my detailed instructions, immediately glad to be off the busy street. There was another door at the far end that was ajar and let in just enough daylight to see by. There were two closed doors on the left-hand side of the corridor. I ignored them and made for the one that was open. As I got close to the sliver of daylight, I felt an unfamiliar tightness in my chest. I hesitated at the door and listened, not sure what I expected to hear. If I was walking into a trap, whoever was out there wouldn't be making any noise. Up until this moment, I had been sure enough that this offer was legit. I was happy with the risk-to-benefit balance. But now, standing in front of this door, I suddenly felt a great unease. I swallowed it down and forced my mind to work on a purely operational level. I drew my weapon, clicked the safety off, and held it down by my side. I held my breath and pushed the door open all the way. It gave onto a small, dusty courtyard. The sun was directly overhead. My eyes darted to cover the space, finding no one at ground level before catching movement above. I raised my gun, then quickly dropped it again when I saw a woman in a burqa hanging brightly colored laundry over the railing of her balcony. I turned my body to the side to conceal my gun as she glanced down and eyed me briefly with disinterest. I let out the breath and passed quickly across the center of the courtyard to the doorway on the opposite side. This one was just a gap in the wall. Bare, rusted hinges told me there had once been a door there, but not for a long time. Through that, there was another unlit corridor with an unlocked door at the end. This one let me out on a narrow alleyway. For the first time since I had left the car, the miasma of smog was blotted out by an even more pungent aroma. An irrigation ditch ran down the edge of the alley filled with raw sewage. I remembered the instructions. Turn left, then knock on the fourth door on the right. The fourth door was a slab of featureless steel with one unadorned keyhole and a narrow slit hatch. No handle. I knocked softly four times. The hatch opened after a second. Yes? I answered in Pashtu telling him I was a friend of Karim's. I had no idea who the hell Karim was, but it was what I'd been instructed to say. There was a pause. If this really was a trap, I was about to know about it. Do you have a gun? He asked in English. I hesitated, and then took the Beretta out again, holding it up slowly by the muzzle, taking care not to point anywhere near the hatch. Pass it through. The butt first. I did as I was asked, adding my own wordless condition by removing the magazine first. The gun was pulled inside, and then there was silence for almost a minute, long enough for me to start wondering if I'd been had. But then I heard the rattle of a big key turning in the lock, and the door swung silently outward on greased hinges. A tall, bearded Arab man stood before me, dressed in the standard dishdasha. He held a Colt 45 pointed squarely at my midsection. He looked me over, and then he jerked his head back. Come in. I entered a small, enclosed vestibule. I wasn't surprised when the tall man immediately gripped the back of my shirt and pushed me against the wall, frisking me for a second weapon. He didn't find any. I was traveling light. When he was satisfied, he lowered his gun and told me to go through into the building. I entered what I now realized was the back room of a store. DVDs in plastic wallets were stacked high on shelving units lining each wall, mostly pirated Hollywood blockbusters and porn. There were boxes of cheap phones, too. 
I would know where to come next time I needed a supply of burners. In the far corner was a small office desk with a laptop and one of those banker's lamps with the green shades. It seemed oddly out of place. Have a seat, my new friend said, indicating the swivel chair in front of the desk. I did as asked and looked up expectantly. He lit a cigarette, taking his time, and inhaled deeply. I am a mud, he said finally, offering his hand. I shook it. Call me Smith, I said. I saw his brown eyes flicker with amusement. We had picked equally anonymous pseudonyms. It was almost a sign of mutual respect. Neither of us wanted to insult the other's intelligence by even attempting to pretend we were using our real names. Each of us knew that Ahmad and Smith would cease to exist the moment this meeting was over. The money is okay? Ahmad asked, meaning, had I gotten it authorized? It is. All I need is the name. Who is the wolf? Better than that, my friend. I have a name and an address. I was intrigued. That would certainly make my job easier. He smirked. I don't think so. I don't understand. He handed me a slip of paper with some Arabic script at the top. Below it was an address translated to English, printed in small, neat capitals. The man you are looking for is currently at this house. He goes by the name Ajmal Awazir. I recognized the name and started to get an inkling of what the smirk a moment ago had meant. The only rich people in Afghanistan are the politicians. The reason for that is they get to skim from any money that comes into the country for infrastructure. If 20 million comes earmarked for building schools, each level of the establishment takes a cut along the way so that perhaps a few hundred thousand makes it to the school building program. In Kandahar, many of the top levels of that tree of corruption held the name Wazir. The Awazirs are hiding the wolf? He shook his head. Not hiding. He is one of them. And now you see why this was so expensive. He studied me, as though expecting me to challenge him on the information. Give me two hours. If this checks out, you get the bonus. Okay, he said after a moment, and handed me back my gun. A pleasure doing business with you. When you go back out there, turn right instead of left, and the alley will bring you out on Shafakana Sarak. Thank you. Good luck, Smith. I holstered my weapon then left the way I had come in. I took the right and emerged onto the bustling thoroughfare of Shafakana Sarak. I watched the people walking to and fro, as heedless of anything else as any Western pedestrians going about their business in the big city. I wondered how they could do that, when the risk of being suddenly blown to pieces was exponentially higher than in New York or London or Berlin, because of men like the wolf. If my target really was a member of the House of Al-Wazir, it explained why it had taken so much effort and money to get his location. The safe house was just under two miles away in the Zawar Shar area of the city, Old Kandahar. It wasn't hard to navigate through the back alleys by recalling the map in my head. As I walked, I returned to the other question that had been keeping me awake nights when the hard work of the mission took a break from distracting me. What the senator had said hadn't exactly surprised me. That was the worst thing about it. I had been wondering for the last couple of weeks whether Carlson's mole was with us on this mission, and if so, which of the other five he was. I almost didn't care. I wanted to do the job, go home, and disappear. Forget about Winterlong and Carlson. All of a sudden, the quiet building urge I'd had for the past few months to get out of this organization had become an imperative. 
Up until my meeting with the senator, it had been a job I'd enjoyed, been good at, and thought was worthwhile. We kept operations separate and secret out of necessity, because that was the way it had to be. But some of the rumors I had heard, some of the things I'd seen with my own eyes, had me calling everything into question. The senator's file had provided the other pieces of the puzzle. Why hadn't I quit before? For one thing, I knew deep down it wouldn't be as easy as that. For another, I didn't have anyone or anything giving me a compelling reason to quit. But that was the other thing that had changed in New York. Now there was someone. I realized at that moment that that was why I had suddenly felt so uneasy walking into that courtyard. Things were different now. And not just because of what the senator had said. Things were different because I had something to lose. Friday, January 8th. Chapter 29, Idaho. The motion of the train slowing roused me from a half-dream. From the bunk above me I could hear Bryant snoring softly. I looked out of the window and saw a single side platform and an old station building with a covered waiting area out front. The blue sign above the door to the station building said, Sand Point, Idaho. I checked my watch. It was 2.35 a.m., which meant we were still on schedule. I stared out at the platform. Aside from a Pepsi machine casting out its blue glow, there wasn't a lot to see. Nobody getting off, nobody getting on. The train pulled out, and I settled back in the seat, closing my eyes. It would be three hours until we stopped again, after we'd passed into Montana, and I looked forward to getting a couple hours of uninterrupted sleep. After twenty minutes, I gave up on that idea and sat up, gazing out the window as the freezing night passed by, thinking about what was behind and what was ahead. If we were lucky, all we had to do was stay put until Saturday and Chicago. Leaving Bryant behind in Seattle would have made some things easier, but it hadn't ever been an option. Winterlong would have found him, and as soon as they figured out he had no useful information, they would have killed him. If Banner could get Bryant to relative safety, it would be one less thing for me to worry about. But I would still have a long way to go from there. The people who were pursuing me knew that eventually I would have to go back home. The only question was how long it would take them to nail down the location of home. I thought about the precautions I had taken over the last five years and knew there were a few areas where they had been less than perfect. Inevitable compromises I'd had to make that could be exploited with the right information, the necessary skills, and a little luck. In truth, I knew I could have pulled off a perfect disappearance, if I had really wanted to. But that would have required a total withdrawal from the world. From day one, I had known I was never going to open a repair shop or man the pumps at a rural gas station. The obvious reason was that I needed an income to live off the grid in relative comfort, unless I wanted to go the mountain man route. But it was more than that. When you find something you're good at, it's not so easy to walk away from it. So the best part of a year on from what had happened in Afghanistan, I began to test the waters. I contacted people I knew of who could put me in touch with the right clients, people like Coop, who specialized in finding work in the private sector for people like me. Beyond assessing that I had the requisite skills and experience, he didn't ask about me and I didn't volunteer anything. That wouldn't have made me any different from the vast majority of his clients, former CIA and NSA and military intelligence types, whose employers might frown on their taking all of that expensive government training and putting it to uses that may or may not be approved of by Uncle Sam. For a while, I told myself that I was a needle in a haystack. In the second decade of the 21st century, the subterranean market for 
secondhand spies and special operators was booming like never before. I knew it would be impossible for me to work without leaving any trail at all, of course. But that trail would lead back to Carter Blake, not who I was before. And Carter Blake was a cipher, a dead end. I hadn't counted on my cover being blown by a run-in with the past. I tried to think about how I would find me. I knew that air travel was the big hole in my cover. I had had no choice but to fly unless I wanted to drive everywhere, which wasn't practical. The kind of jobs I was offered spanned the country. Florida one day, California the next. I had resisted the offers to work overseas so far so that I didn't need to worry about a fake passport. Because no one could tie the name Carter Blake to my previous life, I decided keeping the same ID for flying was within the realm of acceptable risk. If things got hot, I could discard the name and find another just as easily. What I didn't bet on was being nailed on national TV. My picture and my name broadcast across the country in association with a case in which Winterlong was already taking great interest because it concerned another of their former operatives, Dean Crozier, latterly known as the Samaritan. So now someone with the right skills and the necessary level of tenacity and access to data protection overrides could start to map the movements of Carter Blake over the past few years and begin to build up a pattern. I had made a point of varying the airports I used within reach of home. I had been careful, but I hadn't been obsessively careful. I realize now that I should have dropped the Blake identity after Los Angeles, laid low for a while. But I had been complacent, relying on the fact I had leverage, or thought I did. I thought I would see them coming. In the end, it probably wouldn't have made any difference. It would have been closing the stable door after the horse had bolted. Again, I wondered what had changed. I had taken steps to make sure I was a hard man to track down, but my strongest precaution was my deterrent, the black book. Dracacus knew if he made a move on me and screwed it up, it would be the end for him. For some reason, whoever had succeeded him had decided the risk of leaving me in the game outweighed the risk of eliminating me. But the reason they were coming for me was academic when it came down to it. The stalemate of the past few years was over. The personal cold war between me and Winterlong had burst into life, and the next move had to be mine. Chapter 30. Seattle. The temporary op center in the Marriott had been a hive of activity all night, but Starr could sense the frustration building in the room as dawn began to break with no new lead since the airport. Where the hell were they? It seemed as though Carter Blake and Scott Bryant had dropped off the face of the earth after slipping the noose at SeaTac. Stark wondered what Blake had decided to do, stay put or get out. After hours of monitoring the police search and chasing up fruitless leads throughout the city, his hunch was that it had to be the latter. Seattle obviously wasn't home turf for Blake. He had only been there in pursuit of this Bryant guy. In the absence of any better ideas, catching Bryant was their strongest lead for the moment. Blake would probably part company with him as soon as possible, and he would be easy enough to run down. He might be able to give them some idea of where Blake was headed. He surveyed the other three men in the room, Ortega and Usher, plus a relatively new addition to the team named Travers, who was monitoring police communications and keeping in touch with the four men they had around the city. For the moment, it felt like he and the others were spinning their wheels. Stark snapped out of his thoughts as he saw Travers stop whatever he was doing on the laptop and put a finger to the earpiece of his headset. He listened intently, nodding when he was sure of the message. They found the taxi. Stark crossed the room and stood next to him expectantly. The police found it? Yeah, it's coming through over the scanner. Finally. Where the hell did they dump it? 
they're saying... Travers called up a satellite shot on the laptop screen and indicated a spot on the screen. Here, about four miles from SeaTac. It was concealed. No sign of the suspects. Stark shook his head. That's just off the damn freeway. How the hell did they miss it for this long? You know how it is. A lot of ground to cover, Travers said. No way they're still in the city now, Ortega said. Blake's in the wind. Ortega had an old white scar down the right-hand side of his face. The scar wasn't so noticeable when his features were composed, but it distorted his expressions a little when he smiled or frowned, as he was doing just now. Travers looked up from the screen, looking at each of the two older men in turn as though expecting a solution. So, what do we do now? Wait for another shot, Adam? Stark sighed. That's going to be difficult. We tracked him down once, Ortega reminded him. We used a one-time-only tactic. We'd been on to Cooper for weeks, waiting for the right time. We don't get to do that again for obvious reasons. We had one chance at the airport. We could have done it quietly, tailed him until he was cornered, but Usher had to start shooting. Usher, who had kept quiet until now, chose this moment to speak. I told you, he said quietly, I had no choice. Really? Stark said, turning to look at him. All he was doing was getting in a cab. We could have dealt with that differently, is all I'm saying. We could have tailed him. We could have waited and got a drop-off address from the cab company. But instead, we were left behind explaining a dead civilian to Deputy Dog while Blake left us in his dust. He's right, Ortega said. Blake was careful before. Now he's going to be invisible. We had precious little on him as it was. A name, an M.O., and for a few hours a cell number. Now the phone's gone and he'll ditch the name, too. He's completely off the grid. We don't have any fucking clue where he could be going. Stark slapped his palm down on the desk in front of Travers in frustration. He walked over to the wall where they'd hung the map of the city, finding the spot where the taxi had been dumped and placing it in the context of the whole area. Okay, let's go back over it. At least now we know he didn't drive out of the city, at least not right away, and we know where he was at about one o'clock yesterday afternoon. Cops are searching the vicinity, but if he's smart, he caught himself and gave a wry smile, which we know he is, he'll have gotten out of there immediately. He stood back and looked at the spot on the map, letting his focus creep out to the surrounding geography. There's a stop for the light rail airport link close by. That would take him right back into the center of town. Doesn't mean he used it, Ortega said. Doesn't mean anything at all, Stark said. But he was off guard, improvising. It's likely he would go with the flow. I think he headed back into the city, and there's nothing else around there. We still don't know if he's holed up somewhere or if he managed to get out of town. He turned away from the map and looked at Travers. Find out if the light rail has cameras. Travers nodded and looked down at his laptop. Ortega joined Stark at the map, glancing in turn at the circled locations where they'd spread their resources. The air was closed to Blake, and he didn't have a car. He couldn't easily procure one either, not without being unsure of whether he'd just tagged himself once again. Rental was out, and either stealing or buying one cash would leave another person with the knowledge of his mode of transport, if the link was made. That left public transportation, assuming he didn't decide to walk or hitchhike. Because of Seattle's isthmus-like geography, most of the transportation routes in the metropolitan area passed through the heart of the city. Taking the highways out of the equation, that left bus, rail, and ferry. With no trace of Blake since the airport until now, there had been too many options to narrow down in too long a time period with a little luck. That was about to change.
Chapter 31. New York City. After nearly 20 straight hours of dead ends, Faraday received the latest update from Seattle with cautious optimism. Her first instinct had been to help the information along a little by releasing Blake's picture to the FBI with strict orders not to share with the media. They would be able to call on the superior manpower of the Bureau in locating their target after negotiating that it would be them who made the final engagement, naturally. But then Murphy had asked to see her in private, away from the noise and bustle of the ops room, and much to Faraday's chagrin, he had a very good reason for not risking giving the FBI some help. Why didn't you tell me about this before? Murphy was standing by the floor-to-ceiling window, looking out over the city. The late morning sky was dark, heavy with clouds. Faraday stayed on her feet, too, sitting back against the edge of her desk. You're right, he said. I should have told you. I just thought that I didn't need to know, Faraday finished for him. Is that what you thought? He didn't respond to that, but his lack of a response was confirmation enough. Eventually, he said simply, I'm sorry, okay? I thought we could handle it quietly. Join the club. When this is done, we're going to have a talk about some of the men, particularly Usher. He nodded, taking the scolding like a contrite student. It made Faraday dislike him all the more. So what exactly does this son of a bitch have on us, Murphy? Specifically? He shook his head. I can't tell you that because I don't know. Nobody really knows why Blake killed the senator, but we think it was a deal gone wrong. Carlson wanted dirt on winter. Murphy stopped dead as he saw the look on her face. He knew full well how much she hated the way some of them still use that old code name. Apart from anything else, it was a flagrantly unnecessary security risk. Code names changed for a reason. Carlson wanted inside information on the organization, he continued, using Faraday's preferred nomenclature. Blake liberated some potentially damaging information. A black book from an operation in Kandahar. A black book. Now she understood. That could be damaging indeed. Murphy saw the recognition in her eyes and continued. He was going to sell it to the senator. Something went wrong and Mr. and Mrs. Carlson wound up on a slab. And we wound up with a hell of a cleanup job. You think Usher shooting up the airport was bad? Walk in the park. She ignored that. The previous 24 hours had not felt like any walk in the park. So what's our potential exposure? Murphy shrugged again. I don't know any more than you know, he said. But I know Dracacus was worried. And I don't think we want to risk the feds finding out before we do. He was holding something back, Faraday thought. Or perhaps... She was just wired to suspect that by this point. Maybe he was on the level this time. So, what do you suggest? Keep them in the dark and hope we find Blake before he has a chance to do some damage? Murphy nodded. Exactly. And how do we know he hasn't sent a copy to his lawyer or his favorite aunt? Instructions to release it if anything happens to him. Those drives are protected by sunset scripts. Every time you view the data, it gets closer to erasing. Makes it very difficult to copy, and I don't know if he could trust anyone to do the job. It's useful as a deterrent, that's all. I don't think he's ever thought about leaking it, because it wouldn't do him any good. I hope you're right. Murphy turned away from the window and looked at her. She had a bad feeling about what he was about to say, and she was proved correct. I'm going out there. Absolutely not. Look, Faraday, Stark and the others are making progress. I hope they'll get a line on where he went soon, but if anybody can track this bastard down, it's me. I worked with him. I know how he thinks. Faraday circled around her desk and sat down in her chair. 
She looked him up and down appraisingly. You scored 275 on your last PFT, as I recall, Murphy. Are you sure you're still cut out for the field? He moved across the room and put both hands on the desk, flashing one of his cocky quarterback smirks at her. Minimum is 260. Faraday considered. Whether she liked it or not, Murphy had a point. He did know Blake, and perhaps someone closer to the action could keep a tighter rein on Usher. All right, she said finally. Murphy nodded and straightened up. Faraday spoke as he was turning to leave. This isn't kill or capture anymore, she said. Is it? Murphy was all business again. Blake isn't going to be taken alive. I have no doubt. You'll make sure of that. Chapter 32 North Dakota We kept to the roomette for the most part as the train wound its way east, crossing through Idaho and then into Montana during the night. I had had a restless sleep partly due to the compactness of the accommodation and partly due to the fact I had been rousing myself every hour or two to watch the platform at each stop. It was dark again by the time we crossed into North Dakota, and an announcement over the train speakers reminded me to wind my watch forward to central time. By the evening, we had both begun to succumb to cabin fever. I read the books I had bought and thought a little bit more about what we would do when we reached Chicago. Bryant had napped frequently and, just as frequently, complained about the confinement. I had given in around five o'clock and let him walk the length of the train and back. Twelve cars plus two locomotives at either end. It had killed half an hour. Neither of us had talked much about the reality of our situation. It was as though we were in a temporary bubble of relative security, and neither of us wanted to burst it. As the clock ticked on and the miles slipped away, I began to feel like we were getting closer to safety. I reminded myself that there was a long way to go yet. I left the room at a little after 9 p.m. to buy us dinner, our fifth pre-packed sandwich feast of the journey. I bought another book and a deck of cards, deciding it would be something to break the monotony. As I was paying, I felt the train begin to slow on the approach to the next station. I took the sandwiches and moved across to the windows at the platform side of the lounge car. The snow was no longer falling, but it looked pretty inhospitable out there. The station signs told me we were in Minot, North Dakota. I watched the platform as it rolled by at a gradually declining speed. I saw a handful of passengers waiting patiently, a young backpacking couple, a group of older people, a family with a little girl clutching her mother's hand, and a baby strapped to the father's chest in a baby bjorn. Everybody in warm clothes, packed for a trip. Nothing out of the ordinary, once again. When I got back to the roomette, Bryant took me up on the suggestion of a couple of hands of poker. We didn't have any chips, of course, or indeed much in the way of cash, so we played using a pile of individual sugar portions I'd liberated from the lounge car. It didn't take long for me to be glad we weren't playing for real money, as the pile of individually wrapped sugar on Bryant's side of the table began to grow. I'm breaking one of my rules here, I said. What's that? Bryant asked, looking puzzled. Never take on an expert in his field. Bryant looked like he wanted to laugh out loud for a second, but then he composed his features and shook his head. Not quite an expert. In fact, that's the reason I'm here. I didn't say anything to that as I swept the cards up from the table and tapped them into shape. I remembered speaking to Bryant's wife back in California. You never really know anyone. I decided not to press him on it. Bryant stood up to stretch his legs. He put a hand on the edge of the top bunk and ducked his head to look through the window. There was nothing to see but darkness and snow. The last stop, the one after Minot, had been rugby. 
In another few hours and another few stops, we would cross into Minnesota. Bryant grew tired of watching the darkness go by and turned back. I'm going for a walk, he said. I shook my head. You already had a walk. I told you, we stay put unless absolutely necessary. I thought you said the police didn't release our names or our pictures yet. Who's going to recognize us? I told you, the police don't have anything to do with it, I corrected. The people who want me have suppressed our names and pictures. That's only because they don't want to involve anyone else unless they absolutely have to. If they get desperate, they might just decide to release them, and all bets are off. Bryant sat down on one of the seats. Then he changed his mind and got up. He looked like he wanted to pace. The problem was, the spatial dimensions of the room restricted him to about one and a half paces max. You know what, Blake? I squared the cards and slid them back into the pack. Then I looked up at him. What? This is fucking bullshit! He slammed a fist off the door for emphasis. Calm down. I will not calm down! All I wanted was a new start. Okay, I stole something that didn't belong to me. Sue me. Put me in fucking jail, okay? I didn't sign up for this. I don't deserve to be shot at and dragged halfway across the goddamn country before probably having to sleep with one eye open the rest of my life because the guy they sent to get me is public enemy number one, okay? I looked up at him, keeping my expression impassive. This had been building since the day before, ever since the immediate adrenaline rush of the chase had begun to subside. I knew he needed to get it out of his system. What do you want from me? I said after a moment. An apology? Yes! Yes, I want an apology. This is your fault, Blake, all of it. I opened my hands and shrugged. All right? I'm sorry. That's it? What more do you want? I'm sorry you're involved in this, and I'm doing my best to get you uninvolved. Believe me, I didn't choose this situation either. What more do I want? How about telling me exactly who's after us? It's better. Better you don't know. Save it. I want to know who's going to kill me. I have a right to know. It was my turn to look out of the window at the darkness. All being well, we had another 800 miles and 17 hours together in this tiny cell. I know I didn't want to endure another 17 hours with Bryant in this kind of mood, so I supposed a little candor was worth the price. I hadn't given him any of the details, partly out of a lifelong habit of never giving anybody any more than the minimum necessary information, and partly because it wouldn't do him any good. It might make him even more afraid. But now I was reconsidering. For one thing, he was right. He did deserve an explanation for why his life was suddenly in danger. For another, perhaps a little scare was good. If he was more scared, he'd be more careful. All right, I said at last. I guess we have some time to kill. Chapter 33 Seattle Got him! The jubilation in Travers's voice was palpable. Stark remained cautious. It had been a long day, piggybacking on the police and FBI investigations, relying on the key information they had withheld to ensure those other agencies couldn't make a breakthrough before them. Others had come to the same conclusion as Stark, following the discovery of the taxicab at the business park. The whole area had been locked down and searched carefully, but too much time had elapsed for anyone to hold out much hope of finding the airport fugitives in the immediate area. They looked at the proximity to the light rail and the absence of any other nearby travel options or reports of carjackings and investigated the possibility that one or both of the suspects might have taken that option to head back into the city. Travers 
had beaten the FBI to the punch in calling Sound Transit the light rail operator. Yes, they did operate CCTV on their services for passenger and driver security, and yes, they were only too happy to help the authorities with their investigation into the shooting at the airport. Was it some sort of terrorist thing? Travers gave the standard noncommittal responses and barely had to pretend to be from a government department for the guy to enthusiastically agree to send all video files from all their services between 12 noon and 2. Twenty minutes later, their contacts said the feds had made the same request, except that they asked for all footage from the entire day. Typical FBI. Thorough to the point of procrastination. The compressed video was sent within a half hour. Stark instructed Travers to begin by focusing on city-bound services between 12.30 and 2. There was a service every ten minutes during the day which gave them nine videos to look at. It didn't take long for them to find Blake and Bryant getting on the train at 13.08. They both kept their faces down, but they were easy to spot, given the fact there were hardly any other passengers. The pair separated and took different seats during the journey before alighting at University Street. It would be almost two hours before the FBI video analysts matched up the two men on the 1308 footage with the suspects from the airport. From there, it had been tougher. It was difficult to move through a major city without leaving a trace on camera, but finding their two targets would take coordination and manpower that they didn't have. It would take the FBI time to do the donkey work to access all of the street cameras and store security cams and anything else they could find. As Stark saw it, there were two options. Wait for the feds to piece together Blake's next movements or try to hurry things along. He had contacted Faraday, asked for the latter. He wanted to release Blake's name and picture and give their worker bees something more to go on. Although Stark didn't say it out loud, he questioned why this had not been done already. The answer had come back after a short interval, and it was in the negative. There was too much of a risk that Blake would be arrested before they got a clear shot at him. Reluctantly, Stark backed off. It was a fine balance. They needed to help the FBI just enough, but make sure they didn't get too close to finding Blake by themselves. So they tried to work a step or two ahead. The feds were just following the trail of two unknown suspects. They lacked the crucial insight into who Blake was, where he might go. There were three major transport hubs within easy walking distance of the stop at University Street. Security footage from there might let them cut to the chase. But now, after hours of mind-numbing tedium, it sounded like Travers had made a breakthrough. When Stark saw the close-up of Scott Bryant's face, he knew that the excitement in Travers's voice had been earned. This is King Street? he asked. You couldn't see much in the background, but they had spent so many hours looking at footage that they had become experts in identifying locations in downtown Seattle. King Street, Travers confirmed. He had been working through the multitude of video feeds from King Street Station for the past couple of hours. It was laborious work because there were so many. Platform-facing, waiting areas, ticket desks. One of the cams had a shelf that jutted frustratingly into the frame, meaning that if a customer stood a little way back from the desk, his face was obscured. When they had noticed that, they'd groaned. If Blake had picked this departure point, he would likely have used that one. But it looked as though his traveling partner hadn't been so careful. Finally, they had nailed down Blake and Bryant's exit route from Seattle. Aboard a train out of King Street. But going where? Good job! Stark said, his eyes moving to the timestamp in the corner of the screen. Now let's find out which train they took. Five years ago, Kandahar, Afghanistan. I looked up as Collins said my name. 
You didn't give up comic books when you hit puberty? I looked back down at the Batman trade paperback in my hands. I like to read in my downtime, and comic books are one of the English language imports you can still usually get in most places around the world. I was reasonably sure Collins had never read a book of any kind. I glanced at Dixon, who was sitting across the main room of the safe house, sharpening one of his knives. The end of his tongue was jutting out from between his teeth in concentration. What can I say? The high culture in this place intimidates me. Collins followed my glance and shrugged, conceding the point. Come on over. Martinez has an update. I tossed the Batman book aside and got to my feet. The safe house was two rooms on the second floor of a derelict building in the district of the city called Zoarshar. It was Spartan accommodation. Gray walls, concrete floors, rusty bars on the glassless windows. An interpreter had found six thin mattresses and some multicolored blankets, which helped in the freezing nights. The sleeping area was the smaller of the two rooms, and we kept our equipment and computers in the other. We hung blankets across the windows by day, but spears of sunlight made their way in through the gaps, making the dust motes shine in the air. The walls were covered with old graffiti in black spray paint, all in Arabic. One of the walls functioned as a bulletin board, where we had pinned maps and visuals relating to the mission. There was a new picture in the dead center, a smiling headshot of our target, Ajmal al-Wazir, scion of Kandahar's first political family, the fortunate son. Martinez had his tech nest set up in the corner of the second room. Over the three days since we had identified the wolf, I had occasionally attempted conversation with him as he led the work on developing that intelligence. I had concluded that he liked to keep himself to himself. That was fine by me and in fact, it would have been nice if a couple of the others had followed his example. Martinez was examining satellite images of an urban location that I assumed was somewhere in Kandahar on one of his two screens. Murphy, Collins, Ortega, and I were arranged around him as he translated the bird's-eye view into identifiable locations. The only one who showed no interest whatsoever was Dixon. He remained on the other end of the room with his back to the wall, still sharpening the hunting knife. Everybody had something, I reflected. I read comic books, Collins and Murphy played cards, and Dixon sharpened his knife collection. In our line of work, you need a certain appreciation for the tools of the trade. But in my book, an out-and-out -out fetish for blades is never a promising character trait. As the rest of us watched Martinez's screen, the metal on metal would issue a distracting shing noise every few seconds. You could just about block it out after a while. How sure are you about this intel? Martinez asked, turning to direct the question at me. When are we ever sure? I said. But I think so, yeah. His response was a frown. I was afraid of that. If he's here, then we're in trouble. It's a fucking fortress. Twelve foot high walls, barbed wire, guards around the clock. Cops seem to be on the payroll, too. There's a drive-by once an hour. I had expected as much. As soon as I had discovered the wolf was a member of one of Afghanistan's richest families, I had known we were up against difficult odds. It was like discovering you needed to make a citizen's arrest on Tom Cruise against the wishes of the police. We'd need a battalion to attack this place, Martinez confirmed. That's the bad news. It was a rhetorical suggestion. Politically, there was no way that was going to happen. We would have to find some way to get to the wolf quietly. So there's good news, I asked. If you're right about this, I think he's working off-site. 
What do you mean, working? Collins asked. Martinez indicated the screen. Every morning, two cars leave the south gate of the compound. He brought up a closer image with a timestamp of yesterday at 8 o'clock local time. It showed two jeeps passing through the gate. He zoomed out of the first screen and traced a line across the city with his finger before zooming back in. They drive two miles southwest to this neighborhood. The close-up showed the Katali Mercha area. I nodded. It was a journey of riches to rags. Kandahar's most exclusive neighborhood, Shari Na, or New City, to a virtual slum built along the trail leading out of Kandahar City proper to the upper Argandab Valley. Martinez found the right spot on his zoom and framed it so we could see a row of black squares in among what looked like a residential street. What are those? I asked, and then it came to me before Martinez could answer. Garages? Yes. The two jeeps park around the back, and he goes in. He spends hours a day there. They post a guard out front, one at the back, probably more in the jeeps. Heatsig? Murphy asked. Thermal imaging shows some major heat in whichever garage he's working. I think he's putting together a goddamn fleet. I counted the row of garages. So, if he has a vehicle in every one, six car bombs? If this is the only location, six minimum. Looks like he's planning another coordinated attack. If we were right, this would be the biggest attack yet. How long until he's ready? Could be a week. Could be tomorrow. We've only had eyes on him since you got the tip off. So we have to move on this, I said, turning to Collins. He watched the screen for another couple of seconds and nodded. We do. Okay. Let's hear some pitches. First off, Murphy said, we have to take him at the garages. Not even up for debate. The house is too secure, plus we have to deal with the car bombs. Collins turned to direct his voice at Dixon, irritated. Dixon, get off your ass and get over here. Dixon didn't move, but put his knife back in its sheath and looked up at Collins as a partial concession to his notional position of authority. Tell me how long you need to put six V-beads out of commission. Dixon rolled his eyes at the clumsy acronym, and for the very first time, I empathized with him. Vehicle-borne, improvised, explosive device. Why well, use two words where five will do? He thought about it for a moment. Easiest way is don't. Just set them to blow. No more car bomb. No more neighborhood, Martinez cut in. This spot's right in the middle of the civilian population. Fucker knows what he's doing. Dixon shrugged almost imperceptibly, kept looking at Collins. Man has a point, Ortega said. Wasn't sure if he was talking about Dixon or Martinez. There was a tense silence. Martinez was looking at Dixon in disbelief. Collins had a neutral expression as though he was giving the pitch due consideration. Murphy was hanging back for once, watching the others to see where we would fall on Dixon's suggestion. It was simple. It had that much going for it. Looked at objectively, it was the plan that stood the greatest chance of success. It was also a suggestion that could only be cooked up and executed by a full-fledged psychopath. No fucking way, I said. Forget it. Ortega stood up, looked at me, then over at Dixon, who was sitting back against the wall, the hint of a smile on his lips. Whether it was in contemplation of the oncoming mayhem he was about to create, or the confrontation he had sparked, I didn't know. Perhaps it was both. Dixon is right. We go in at night, take out any guards, then rig the whole thing to blow up in the big bad wolf's face. It's clean. I couldn't help myself. 
clean? You think blowing up a bunch of families is clean? You think you can get away with that? Collins was listening to us both, his expression unreadable. Technically, there'll be nothing to get away with. Ajmal Awazir has to be a deniable assassination. You've been here long enough to know the score. Ortega was warming to the fight now. It's better. We do it this way. No one even knows Wazir was clipped. It looks like an accident. Bomb makers working someplace he shouldn't be. There's an accident, and he takes out himself and a few of the locals. Boo-hoo. Maybe they'll be more careful who they let set up shop in the neighborhood after this. It sends a message. Martinez was shaking his head. I don't know, man. We can do this another way. Clean. Damn right we can do it another way, I said. Ortega, you know there's a term for people who deliberately kill civilians to send a message, right? Ortega's scarred face went through a few contortions of disbelief while he came up with a response to that. Fuck you, was his considered rebuttal. Collins, you didn't tell me we had a fucking Yoko Ono on the team. I ignored him and addressed Collins. We stake the place out, let him get inside, and then take out the guards and the wolf. We don't even need to decommission the car bombs. Kandahar's finest may not be a shining international example of law enforcement, but they're going to notice a firefight first thing in the morning. More risk this way, Colin said, his eyes pointedly sweeping around the room to take in the five of us. You know that. More certainty this way, I countered. What if it isn't the wolf who shows up? We'll never get another shot at him if we don't make sure. Collins thought about it. He looked at Ortega, who was rolling his eyes at my suggestion. Then he looked over at Dixon. Dixon was watching us all with amusement. I think it was his grin that made Collins' mind up. Okay. No pyro this time. Ortega walked away from the screens in disgust. Martinez and I shared a relieved glance. Murphy nodded as though either plan sounded okay to him. Dixon shrugged and took his knife out again, keeping the amused look on his face. We'll do it your way, Colin said. Don't make me regret it. Chapter 34 North Dakota Bryant was tired and he was scared. After a day and a half in this cramped box rolling east at a leisurely pace, he was also frustrated. It felt like being confined to a mobile death row cell. He thought about Jasmine and Alyssa again. If only he had dismissed the stupid idea of stealing me time, he wouldn't be here, wondering if he was ever going to see or even speak to them again. But the more he thought about it, he knew that was only the last straw. There were many if-onlys in the chain, before he had made that final disastrous decision. And now, Carter Blake was about to tell Bryant why they were being hunted. He doubted the explanation would do much to lift his spirits. He watched as Blake considered what he was going to say next. He didn't speak for a long minute, just looked down at his hands, deep in thought. Bryant began to wonder if he'd changed his mind, but then he lifted his head and spoke. It's called Winterlong. Excuse me? The organization that's taken an interest in me. The one I used to work for. Actually, that's not quite accurate. Winterlong was a short-life code name that stuck. They prefer not to call themselves anything. I knew it, Bryant said. CIA, huh? He had guessed as much both from the skills Blake seemed to possess and the fact that their pursuers seemed to believe they could operate with absolute impunity. Blake shook his head, as though correcting a slow student. No, it was... is actually a small, 
Entirely self-contained operation, absolutely classified. We specialized in the jobs nobody else could do, either because they required our unique approach or because they were too politically sensitive. Which means the dirty jobs. Sometimes, Blake agreed. We were separate from everything else, but we could call on mediated support when necessary. As in some CIA operative would get a phone call telling them to cooperate, or an air base in Kabul would be told to get ready for an unscheduled takeoff. No questions asked. No questions asked was basically the mantra. So, you were like a secret SEAL team? No, it was the whole package. Signals, asset handling, all the stuff the CIA usually does combined with strike capability. They dropped us into a hot zone with instructions of what they wanted done, and then they let us get on with it. We got established wherever it was, set up our own infrastructure. We had signals guys, human intelligence guys, shooters. For those types of jobs, that's all you need. From the moment we touched down, we went dark. We completed the mission, and we did it our way. And what was your involvement? I did pretty much what I do now. I was a tracker. I found hard-to-find targets. I located new assets. I found out how to get close to people with 19 layers of personal security. And then you did what with them? It depended on who it was and what the mission was. Bryant smiled sarcastically. Sure it did. You were a hit squad. You kill any world leaders I might have heard of? It wasn't that glamorous, Bryant. Like I said, we weren't there for the noticeable stuff. We were there for the behind-the-scenes work that keeps everything on the level. You sound like you're okay with this stuff. Blake seemed to stop and consider for a second. Like he had fallen into an old trap of justifying the actions of these people, even though it was likely they were about to end his life. After a minute, he shrugged. Do you like sausages? I know, I know, Bryant said. Don't go see them being made. In his time with Blake, he had gone through a whole range of reactions to the man. First fear, then resentment, then a grudging respect. Eventually, he had begun to realize that he liked the guy a little, despite himself. But right now, all of those emotions were sidelined. Right now, all he felt was anger. The man in front of him was no different from the men who had shot at them at the airport, who had killed that driver. Just like them, Blake had taken the money and he hadn't asked questions. Or not the right ones, at any rate. Bryant's voice took on a harder edge. And to his surprise, he found himself not caring about the potential repercussions. That doesn't answer my question. Blake looked taken aback for a second, and then his gaze hardened. Do you know what kind of people I had to find? Bomb makers, drug kingpins, Al-Qaeda cells, people the world was absolutely better off without. Maybe you don't have to think about all of that nasty stuff in your cozy little Silicon Valley womb but somebody has to deal with it. Bryant was undeterred. You're telling me you never had to do anything you weren't okay with? Who are you trying to convince, man? Me or you? That seemed to bring Blake up short, because he stopped what he was about to say and looked down at his hands again. Then he sighed and continued speaking without looking up. Toward the end of my tenure, I started to get uncomfortable with some aspects of our work. That's why I left, and that's why I work for myself now. So what made you leave? Blake gave a little smirk as though that was a long story and stood up, stretching his arms to kill a cramp. He put a hand on the edge of the upper berth and leaned against it as he looked out of the window of the train. A lot of reasons and one pretty big one. What happened? The good little soldier started thinking for himself? 
If he noticed the barb, he gave no indication. The opposite, actually. I didn't change. Their opinion of me did. How so? They brought me in because I filled a skills gap, but perhaps I wasn't ever a perfect fit. I think every member of the team went through a kind of unofficial probation. I lasted as long as I did because I got results, but I always felt like I was being kept out of the inner circle. Turns out I was right. Because it wasn't just about the skills. It was about being willing to do what it took, no matter what. And you weren't willing? Sure, within my own limits. Turned out my limits were incompatible with the team. I was approached by someone powerful, someone who made me believe I could help to make things right. But he was wrong, and it cost him his life. He sat back down opposite Bryant. Neither of them spoke for a while. Bryant watched the other man, absorbing what he'd said, while Blake stared out of the window. There was nothing to see out there in the night, but Bryant had a feeling the other man wasn't thinking about here or now. Finally, Bryant prompted him to continue. What did you do? I acquired some information that they were eager to avoid falling into the public domain. Evidence? He nodded. And then a smile suddenly appeared on his lips, like he had thought of an amusing joke. He reached into his pocket and removed the flash drive he'd taken from Bryant earlier, the one that held the MeTime software. He examined it in the palm of his hand and looked up at Bryant. Incredible, isn't it? What you can find on one of these? Bryant said nothing, waiting for him to continue. Every operational commander received a full mission spec and orders on one of these. Couldn't be done any other way, since we couldn't guarantee secure internet access. It was called the Black Book. It was the Bible. Everything we did, who did what to whom, when, where, and on whose orders. It was updated during the mission with the raw notes for after-action reports. Operational commanders had orders to destroy the book if necessary. It had a fail-safe, built-in software that wiped the data clean if you tried to access it more than a predetermined number of times. Bryant nodded, realizing that finally here was something that fell within his own area of expertise. A sunset script, he said. Smart. Not impossible to get around. I never thought I would have to, Blake said. I just needed the threat. I used it to keep them off my back, and it worked. For a while. Until now? Until now. So what changed? The guy I made the deal with is gone. I think there were people who never wanted me running around. They wanted to finish the job. Only I did a good job of hiding from them for years, right up until last year. The case I was working brought me into contact with them. And I guess somebody decided it was time to tie up this loose end. What about the flash drive? The black book? Do you still have it? Of course I still have it. I keep it someplace safe. Bryant indicated the dark landscape passing by them out of the window. Some place east of here, I take it. And you need to get to the drive before they get to you. Again, Blake didn't respond right away. He looked like he was thinking something through, making a calculation. Listen, he said after a minute. There's a good chance I may not be able to get there before they catch up with me. If you make it out, you might need to know this. I have a place in upstate New York. It's an old farmhouse miles away from anywhere. Bryant was confused. If one of them was going to make it out of this, his money was firmly on Blake. He continued. There's a concealed vault in the basement. That's where I keep everything important. It's a bookcase. 
The vault opens when you pull two particular books in sequence. The Great Gatsby, and then All the President's Men. Why are you telling me this? Don't you... I'm not telling you everything, not yet. But when we get to Chicago, I'll give my friend the name of the place. Between the two of you, you'll be able to find it. There was a hollow look in Blake's eyes that Bryant knew was more than just fatigue. From the experience of the last day and a half, he understood two things. Blake knew how to handle himself, and he was pretty adept at evaluating any given situation. If Blake was this worried that he wouldn't make it out of this alive, it did not bode well. Bryant said, Why didn't you make a backup? Give it to somebody you trusted. It was copy-restricted. I'm sure you can get around that, too, but the data would have wiped on another view. And there was another guy. Bryant took a moment to understand the significance of the word was. Oh. What happened to him? He was found executed in Russia four weeks ago. They sent me a picture. Partly to threaten me, partly as a means of finding me. In the pit of his stomach, Bryant felt a growing nausea that had nothing to do with the motion of the train. He reached up and massaged his forehead with the fingers of both hands. Fuck. We're dead, aren't we? We're still breathing right now, Blake said. But for how long? You just told me these people specialize in hunting down fugitives and Al-Qaeda and whatever. You think I'm going to be a problem? We have an advantage. I know what we're up against. I was one of them. Can you get me out of this? I think so. My friend in Chicago will keep you out of harm's way while this goes down. What makes you think he'll be able to hide me from them? Blake smiled. Two reasons. One, she's good. Two, I'm going to try to give them enough to worry about that they forget all about you. Chapter 35 Your turn, I said. Bryant shrugged. You already know everything about me. Not true. I dug up enough to track you down. I don't know anything else about you. I almost got you killed. Least I can do is take an interest in how you got yourself in the position for that to happen. He shrugged. Not much to tell. I live alone. Worked for Manola for a year and a half. I was bored. I saw an opportunity and I took it. Bet you regret it now. You can say that again. Why did you do it? I already told you. The money. I shook my head. Nobody does anything for the money. What the hell are you talking about, Blake? Do you work for free? On this job? Starting to look that way. I had barely given Stafford a second thought since Seattle. Idly, I wondered how many increasingly pissed-off messages had built up on my voicemail. I'm serious. Everybody wants to get paid. Me, you, everybody. Money's just a means to an end, I said. What did you really want? He sat back and looked out the window again. It was snowing again. The landscape around us was an ocean of white in the dark. I wanted my life back, he said quietly. He let that sit for a while, and I thought it over. A lot of people would say what you did guaranteed the opposite. You'd have been on the run. You would have had no choice but to start fresh, a new place, a new you. That doesn't sound so bad. You might be disappointed. Take it from me. He kept talking, still looking out of the window, as if talking to himself rather than me. I had a wife. You know that? <laughs> what am I saying? Of course you know that. Jasmine. We met at college. Got married in Hawaii. Little girl, too. 
Alyssa. He turned his head to look at me, surprised. You met them? I nodded. Cute kid. He turned to look back out at the passing landscape again. The cutest. Two months since I saw her. He didn't say anything else for two full minutes, so I prompted him. What happened? You want the short version? Roulette, Texas Hold'em, Blackjack. I always liked gambling. Ever since I was a kid. It was never a problem. Card game here, weekend in Vegas there, 50 bucks on the horses once a week. You're expecting me to tell you about some big blowout, right? One night where I lost everything. But it wasn't like that. It was gradual, so you wouldn't notice. I didn't notice. One day, I came home, and I thought the house was empty. Then I heard Jasmine upstairs crying. She was sitting on the bed holding a letter. She'd been laid off at work, came home to tell me. And then she saw a letter from the credit card company. She opened it and found out we were 200 grand in debt and rising at 17%. I know. I'm an idiot, right? I didn't say anything. I couldn't talk. I'd been in denial myself for the past few years. A problem of my own I had ignored, tried to forget about. Winter long. Bryant shook his head again. I knew it was mounting up, of course. I just... You thought you could handle it. You thought you could wait it out. Exactly. You said I'd have to leave everything, that I couldn't be me anymore. Blake, that's exactly what I wanted. What were you going to do? I hadn't worked out the details yet. I was going to go somewhere nobody would think to look for me. Somewhere far from the coasts, a hundred miles from anywhere with a population above four figures. Some little town in Iowa or North Dakota or Kansas. I was going to rent a little apartment, get a job fixing computers or painting houses or whatever. Two million buys some time to think, you know. Once I got established, I'd come back for Jasmine and Alyssa. I'd be able to give them everything back. I didn't say anything. It was a modest dream, as the dreams of multi-million dollar techno-criminals went. You've gone quiet, Blake. What are you thinking? I smiled. That had been one of Carol's stock phrases, asking me, what are you thinking about, whenever I'd been quiet for a little too long. I'm thinking that sounds like it would have been nice. You think she'd have come? I shrugged. I don't know. I don't know your wife, but I can tell you one thing from experience. There's no such thing as a fresh start. No? No. You can run away from everything. You can take a new name, a new job. But there are some things you take with you, no matter how much you wish it wasn't so. And there's always people who remember you, right? Right. Bryant gathered the discarded cards from the table, squared them, and put them back in the pack. On that note, I think I'll turn in. How long until Chicago? We'll be there around four tomorrow afternoon. Bryant gave an exasperated sigh and climbed into the top bunk. I heard the springs in the mattress settle. Less than ten minutes later, he began to snore. I wondered if the act of talking about how he came to be here had been a weight off. It had been the opposite for me. I sat back and looked out of the window again. I thought about the odds of me making it to my destination. And then I thought about the longer odds of the two of us getting out of this in one piece. I would have to try to get some sleep in a while. But not before the next stop. Saturday, January 9th, Chapter 36, Minnesota. The Lockheed Jetstar was buffeted by a cross stream of chill northerly winds as they began their descent. Stark glanced out the window again, but there was nothing to see. 
Even if they were over a population cluster, the lights would be cloaked by the blanket of moonlit clouds below. He glanced up at the sound of the hinges creaking on the cockpit door as Ortega appeared from within and gave a nod. Ten minutes to touchdown. Pilot says it will be bumpy. Stark nodded and fastened his seatbelt. He looked at the other two men seated nearby. Usher had done likewise, yanking the strap on the belt tight. Kowalski smiled and slouched in his seat, making no effort to fasten the buckle. He was slightly too big for the seat to be comfortable, but then Kowalski's size was the reason Murphy had suggested him, rather than Abrams, for the advance team. Given the probable location of their target, close quarters combat was a distinct possibility. Long as nobody's shooting at us on the approach, I'm happy, Kowalski said. Stark swallowed at the first of a series of dips as the pilot began his approach. He had never been a fan of flying, and five years of regular air travel, sometimes into enemy territory, hadn't made him like it anymore. He guessed it was one of those things you didn't get used to. You just learned to put up with it. Stark almost preferred it on the few occasions he had been aboard a plane under enemy fire. It took his mind off the flying. The pilot had been reluctant to make the trip back at the little airfield south of Seattle. He had pointed to FAA guidance suggesting not to fly unless necessary. There were pockets of storms all the way along the flight path. Farther east, it was getting even worse. They were planning for a full shutdown of all commercial flights in the northeastern states if the things kept going the same way. But then, as Kowalski said, they'd all made trips and conditions worse than these. Another steep dip flipped Stark's stomach, and he thought about the mission to keep his mind off the descent. There would be a car waiting for them at the small provincial airport. If, as predicted, they were on the ground inside of ten minutes, they would actually be slightly ahead of schedule. It was a short drive to the Amtrak railroad station at Detroit Lakes on night roads. Local forecasts said snow, but nothing that would shut the roads down. The Empire Builder, still on schedule according to Amtrak's website, would roll into the station at 3.10. Another dip, and they dropped below cloud cover. Clusters of lights spread out below marked out the small towns of Minnesota. Freezing rain streaked the plexiglass windows, blurring the lights, and the jet lurched a little to the left as another gust of wind butted into them. Focus on the mission. Was Blake still aboard the train? Stark supposed it could have been a bluff, a way to send them off on a wild goose chase while Blake laid low or took another route out of Seattle. But he thought not on balance. Too many variables. Travers had gotten lucky finding Bryant on the security tape. There was a good chance they would never have found it. Once the four of them were aboard the train, they would have time to find him. It would be a full hour to the next stop at the small town of Staples, and it would be easy to spot him if he tried to leave there. After that, there was only one stop for the next three and a half hours. Of course, this was all based on the assumption that Blake was still on the train and hadn't gotten off at any of the intermediate stops between Seattle and Detroit Lakes. But again, on balance of probability, it was likely he was aboard. Faraday seemed to be convinced that Blake's base of operations was on the East Coast, and the Empire Builder would take him most of the way there. The rear wheels thumped down on the tarmac, actually surprising Stark. He tensed as the front wheels contacted a moment later and skidded slightly on the snow. He let out a breath as the plane straightened up and the reverse thrust kicked in, slowing them down. The four of them stood up and grabbed their packs from the overhead lockers. Stark removed his shoulder holster from the pack and strapped it over his chest, then checked the Glock 19 before sliding it into the holster. Lastly, he grabbed the black parka from the locker and put it on. The other three men went through a similar routine as the pilot brought the jet to a stop. A minute later, the co-pilot was unlocking the hatch and swinging it open. 
A gust of wind and snow blew in at them, the temperature abruptly dropping in the cabin. Stark checked his watch again. 32 minutes until their rendezvous with Carter Blake. Chapter 37 Minnesota I had fallen asleep in the seat, but the change in the motion of the train stirred me as we approached the station. I opened one eye and glanced out of the window. Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. If we were on schedule, that meant it was a little after three in the morning, which explained why the platform was so quiet. Not quite deserted, though. As our car rolled by the waiting area, I saw a lone figure in a dark-colored hooded parka watching the train pull in, hanging back in the shadows. I opened the other eye to get a better look before the figure passed out of my line of sight. I was pretty sure it was a man, and I was also pretty sure he intended to get on the train. He had a small backpack strapped on. He was on his feet, ready to move once the train ground to a halt. It was odd that he wasn't standing farther out on the platform, getting ready to board. But he wasn't Amtrak staff, and there was no other reason to be at the station in the middle of the night, unless he was picking somebody up. I got up and reversed my position to the other seat, trying to see back down the platform. Bryant grunted in his sleep in the berth above me. Maybe it was nothing. Maybe the guy in the parka was just picking somebody up, backpack notwithstanding. Maybe he had some other reason for not approaching the train. But I don't like maybes, so I pressed the side of my head against the glass and squinted down the floodlit platform. The snow had started falling again, the flakes lazily drifting across my field of view. I saw a couple get off from the next car. The woman was shivering in a leather jacket. Just about okay for Seattle in January, not so much for Minnesota. The man wrapped an arm around her, and they walked quickly to the exit, lugging a pair of suitcases, their breath making clouds in the night air. Mumbled, indistinct sounds of conversation from the pair managed to penetrate the glass before they moved out of range. I heard a couple of brief yells from one of the train staff, answered by a station-bound co-worker. I kept watching. No more disembarkations. Those were the exception, rather than the rule, particularly at this time of night. The majority of the passengers were on for the whole trip. A second later, I heard a shout from the guard, signaling that we were good to go. And then I saw the man in the parka cross the platform, moving quickly and purposefully toward the doors about two cars down from us. And he wasn't alone. Three more men, dressed similarly in parkas and hoods, with packs, emerged from the shadows and followed. The guard yelled again, and the pitch of the engine rose and the Empire Builder began to roll out of the station at Detroit Lakes with four new passengers. Five years ago, Kandahar, Afghanistan. Martinez was gone. He had simply disappeared in the night in a way that should not have been possible. Standard protocol was two men on watch at all times. Martinez had offered to swap with Dixon to take the two to six shift along with Ortega. But Ortega was notorious for sleeping on the job and this time had been no exception. He had sat at the north window, brim of his hat over his eyes, and positioned himself so that it looked like he was watching. If anything happened in the night, he would wake soon enough. But whatever had happened, there hadn't been any noise loud enough to wake him. Instead, He'd awoken as the full moon broke through a patch in the cloud cover a little after five, the brightness rousing him. He had known something was wrong right away. He checked the back room and found the rest of us sleeping, but no sign of Martinez. Ortega immediately woke us and said he had dozed off for a few minutes. When this was met with skepticism, he'd admitted Martinez could have gone at any point in the previous two hours. No sign of him. No note, no warning. We tried to raise him and got nothing. He had taken his pack and his weapons. The possibility 
that an unfriendly had infiltrated the safe house was discussed and quickly discarded. There was no sign of a scuffle, and if the building had been compromised, either we would all have known about it, or we'd be dead. No, for whatever reason, no matter how little sense it made, Martinez had picked up his belongings, unlocked the door, and walked into the freezing Kandahar night. The others tossed theories around while we decided what to do and whether to delay our raid on the wolf slayer. I remained quiet, thinking about the look on Martinez's face the night before. I left the other four debating courses of action in the south room and walked through the bare doorway into the back room where Martinez's equipment had been set up. Collins was at the desk, checking through the contents of the drawer. Lost something? I said. His head jerked up, and I saw something like panic in his eyes for a split second before he composed himself. He shook his head. Just looking for... Uh, looking for? I prompted, when he didn't continue. For an explanation, I guess. Where the hell is he gone? I held his gaze for a moment before shrugging. I don't know. You want to call off? Before Collins could answer, Murphy appeared at my side. Vanished like a virginity on prom night. Any ideas, Hoss? He said, addressing Collins. Collins looked back at him, like there was something he wanted to say, but then just shook his head. You want to call off? I asked again. Collins thought about it. No. No, we go ahead. Martinez can take his chances, wherever the hell he is. An hour later, we were on the road. The sky was still dark, but the dirty yellow sodium streetlights were extinguished, one of the city's frequent rolling blackouts. We took two vehicles. Murphy, Collins, and Dixon were in one car. I rode in the other with Ortega, both of us very conscious of being a man down. We took separate prearranged routes. I watched the early morning sidewalks pass by, the locals not giving us a second glance. There was no reason to. We were riding in a beat-up Citroen, not a Humvee, and our dress did nothing to make us stand out as Americans. We crossed through the main city boundary and into the Kotali Merchant neighborhood. The line of garages we had spent days watching from above was four blocks ahead when Ortega pulled off the road. We backed into the alley that we had chosen as the best retrieval point, and Ortega switched the engine off and killed the lights. Mid-November, so the sun wouldn't start to rise for another half hour. I called in our location to the other car, which was circling the area, until we got a confirmed visual on Ajmal al-Wazir, the wolf. Ortega and I left the car and moved quickly toward our positions. Ortega crouched just inside the mouth of an alley, diagonally across from the line of garages, while I moved a little farther down the street. My assigned role was observation and recon, and I wasn't going to get involved in the rough stuff unless I was needed. Because of that, and especially because I had to avoid attracting attention, I was armed only with my Beretta, which I kept holstered underneath my jacket. Ortega and the others had MP5s, and wouldn't be making their presence known until the time for stealth was over. Martinez's satellite surveillance had suggested that Al-Wazir traveled light, normally with only three or four men. They had been making this trip for days with no trouble, so I hoped the level of trouble we were about to bring would come as something of a surprise. I crossed the street, keeping my eyes on the stretch of road headed east, the direction from which we expected the wolf to approach. I glanced at my wristwatch as I reached the other side. 0713. I stepped underneath one of the awnings sheltering the stores that lined this side of the road. From this position, I had sight of the line of garages down the street and also the spot I knew to be Ortega's position at the mouth of the alley, not that he was allowing himself to be seen. The line of stores was varied. Most were still closed, but two were already open, and another, a butcher's shop, 
was in the process of opening. I watched as the owner began hanging the day's carcasses on a rail that overhung the entrance and the sidewalk. Next door was a cafe. It was open, but the three small tables outside were unoccupied this early on a winter morning. On the other side was some kind of junk store. It was hard to tell what exactly it sold, other than clutter. A tall, skinny man was sweeping the sidewalk outside. He glanced at me, nodded, and looked back down at his work. I turned the other way and spoke just loud enough for my voice to be picked up by the mic. This is two. I'm in position. Ortega's voice immediately answered, crystal clear through the tiny receiver nestled in my right ear. One, in position. Picking this up, Six. Copy that, Collins replied. In position. No visual on Big Bad. He's late, I said. I looked up and down the street. Traffic was almost non-existent on this particular stretch of road. But all around I could hear the sounds of a city slowly rising to meet the day. From far off I heard the whine of a motorcycle. The man with the broom was still working away. I glanced at the hanging carcasses outside the butcher shop, swaying slightly in the breeze. Nothing that looked appetizing, even if I had been at all hungry. I raised my eyes and looked through the window of the store. An older man within was smoking a cigarette, regarding me with suspicion. I moved along to the next unit, the cafe. I glanced up and down the street again. Still nothing. I positioned myself where I could pretend to be regarding the menu in the window while still keeping a good view of the street. What's the matter, you skip breakfast? Ortega's voice in my ear. I smiled and said nothing, because the owner of the cafe was coming out to see me. He regarded me with the standard level of caution. He spoke in Pashtu. Coffee, you want something to eat? I glanced back at the road, which was still empty. Coffee, I agreed. No milk. He held his hand out toward the door, but I pulled out one of the chairs outside. I'll sit here. He looked like he was about to question me, and then shrugged and disappeared back inside to fix the coffee. A customer was a customer, even if he was crazy enough to want to dine al fresco in November before the sun came up. I sat down, feeling the comforting weight of the Beretta settle on my chest. This is two. What's happening? I said quietly through gritted teeth. This is six. Stand by, came Collins's response. Where the hell was he? Not a break in the routine in days, and we knew the cars hadn't been moved from the garage. Had the wolf decided to take a day off, or had he been tipped off? I thought about Martinez and immediately dismissed it. I had a good idea why he'd split, and if I was right, it had precisely zero to do with the mission in hand. Collins spoke again. This is six? We have a visual? I held my breath. I barely even noticed as the cafe owner placed the cup of coffee in front of me. The scent drifted up to my nose in the cold air. Okay the owner said, glancing from the coffee to me, a concerned expression on his face. Tashakor, I replied. If they had a visual, and they were still in their designated position, that meant the wolf and his entourage were seconds away from rounding the corner. I counted the seconds. Ten. Fifteen. Nothing. I cleared my throat loudly and spoke under my breath. This is two. Update. Wait two, Collins's voice said. Just to keep my hands occupied, I picked up the cup and sipped the coffee. As I swallowed, Collins spoke again. Target is turning back. Something's wrong. I cursed under my breath, hearing a similar noise from Ortega. A second later, Ortega was in my ear again. Two. Get the fuck out of there. I was on my feet already as I acknowledged. Say again? Just get to secondary position. Now. I didn't know what the hell was happening, but I guessed it couldn't be good. 
I turned and jogged toward Ortega's alley. What the hell was happening? Whatever it was, getting me to cover was more of a priority than explanations. I hustled across the road and into the alley, expecting to see Ortega waiting for me. The car was still there, but Ortega was gone. The narrow alley stretched 40 yards between two stucco buildings. At the far end was a main road. I put a finger to my ear. This is two, at secondary, where the... I stopped as I heard a whisper of movement behind me from the direction of the street. I started to turn and felt a sharp pain in the side of my neck. My vision started to blur, and I felt arms around my upper body. And then the walls seemed to be flowing around me like stone waterfalls, and everything went gray and finally black. Chapter 38 With no small amount of difficulty, I roused Bryant and told him I was going to check something out. What's wrong? I don't know yet. Maybe nothing. Stay in here and don't answer the door to anybody. When I come back, I'll knock five times. Blake, that doesn't sound like nothing. I didn't reply. I opened the door and stepped out into the corridor closing it quietly but making sure the lock clicked home. Quickly, I moved down the corridor. The main lights were off this time of night, but the thin light strips along the floors provided enough illumination. I crossed into the next car, which was coach, all seated. Lighting at minimum in here, too. Sleeping passengers hunched in most of the seats, a few night owls watching movies on their laptops with headphones plugged in, or reading books using little page lights. From my excursions to the lounge car, I knew the rest of the train was just as full as this car. It would take them a while to search the train, particularly at night. I passed through to the end and exited through the sliding door into the join area between the cars. In the next car, there was a restroom area, the pod sticking out into the corridor and blocking the line of sight ahead. I hesitated a second, hoping none of the four men were heading this way yet. If we ran into each other at the door, there would be no going back. I stole a glance around the corner and saw nobody coming. Emboldened, I stepped forward and proceeded. This one was seated also, most people sleeping, some on laptops and reading. I slowed as I approached the doors to the next car and peered through the window. At the far end of the next car, there were two men standing in the aisle. I pulled back before either of them happened to look in my direction. I thought about how I would run the search. Four men searching a train packed with hundreds of people. Twelve cars, two locomotives at either end, a mixture of coach and sleeping, plus two baggage cars and the lounge. Their odds were improved by the fact they could visually ID both me and Bryant. They had to anticipate I'd taken one of the roomettes for exactly the reasons I had done so. But there was still the possibility that I might be among the seated passengers, and those would be easier for them to check, particularly at night. Just quietly walking up and down the aisles, checking the sleeping faces, would allow them to eliminate a large portion of the passengers with relative speed. But all four of them, trying to do it all at once, would likely attract the attention of the Amtrak staff. So they would probably take turns, one at a time, taking maybe one or two cars, then a break. Then another of them checking another two cars. They'd still be able to eliminate everyone traveling in the seated cars reasonably quickly. They had almost an hour until we reached the next stop, I thought about waiting until then, and then trying to leave the train undetected, but quickly dismissed the idea. If I were them, I would put a man out on the platform at every stop. Two men leaving the train at a small town station at 4 a.m. would be just as noticeable as four men boarding. And even if we could slip past them, we'd be stuck in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, with no transport. If we were going to stand a chance of leaving without being noticed, it would have to be later, with a crowd. 
St. Paul, perhaps. Even then, it was unlikely they would miss us. I chanced another look and saw one of the men had sat down while the other had disappeared. They would have had to buy designated seats, so I guessed they had split the team over multiple cars. They'd attract less attention as a group that way, and they could keep an eye on four different locations without leaving their seats. I made my way back to the room and knocked softly five times. Bryant opened the door at once, like he'd been waiting behind it. He was wide awake now, his eyes betraying the strain of the last few days and hours. Problems? I think so. They must have traced us to the station back in Seattle. Four men got on at the last stop. I think they've already started making the rounds. Shit. My thoughts exactly. So what do we do? Chapter 39 New York City A quiet knock at the door awoke Faraday from a light sleep. Her eyes snapped open, and she needed no time to orient herself or to remember why she was sleeping on one of the ready cots. She got up off the thin mattress and stood up. Although it was freezing outside the building, the room was overheated and dry. She opened the door to see Williamson. Williamson's half-lidded, disinterested stare could have been blamed on the hour, were it not the expression she affected at all times. Did they get Blake? She asked immediately. Williamson shook her head. Uh-uh. Or at least not as far as I know. They intercepted the train at Detroit Lakes, Minnesota on schedule. Nothing since then, but there are a lot of cell black spots out there. Faraday nodded. After checking in at the station, they wouldn't contact Central Command unless there was something to report. When there was something to report, they could use the satellite phone. Did Murphy rendezvous with the second team yet? The second team was shadowing the route of the Empire Builder by road, as closely as possible. Murphy was going to rendezvous with them at the next available point. Still en route. Weather held him up. Then, what do you have for me? Not an address yet, but I think I found Blake's neighborhood. Seriously? Two minutes later, Faraday was back in the ops room. The giant screen on the south wall was divided into different windows. One was a live satellite view of the operation area. Fully a quarter of the live screen was obscured by clouds. The weather was starting to close in. Faraday hoped that wouldn't cause delays on the track. It would be one more variable to consider. A larger window on the big screen showed a clear view from earlier in the day of the same geography, a barely discernible thread crossing the middle of the screen horizontally was the Great Northern Railway. Superimposed lines and labels marked out the state boundaries and population centers currently invisible on the live feed. She knew the weather was another factor Blake might be able to exploit. As things stood, it would be easy to check the handful of people leaving the train at night stops. Less so, if the train was forced to come to a halt between stations or cancelled at the next stop. She just had to hope Blake was operating under the illusion he was in the clear. She shelved those considerations for the moment and turned her thoughts toward the promising new avenue that had opened up. There were three banks of monitors, but only one station was in use. Williamson sat down in her chair and unlocked the screen. Talk to me, Faraday said, as her eyes scanned the screen. It displayed an array of times and dates and numbers. It took Faraday a second to realize what she was looking at. The flight records? That's right. You told me to work with the known and suspected dates and locations Blake has been over the last five years. We didn't have much to go on. We started out with Crozier in L.A., and looked at everything around that. Lucky for us, the FBI had already done some of the work for us. When Blake was briefly a suspect in the Samaritan thing, they looked into him as far as they could. Which would have given them nothing, right? 
right. But they did ID the flight he took into L.A. He came in from Fort Lauderdale with a stop off at Fort Worth. Cooper was in Florida. Does that mean Blake? Headshake from Williamson. I think he was on a job down there. He appears on another flight inbound to Lauderdale. This one from Newark. Okay. Then we go back to October of the previous year. And this is what really put me on track. His prints were run by the police in Fort Dodge, Iowa. The date and location chimed in Faraday's head. The Wardell case. It was him. The Wardell case had been one of their possibles for Blake's involvement. Officially, the FBI had tracked down the deadly serial killer. But given what they knew now about Blake's operations since leaving Winterlong, it was highly likely the case bore his fingerprints. And now, it appeared, it literally did. How the hell did we miss this? We didn't. Homeland Security flagged the request hit the local cops with a DR-17, and passed it on to us. Who was it escalated to? Drakakis? That's right. The trail was almost purged from the system. Almost? Williamson answered that with a low chuckle. Under normal circumstances, Faraday would have answered with a barb to tell Williamson not to be so cocky, but she let it go. She was far more preoccupied with who had purged the fingerprint hit and why. But that would have to wait for the moment. She listened as Williamson carried on talking, too absorbed in the pleasure of finding the discrepancy to care about the whys and wherefores. Anyway, Wardell was caught and killed November 2nd. Blake evidently stuck around a couple of weeks, or he came back for some reason. He flies back east on the 16th. Newark again? JFK. All roads seem to lead back to New York, or at least somewhere on the East Coast. This was the one chink in Blake's armor. He couldn't fly without leaving a trail, and he had to use a consistent name for ID, unless he wanted to take the risk of maintaining multiple identities. And up until recently, there had been no real need. They didn't know he was calling himself Carter Blake until L.A., and even if they had, it wasn't exactly a unique name. Only now that they had been able to build up a picture of his movements could they make the connections that suggested an area of home turf. And even then... Okay, New York area, that's good. Cuts it down to millions of locations rather than hundreds of millions. Definitely in the area, Williamson said and his record says he had an apartment in the city when he was with us. Faraday massaged her temples. New York City. Was Blake really headed in their direction? Something told her that wasn't quite right. Williamson continued. So you're an ex-operative, with no past, and you're looking for a place to stay, somewhere you won't be found. What's important? No paper trail, rent, mortgage, insurance, Faraday said. And then she thought about something else, something that would be hard to come by in the city. Privacy. Right, so I'm looking at cash buys over the period. These are getting rarer, particularly when you cut out the millionaires. He won't be in the city, Faraday said. Someplace quiet, rural or small town. Williamson thought about it. Makes sense. Cuts the job down a little, if you're right. So, do you want me to stay on this, or go back to monitoring the ever-enthralling police bands of Seattle? She considered it for a moment. Stay on this, Williamson. And keep me posted. Chapter 40. Minnesota. I told Bryant why I was pretty sure they were on the train because of us. With no weapons and few places to hide, I came to a simple conclusion. Somehow, we had to get off the train before they found us. Can't we just stay in here? 
wait it out? I mean, there's no way for them to know we're in here, right? We could try, I said, but if it doesn't work, we would have nowhere to go. Besides, if I were running this search, it wouldn't help. I'd check the easy options first, give the seated passengers the once-over. My guess is, that's what they're doing right now. Then I'd move on to the sleeper cars. They couldn't get in without breaking the door down. And like I said, they don't know which room we're in. They're not going to break down a hundred doors. They don't need to, I said. They just need to knock on a hundred doors. Law of averages says not even that many. They'd get to us sooner or later. They could say they were Amtrak staff, that they were looking for a missing kid or something. At three in the morning, nobody's going to argue. They just want to get back to sleep. Of course we would stay quiet and ignore the knock, but by the time they've finished, they would have narrowed it down to a few rooms they haven't managed to eliminate. Then they watch those rooms and wait us out. By that time, it's too late to do anything but sit and wait for the inevitable. When you put it that way, doesn't sound so good. Bryant nodded. Okay, then how the hell do we get off this train? I estimated the time since the last calling point. Next stop is in about 45 minutes, give or take. Bryant nodded at the window. I'm not so sure about that. I looked outside. The snow was flying past much more thickly now. And was it an optical illusion of the swirling flakes blowing past, or were we moving a little slower than we had been? I could see ice on the window outside our climate-controlled bubble and knew it was well below freezing out there. We had one advantage, at least. Minimal time required to pack. I stood at the door and listened for a second and twisted the handle. I stuck my head out in the corridor and looked both ways. Empty. The noise of the train rocking back and forward was louder out here. We turned left because it was the opposite direction from where I knew the four men had joined the train. There were four cars that way against nine in the other direction, and if nothing else, I wanted to get us in a position where we could be attacked from only one direction. We made it to the far end, where there were the same transparent sliding doors leading into the join between cars, and then another set of the same doors with an airlock to keep the noise and the cold out of the interiors. We passed through the first set of doors, and the temperature dropped 20 degrees. I stepped across the join and hit the button to open the next door. It was another sleeping car, like ours. A narrow corridor about a foot and a half wide with doors along the left-hand side, windows along the right. The snow outside whirled and sparkled in the dim light from the strips along the floor. Bryant spoke behind me, keeping his voice low. What do we do when we run out of train? I'll let you know when we get there. I was heading for the front of the train, because I knew there had to be a staff-only area near the driver's cabin. It would be a better place to hide out than in the passenger areas, and it might provide some other options. I didn't relish the idea of leaving the train while it was in motion at 50 or 60 miles an hour, so it would be nice to evaluate alternative courses of action. Then again, maybe the front of the train would be full of Amtrak staff who would turn us back the way we came. I hated having so little idea of my next move, but as I had told Bryant, doing something was better than doing nothing. Or so I hoped. One car down, three to go, I thought, as we reached the next set of doors. We passed through another cold spot, and this time into one of the seated cars. We walked quietly through the dozing passengers, the occasional light sleeper or reader glancing up curiously as we passed. Another set of doors. We stepped over the join and into the next car. Another sleeping car. Same row of doors on the left side, same windows on the right, same floor lights, everything the same. Except one thing. There was a big guy in a black parka standing halfway along the carriage. Chapter 41 he was around 6'2", with a wide, muscled frame. He had short, blond hair. He had his back to us when we entered, but turned fast at the sound of the door opening. For a nanosecond, both he and I froze. 
and then we sprang into motion. I charged down the narrow corridor, yelling at Bryant to get back to the room. I didn't have time to glance behind me to check he was doing as he was told, because I was focused on the man in front of me going for his gun. It took him a split second longer to reach for it than it would have done had he not been wearing the bulky parka, giving me just enough time to cover the three strides between us and slam into him before he had a chance to aim. A stray shot escaped as I fumbled for his wrist going for the gun. It pierced the floor of the car without much fuss, just a muzzle flare and the thump sound as the attached suppressor did its job. He used his free hand to grab for my throat as I forced his gun hand down again. I ducked backward, grabbing the wrist of his gun hand with both of my hands, pulling him off balance, and then used his momentum to beef up a headbutt. He grunted in pain and got a couple of good shots into my ribs with his left while I twisted his right hand until the gun dropped to the floor. Slipping out of my grip, he hit me a couple of times hard on my left side again while bringing his right around toward my head. I blocked it with my forearm, and then another from the left. He was fast, had already gotten in several blows to my one. I ducked under another swing and wrapped both arms around his midsection, slamming him hard against the wall and down to the floor of the car. His head cracked off the surface, and as he was lifting it again, I planted the palm of my right hand in the center of his forehead and slammed it back down again hard. I gripped as much of the short hair on his scalp as I could and tried the same again, but this time he managed to twist his head and I lost my grip midway to pounding his head against the floor one more time. Before I knew his hand had moved, I felt his bald fist slam into my stomach, knocking the wind from me. It was followed by his knee jutting up. I folded, and he planted a foot in my gut, pushing me backward. Already off balance, I was lifted almost into the air as he kicked me back from him and started to scramble to his feet. I landed on my back and got to one knee. The door between us creaked open, and a man in his seventies with bedhead and bags under his eyes started to step out into the corridor, his mouth open. It was like the referee had stopped the bout. Both the blonde man and I paused. We finished getting to our feet as our eyes flicked between each other and the old guy, waiting for him to make a move. The old guy looked at me, then the blonde man, then closed his mouth, quickly retreated back inside, and closed the door firmly. Suddenly there was a blade in his hand, the moonlight from outside glancing off steel. I remembered the gun. I couldn't see it in my field of vision, and since we were in a very confined space, that meant it had to be behind me. I took a step back, glancing behind me for the split second I needed to locate the pistol. It was ten feet from me, but my sparring partner was already rushing me with the knife. Split second decision. I could either retrieve the gun or prevent him from gutting me. Not both. I fell back another step and timed my action to match his approach speed. I spread my arms to balance my weight, pivoted on my left foot, and slammed the heel of my boot into the side of his face as he bore down on me. I kept moving on the follow-through, twisting my body so the blade plunged through the space where my upper chest had been a split second before. He staggered off balance, and his momentum took him past me on my right side like a bull sweeping past a toreador. Without thinking, I curved my left arm and swung it back hard, driving the hard point of my elbow into the base of his skull. It connected hard enough that I felt the jolt in my fingertips. I spun around in time to see his legs carry him another couple of paces before he slammed face down on the floor, his limp arms not even twitching forward to break his fall. If it was an act, it deserved an Academy Award. But I was taking no chances. I crossed the space between us and stamped down on the fingers that were still wrapped around the hilt of the blade, then kicked it away from him. I stepped quickly over the body and retrieved the gun, a Glock 19. I held it on him for a moment, watching for any movement, and then I crouched down next to him. Keeping my finger tight on the trigger, I gripped a handful of the collar of his parka in my left hand and hauled him over onto his back. His nose had been broken in the fall, but he was still breathing through his open mouth. Gradually, 
awareness of my surroundings drained back into me. The strobing light of the moon filtered through trees and snow. The rattle of the wheels on the track. I looked behind and ahead. Saw no one. The old guy in the roomette wouldn't open that door again until we got to Chicago. If then. I turned back to the still form of my opponent. He was wearing a communicator, a slender earpiece and mic so subtle that I hadn't noticed it in the fight. I pulled it off him and examined it. Lightweight but tough. Bone conduction technology for superior sound quality. There were two buttons marked with a circle and a square. Pressing the square would let you talk to the rest of the team. The circle put you in touch with the base. I put it to my ear and heard only dead air. I checked it was turned on and attached it over my own ear. The earpiece was custom molded, so the fit wasn't perfect, but it stayed in place. Then I patted him down. I found three different forms of fake ID, all in different names, including a Department of Homeland Security special agent badge that looked legit. I reminded myself it probably was legit, at least in the sense that it wasn't counterfeit. DHS was a nice, convenient cover, the spaghetti dinner of government agencies that had been scrambled together to form an umbrella initiative to tackle terrorism on U.S. soil was a very broad church. The badge brought with it a level of power and a lack of accountability that other domestic law enforcement agents would kill for. I took another few seconds making a thorough search, knowing I needed to move fast. I found a couple of spare magazines for the Glock and pocketed them. Finally, I found a cheap push-button cell phone. I didn't have the time to examine it, so I switched it off and pocketed it, too. I stood up and turned back toward the doorway, hoping that Bryant had made it back to the room. I gripped my purloined Glock and held it low as I approached the next car. As I passed into the next car, I saw a passenger sleeping on either side. I thought about tucking the Glock into my belt but the attached suppressor made it too cumbersome. In any case, I didn't really want it to leave my hand. Instead, I held it down by my side, trusting that the matte black finish wouldn't be noticed against my dark clothing in the dim light. I moved quickly down the aisle. I made sure to glance at the occupant of each seat as I passed, on the off chance that Bryant had taken a seat. Another thought occurred to me. What if one of my pursuers was in here, hiding in plain sight? If so, they would have me at a lethal disadvantage by having the ability to recognize me. A teenage girl wearing Beats by Dre headphones glanced up as I passed, probably wondering why there was so much traffic all of a sudden. I gave her an amiable smile and continued toward the next car. This was the last one before ours. Another sleeping car. I was a third of the way along the corridor when a voice spoke from right beside me. Kowalski? I tensed up and started to raise my gun before I remembered I was wearing the downed man's headset. Bone conduction. There hadn't been a burst of static, and the sound quality was good enough to fool me that the speaker was whispering in my ear. I froze mid-stride, holding my breath in case it gave me away. Kowalski, you there? The voice sounded tense, on the verge of being concerned. I cleared my throat and tried to keep my voice as neutral as possible. Copy. There was another pause, and for that instant, I was certain the speaker knew what had happened. But then he started talking again, excited, eager to convey whatever message he had. We've got one of them. Bryant. We think Blake's up ahead. Any sign? What's your location? Shit. I swallowed and took a step back. Negative. There was a pause, a longer one this time. Kowalski, is that you? Obvious suspicion in the voice. And then a single word. Midnight. The word required a response. I turned and started running back to the previous carriage as fast as I could. Rambler. I guessed, figuring I might as well launch a Hail Mary. It was hopelessly off target.
The volume of the voice rose, saying, Who is this? Even though I was pretty sure he already knew the answer to that. Kowalski's out of action, I said quietly. Walk away now, or I can arrange a reunion. Chapter 42 Stark's index finger was pressed against the bud of the earpiece, trying to get a clear read on the other man's voice over the clattering of the train. He activated the mute switch as he turned to Ortega and Usher. Ortega was jamming Scott Bryant up against the wall of the room with one hand. An entirely unnecessary precaution. One, because Bryant's hands were securely cuffed behind him, and two, because the terrified look in his eyes said he wasn't taking an offbeat breath without their say-so. Kowalski's down, Stark said. Usher simply nodded, entirely unaffected, just processing the new information. Ortega's face twisted into a pissed-off grimace, and he pushed down hard between Bryant's shoulder blades, mashing his face harder into the wall. Where the fuck is Blake? He hissed in Bryant's ear. I swear to God. Bryant closed his eyes and gritted his teeth. Stark sighed. Think about it, Ortega. This was their room. We caught Bryant coming back from the front of the train. What does that suggest? Ortega shrugged. Blake's tricky. You don't know him like I do. I don't know him at all, and I'd just as soon keep it that way. Stark opened the door a crack and glanced up and down the corridor to check it was still clear, then closed it and turned back to the others. Ortega, stay here. Make sure he doesn't go anywhere. If Blake shows up, put a bullet between his eyes. Kowalski made a mistake. Ortega nodded and put the barrel of his Glock against the base of Bryant's neck. Make a sound, and I'll paint the fucking wall. His voice was matter-of-fact. He nodded at the other two to go ahead. Stark opened the door again and stepped out into the dark corridor, Usher close behind. He walked quickly down the corridor, keeping his eyes on the doors. There were four cars ahead. Kowalski was in one of them, perhaps dead. And in that same car, or close by, would be Carter Blake, armed and ready to do whatever it took to survive. Chapter 43 The most important quality in my line of work is adaptability. Control what you can, but don't expect to control everything. Make plans, but don't be surprised when you have to tear them up and start from scratch. Don't waste time on wishing things were different. Deal with them as they are. The last couple of days had tested that maxim to the limit. Forget about Plan B. I was shifting on to Plan E or F by the time I picked up the transmission from Kowalski's friend. So they had Bryant. I guessed there was an outside chance that whoever I was speaking to was misdirecting me that he had known whom he was speaking to as soon as I acknowledged the call. But I doubted it. If there was anything I could still do to save Bryant's life, and I wasn't entirely sure there was, it would have to wait until I'd extracted myself from this situation. Five seconds after cutting the communication off, I was at the far end of the second-to-last car. I passed through the first set of doors and found what I'd expected to earlier in the night, when the odds of survival had seemed ever so slightly less impossible. There was a staff-only sign on the second door. Passing through it, I found that the space in the forward locomotive was truncated to make room for the driver's cabin up ahead. It was laid out similar to the sleeping cars, but with fewer doors. Staff quarters. Had it not been for the encounter with the man I now knew was Kowalski, I would have tried to find an empty one and hole up until we hit the next station. But it was too late for that now. The train swayed and the wheels clattered on the tracks. Already I had a pretty good idea of what I had to do next, and I wasn't happy about it. I glanced out of the closest window and tried to estimate our current speed. 
It was difficult in the dark with the snowflakes dancing across my field of vision on the diagonal. I thought we were moving a little slower than we had been earlier, but not much. Maybe 45, 50 miles an hour, down from 60. And then I thought about who was behind me and closing the gap. They would be here within a minute. I had Kowalski's Glock, so taking my chances in a gunfight was an option. It would be three against one, of course, but at least they would be hampered by the tight space. On the other hand, I could try to bargain, but that would be futile when it was so obvious I had nowhere to go. Nowhere to go except one place. I stepped toward the door and examined the controls in the side panel. There were two large buttons, one to open, one to close the door. Both were inactive while the train was in motion, of course. It was an identical setup to the exit doors at the equivalent positions in all the other cars. I had spent a little time examining them earlier, making sure I knew where everything was, all while not really admitting to myself that I might find myself having to take this course of action. Above the buttons was a glass box with a button inside like a fire alarm. The bold text beneath it said, Emergency door open. Do not use while train in motion. It was good advice. I unscrewed the suppressor from the Glock and put the gun inside my coat. Then I wrapped the sleeve around my fist and smashed the panel. The glass fractured smoothly and dropped out, leaving the emergency button unguarded. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. I glanced back through the doors to see the doors at the far end of the next car opening and closing. At least two men were silhouetted against the light between the cars. I hit the button, and the doors sprang out and open. I felt the sudden blade of a freezing 50-mile-an-hour slipstream bite into me. Chapter 44 As the doors opened, the exterior footplate, tucked in to increase aerodynamics, automatically folded down. There was no time to contemplate the stupidity of what I was about to do. If I hesitated, my pursuers would be upon me. Gripping tight onto the edge of the doorway with my right hand, I put one foot on the plate and reached my left hand out for the handle on the outside. The wind slammed into me like a wall of ice. As I gripped the handle, I was grateful that it was coated with smooth plastic. Had it been bare metal... The cold would have stripped the skin from the palm of my hand. Snow-covered pine trees whipped past. I looked down at the ground rushing past and estimated we were doing fifty minimum. If I jumped now, I would likely be killed. But if I hung around waiting, the men with guns in pursuit would make that a definite. About a mile ahead of us, I could make out the beginning of a gradual incline. The train would have to slow a little for it may be enough to make jumping a better bet. But it would take a minute or longer for that to start happening, and I didn't have that long. I stepped fully out on the footplate and switched hands on the exterior handle. The wind, catching the entirety of my body now, pulled at me, trying to cast me out into the slipstream. The noise of the wheels on the track was deafening, and I tried not to think about being thrown under them. I concentrated on keeping at least three points in contact with the train at all times. Even so, I felt the ache in the muscles of my right arm as I gripped the handle tight while reaching around the edge of the car. On a freight train, I would have had lots of options. There would be a clear gap between cars where one was coupled to the next, and I would have been able to sit atop the coupling, sheltered from the full force of the elements. But this was a passenger train so there was a flexible cover to provide a passage between cars. I prayed for a handhold on the back of the car. I gritted my teeth as my fingers fumbled up and down the small, unseen area within my grasp and found only bare, freezing steel. I risked a glance back. The snow strafed my eyes, but there was no one at the doorway yet. I brought my left hand back around so I was gripping the handle with both hands, adjusted my grip, and moved both feet as close to the edge of the footplate as I possibly could. 
The car rocked toward me as the train entered the start of a long curve. A minute adjustment for hundreds of tons of train, but one that almost hurled me from my perch. I held my breath and gripped until the train settled into the curve and then reached around the back again. This time, my fingers found something. I felt around the protrusion. It was rectangular with rounded edges. A rung. Just what I was hoping for. As long as there were more. Just then, a face appeared at the door, gun raised. Without thinking, I gripped the rung, let go of the handle, and swung around the edge, gripping the rung with my right hand as soon as my feet had left the footplate. The wind caught me straight on and tried to fling me into the air again, but I held firm and swung into the narrow gap. I heard a muffled curse from the doorway as the man who had seen me realized what had happened. There were three more rungs above the one I was hanging from with both hands. Their purpose was to provide access to the roof for maintenance workers. No big deal to scale a stationary train safely parked offline and under cover. Quite a big deal on a moving and rocking train with snow coating the rungs, making them slippery. I glanced down and found a bottom rung, catching it with one foot and gratefully stepping the other foot onto it. Back to four points of contact. I reached up and grabbed the next rung, then the one after that, pulling myself up so my line of sight was above the edge of the roof. The wind hit me full in the face once again, the oncoming snow streaming into my eyes. I squeezed them into slits and located a vertical rung on the roof, more by feel than by sight, and started to haul myself up. Then I felt fingers close around my right ankle and dig into my flesh. Too slow. I gripped the rung on the roof with both hands and put my weight on the other foot, trying to kick the hand free. The fingers held firm, so I shifted my weight onto my left side and tried another tack, dragging the hand with me, hoping the owner would either quit or lose his balance. At first, the hand held tight, but then I felt the fingers release a little, shift to the leg of my jeans. I kicked again, and suddenly I was free. I scrambled onto the roof, my knuckles whitening on the roof rung as I braced myself against the full onslaught of the oncoming wind. For a moment, all I could do was kneel and hold on. A barely audible sound from behind me, carried to me on the wind, reminded me I didn't have the luxury of time for a coffee break. It was the sound of my first pursuer's foot on the bottom rung at the end of the car. I gripped the roof rung tightly with both hands and lifted my feet, bracing them on the surface of the roof in a crouch. I squinted at the track ahead. The incline was closer now, but still some way off. Shifting my focus to the immediate foreground, I saw more balance rungs jutting up from the center of the car's roof. The middle section was a flat strip about two feet wide before the downward curve became more pronounced on either side. This was no simple and steady path, though, because the rungs were spaced at least 15 feet apart with nothing else to grab onto in between. But then, they hadn't been designed for this activity. I braced myself like a runner on the blocks, put my weight on my right foot, and launched myself straight ahead. I made it two strides toward the next rung before the biting wind slowed my momentum, trying to steer me off the edge. I angled my body toward the next rung and dived for it, just catching hold with my right hand. I brought my left hand up to it, braced myself, and then risked a glance over my shoulder. Through a tunnel of flying snow, I saw the upper body of a man reaching over the end of the car, one hand on the rung. As I watched, I saw what he was doing with his other hand. Muzzle flare flashed twice. The suppressed noise of the gunshot utterly lost in the cacophony of the train and the wind. Instinctively, I ducked, pressing myself down against the roof. One of the bullets smashed into the surface of the roof ten feet from my hands. The other was lost in the night. I had a minor advantage now, because his visibility facing ahead was worse than mine looking behind. 
I braced my legs and knees on the roof until I was confident of letting go of the rung with one hand, then reached into my coat and pulled out Kowalski's Glock. Another muzzle flare and a third bullet hit the surface of the roof five feet from me this time. Getting closer. I trained the gun on the end of the car and fired four shots in as tight a grouping as I could manage, with the motion of the train and the wind spilling my aim all over the place. The upper body of the man vanished. Had I hit him? Absolutely no way to know. But I had forced him to duck back down at the very least. I turned my head and squinted into the oncoming snow, finding the third rung sticking up another fifteen feet away, just past the middle of the car. After the experience of getting from the first rung to the second, it looked a hell of a lot farther. Changing tactics, I positioned myself on the far side of the rung, my feet jutted forward, my hands reaching behind me to hold on. I took a breath and let go with my right hand. Another breath, and I let go with my left again, lunging forward. This time the wind knocked me down on my first stride. I felt myself being blown off course again, so I dropped flat to the roof, spreading my arms and legs and making myself as small a target for the wind as I possibly could. Now, I was spread-eagled on the roof, halfway between rungs, with no way to hang on but by the friction of my hands on the rough surface of the roof. Keeping my face down to the roof, I inched forward, praying I had taken out the first guy and that his compatriot hadn't worked up the nerve to follow yet. I risked raising my head a half inch to look ahead and saw the next rung was almost within reach. Just another three pushes ought to do it. One, two, a bullet hole appeared in the roof next to my right elbow. I yelled a curse and ignored the urge to recoil. Then I gritted my teeth and inched along the rest of the distance, grabbing the rung and pulling myself along again. I heard the snap of another shot passing by my head. With all of the noise, it had to have been pretty close for me to register it at all. When I looked back, I saw that both of them were there now. One was on the roof already, the other maneuvering himself up from between the cars. I raised my gun and fired three more times in their direction. Again, impossible to tell for sure, but if I'd hit anything, especially from this distance, it was pure luck. Which was true for them, too, of course. But with two guns, they had twice as many rolls of the dice. I glanced behind me, squinting my eyes into the direction of travel. We were almost at the incline, and I knew the train would be slowing a little, even if it didn't feel like it from my current position. Waiting for the optimum jump window wasn't an option. There were two more rungs before the end of the car. I had to try to cover the distance in quick succession. The more space I could put between myself and the two men behind me, the better. I tucked the Glock into my belt. Then I got my feet in position again, trying to ignore the fact there were probably bullets in the air around me, and launched myself toward the next rung. The journey to this one felt easier, either because I was getting the hang of this or because the direction of the wind happened to stay constant for that particular five-second span. I gripped the second-to-last rung and took a breath, not bothering to look back this time. I focused on the final rung, telling myself that all I needed to do was to get to it and I could slide down between the cars and give myself the best possible chance of surviving the jump. I let go of the rung and took one stride, two, and then my foot slipped. Maybe it was a patch of ice, or maybe I had misjudged the edge of the flat section of roof in my haste to complete the last lunge. I would never know the exact reason. All I knew was that suddenly I found myself tumbling toward the right side of the roof. My right foot twisted as it hit the more pronounced slope, and I tried to go flat again, anything to keep myself on the roof. And then the wind caught me full on and flung me toward the edge like a rag doll. My left shoulder slammed off the edge of the roof, and then I was in the air, white above and black below. Then, black above 
and white below. Five years ago, Kandahar, Afghanistan. My first thought was that I had the worst hangover in the world. As I started to pick up the feed from my other senses, I began to realize that this was something worse than just a hangover. I was lying on a hard surface, on my side with my arms around my back. Nearby, I could hear the sound of somebody moving, working on something. I started to open my eyes a crack and immediately closed them again as the light stabbed into them. With an effort of will, I opened them and realized that the dazzling light source was nothing more than morning sunlight cast through the gap between the bottom of a panel door and the concrete floor. For some reason, the fact it was a panel door brought everything back to me. The stakeout on Ajmal al-Wazir's garages. The sudden alert from Collins. The empty alley. And then... I was guessing the, and then, was the source of my headache. A stinging ache in my neck told me I'd been injected with something that had knocked me out for a while. The garage. I was in the wolf's lair. And I wasn't alone. Trying not to make any noise, I turned my head. I saw wooden crates and cardboard boxes full of parts and junk. I saw that there was only one other person with me. His back was to me as he leaned over the side walls of a flatbed pickup truck. He wore combat pants, an olive green t-shirt, and a pocketed assault vest. He looked almost like... Murphy? I said out loud before I had a chance to think it through. Murphy turned and squinted at me through what, to him, probably felt like half-light. When I saw the guilty expression on his face, I knew I had been too quick to speak. I also knew why I was lying on my side and why my arms were in such an unnatural position. I didn't need to try to separate my wrists to know they were cuffed, but I tried it anyway. Sometimes I hate it when I'm right. How long you been conscious? He asked. I noted the word he had used. Conscious. Not awake. I started to speak, but no sound came out. My throat was as dry as the desert. I swallowed to try to moisten my mouth and tried again. What the hell is going on? I said, intentionally slurring my voice a little. Murphy picked up a rag and wiped his hands. I was suddenly aware of the smell of the place. My nose isn't up to sniffer dog standard, but I'm familiar with the distinctive aroma of C4 in large quantities. With an effort, I managed to haul myself up into a seated position. My eyes were getting used to the relative light now, and Murphy's features had come into focus enough so I could see an expression of genuine regret on his face. I knew exactly what was happening, and why. I'm sorry, man. I jiggled the cuffs again, the chain clinking against the concrete of the garage floor. Take the cuffs off, I said. He shook his head. No can do, compadre. Orders. What the hell are you talking about? He shrugged. No point in playing dumb. Not now. I stared back at him, waiting for him to continue. You and Martinez. We know about it. He got away for now. We can't make the same mistake with you. I don't know what... You know, all right. Maybe you didn't know we knew is all. Your little meetings with the senator. Getting pretty friendly with those folks. Especially that little blonde. Nice work by the... Don't fucking talk about her. He shrugged. Fair enough. We're not interested in her. Not unless you were stupid enough to tell her anything, which, personally, I don't reckon you would have been. Or am I wrong? I quelled the anger rising up in me, stamped down on the urge to haul myself to my feet and rush him. With my hands bound behind me, it wasn't like he would let me get close enough to tear his throat out with my teeth. That didn't stop me from thinking about it, though. You're not wrong. 
He nodded, looking pleased. So, here we are. I guess you know what happens next. You're making a mistake. I didn't even speak to Martinez. I didn't even know he was the one. Ain't my mistake to make. This comes all the way from Dracacus. He wants to cut the cancer out, and unfortunately for you, that includes present company. Killing me won't make any difference. The senator has... He cut me off. We're taking care of the senator, too. He held his wrist up to the light and squinted at the dial on his watch. You might just outlive him, in fact. You can't do this. Do what? Murphy asked, affecting confusion. This never happened. He walked around the back of the truck and slammed the tailgate. I knew the flatbed would be packed with explosives, together with whatever extras Murphy had just finished hooking up. I wondered how long he would give himself to get clear of the scene. He cast his eyes over the flatbed again just to make sure he hadn't forgotten anything, and then walked back across the garage. He crouched down, gripped the edge of the panel door, and yanked it up. The panels concertinaed up into the space above, letting the full glare of the morning sun in. Murphy took a step outside, paused, and turned back to me. He was silhouetted against the glare, his face unreadable. Sorry, Hoss. You know this is nothing personal. And then he took another step back and hurled the door back down again. I heard it rattle again as he padlocked it behind him. I didn't waste any time on a comeback. I needed every iota of energy I could muster. With all purpose in my life reduced to the basic survival impulse, my head cleared and the aches in my body seemed to vanish. I knew the odds of me making it out in one piece were slim, so I didn't think about the big picture. Break it down into stages and focus on one thing at a time. Stage one, get my hands into play. I tugged on the cuffs again to check the give and thought there might just be enough. I sat back on the chain, worked it down as far as I could manage on the backs of my thighs, and then brought my knees up to my chest, straining until I managed to pass my wrists under my feet. With my hands in front of me, I took a second to get a look at the cuffs and confirmed I wasn't doing anything about them in here. There were no hacksaws in sight, and even if there had been, the high tensile steel would take me twenty minutes to cut through. I was betting Murphy had left a lot less than twenty minutes on the clock. Stage two. I crossed the room to the back of the truck and brought my hands up to open the tailgate. I saw exactly what I had expected to see. Blocks of standard packaged C4 explosive and a detonator. If it had been a movie... There would have been a helpful digital clock with red numbers telling me how long I had to defuse it. Instead, I had a small black detonator wired up to a smaller block of C4 and a gut feeling for how long Murphy would have given himself to get away. Two minutes max. I wasn't sure I could do anything helpful in that time. I angled my body over to look at the device, forcing myself to be thorough. It didn't look like there was anything fancy, no booby traps. This wasn't my area of expertise, but I had a rudimentary knowledge of demolitions. I tried the most obvious thing first, disconnecting the wire that fed from the battery. The light stayed on, meaning that, as I'd expected, there was an integrated battery backup. I glanced around, hoping to see a screwdriver or anything with a point small enough to fit the screws in the back, and came up with nothing. Shit. This thing was going off any second now, along with the car bomb and the bombs in the adjacent garages, and there was nothing I could do about it. The car bomb was overkill, of course. Just the block of C4 attached to Murphy's detonator would be more than enough to... And then, an idea occurred to me. I picked up the detonator and its smaller block of C4 and ran with it over to the door... I jammed it in the farthest corner from the pickup, right at the half-inch gap where the door met the ground. It wasn't even half a chance. 
The likelihood was the blast would be enough to ignite the explosives in the car and level the whole garage, along with most of the neighborhood. But if I could shore up just enough junk around the device, and if the panel doors gave way immediately... I stopped thinking, started moving the crates of parts and any other junk I could lay my hands on in front of the device, hoping that the crates weren't full of anything explosive. I was hampered by the cuffs, and I had to put all of my weight on my hands to push the crates across the floor. At the back of my head, I started to calculate how long since Murphy had left. There were a couple of layers of crates in front of the door now, and it looked hopelessly inadequate. I'd started to push the final crate over when I heard a short beeping sound. I scrambled to my feet and hurled myself across the garage as the gaps between the beeps reduced to a single monotonous tone. I slammed myself to the ground behind the rear tire of the pickup. I covered my ears, opened my mouth, and jammed my eyes shut. I had a split second to note the irony of taking cover behind a giant car bomb when time ran out. I registered a wave of fierce heat and blinding light before the pressure wave hit like an express train. When I opened my eyes again, the world had gone silent this time instead of dark. But I was comforted that there still appeared to be a world. The entire opposite side of the garage had disappeared. A loose flap of corrugated iron hanging down where there used to be a wall and a door and a pile of crates and assorted junk. I got to my feet and circled the pickup. It was blackened on the other side and the windows had all blown out but the explosives hadn't detonated. Obviously. I started to move toward the hole in the wall. I had to get the hell out of here. Murphy wouldn't be coming back to inspect his work, but the blast would be attracting plenty of other attention, and I didn't relish the idea of explaining to the first responders what a dazed American was doing setting off a bomb in a suburban garage. And then I felt a stab of pain and realized there was an even more pressing problem. There was a deep gash in my right side. A sharp wedge of wood, shrapnel from one of the crates, was embedded in my side. I reached down and moved it. It hurt like hell, but it didn't seem to be in too deep. I hoped that meant it looked worse than it was. I took a grip and started to pull it out. A couple of inches of crimson-stained wood slid out of the hole in my side. I bit down on my bottom lip hard enough to draw more blood in an effort to stifle the yell as I pulled the wooden blade out of my stomach. Pressing my still-cuffed hands hard against the wound, I headed for the hole in the wall and out into the light. Chapter 45 Minnesota. Bryant kept his mouth shut and his eyes focused dead ahead on the sign two inches in front of him that said, no smoking. This was it. This time, it really was it. He was going to die in a cramped airless box looking at a fucking no smoking sign. But then the man with the scar on his face started talking. He pressed the barrel of his gun a little harder against Bryant's neck first and chuckled as he winced. I bet you hadn't planned on this when you got out of bed yesterday, he said. No kidding, Bryant said. The man with the scar drew the gun back a little and yanked Bryant around by gripping the collar of his shirt. He nodded his head at the seat by the window, indicating that he should sit down. The whole time, he kept his pistol trained on Bryant. Bryant took two careful steps across the small space and sat down, keeping his eyes on the gun. He was no firearms expert, so he had no idea what make it was. He had seen enough cop shows to know that the cylinder on the end was a silencer, meaning that the man with a look of sadistic amusement in his eyes wouldn't need to worry about making too much noise. He could empty the gun into Brian's head while the passengers mere inches away on either side continued their peaceful dreams uninterrupted. 
Bryant was as scared as he had ever been in his life. Even as this crossed his mind, he realized that the exact same thought had occurred to him at least three or four times in the previous 24 hours. Each time, it had been no exaggeration, but each time, that level of terror had been quickly superseded. When he had passed through the doors and seen the man with the gun approaching, the man who so clearly recognized him, he thought he was dead. When he had been forced to identify the roomette he and Blake had shared and then been bundled through the door, he'd assumed that his stay of execution would expire as soon as they caught Blake. He had remained convinced of that during the brief questioning. They had asked him where Blake was, and he had replied that he didn't know. And then the other two had left, the one with the close-cropped reddish hair and the creepy one, the one with glasses who had stared at him the whole time without saying a damn word. But now the demeanor of the one with the scar had changed slightly. He had been the most aggressive around the others, but now he was sharing a joke, letting Bryant sit down. Did he tell you who we were? Bryant nodded slowly. He told me he used to work with you. The man with the scar on his face smiled, as though Bryant's phrasing amused him. That's right. He was good at his job, too. Damn good. He used to help us track down targets. I guess he's still doing that, although... He looked Bryant up and down appraisingly. Probably easier targets these days, huh? Bryant said nothing. They sat in silence for another couple of minutes. The man with the scar relaxed his posture a little, though his eyes and the barrel of the gun never wavered from Bryant. Did he tell you why we were looking for him? He told me you're trying to kill him. The man shrugged. That's sort of up to him. Didn't seem that way at the airport. He smiled. Sorry about that. You were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Although, I guess you wouldn't have been in that wrong place if you hadn't taken what didn't belong to you, would you? Bryant swallowed, decided to ask the question. Are you going to kill me? The man with the scar seemed to consider that. Depends how cooperative you can be. What do you mean? How much did Blake tell you about where he's going? I don't understand. Your friends have gone to get him, right? Right. You don't think they'll catch him? He has nowhere to go. You'd think, wouldn't you? He said. Trouble with Carter Blake is... He's a hard man to pin down. And believe me, this is from personal experience. We should know soon either way, I guess. Either my two friends are going to come back with Blake, or they'll come back with his body, or they're not going to come back. You don't sound like you care either way, Bryant said. No point trying to second-guess fate. By the way, I noticed you didn't answer my question. Bryant hadn't answered the question because he'd been trying to give himself time to think. This guy clearly thought there was a possibility Bryant could be of value to him, and that might be the only reason he was still breathing. He had asked where Blake was going. That could be for the reason he had given, just in case they didn't manage to catch him. Or it could mean the information was valuable in itself. The Black Book. He thought about Blake's remark about the flash drive. These people didn't just want Blake dead. They wanted a threat neutralized. If he could make the man with the scar believe he could be of value in finding Blake's planned destination, perhaps he could keep himself alive a little longer. Another gamble. This one, with life or death stakes. But what choice did he have? He told me he's... Headed back east. The man with the scar shook his head and pointed at the window with his free hand 
to remind Bryant of their direction of travel. That's pretty obvious. He told me he needs to pick something up. Is that right? An interested tone in his voice now. Bryant nodded. A flash drive. He paused and considered his words carefully. Just a bluff. You've done it a thousand times at the card table. He didn't tell me what was on it. The man's gray eyes narrowed. That's very fortunate for you. He paused and was about to say something else when he was interrupted by a rap on the door. Midnight, he called out. High noon, came the response from the other side of the door. The man with the scar nodded, and Bryant surmised it was some kind of countersign to make sure he was opening the door to the person he expected. The man with the scar got to his feet, keeping the gun on Bryant, and unlocked the door with his left hand. The man with glasses was in the corridor, along with another one Bryant recognized as the man Blake had fought a couple of cars down. The big blonde-haired guy. He had come away from that confrontation with a broken nose, the blood smeared across his top lip. He assumed this was the Kowalski he had heard the others talk about. Two things were obvious to Bryant right away. The redness of the skin on their faces and the flakes of snow on their coats told him they had somehow been outside, despite the fact the train was still very much in motion. The other thing was, Blake was not with them. Kowalski stayed in the corridor while the man with glasses squeezed into the roomette. Where's Stark? the man with the scar asked. Stop in the train. Blake? The man with the glasses didn't answer right away. His brow furrowed in consternation. When the one with the scar prompted him, he shook his head. I don't know. You don't know. He gave him a look that betrayed a hint of irritation, but when he spoke, his voice was perfectly controlled. Not for sure. Probably dead. The man with the scar's eyes widened. He glanced at Bryant for a second, as though about to share a joke with him, then thought better of it and looked back at the man with glasses. Probably, he repeated. I think we might have hit him. He fell. He jutted his head in the direction of the ceiling. From up there. You call it in? He nodded. Within two minutes, giving our coordinates. Should be enough to locate the body. If he is dead. If. The one with the glasses gave no response. Instead, he turned to Bryant, looking at his cuffed hands. His expression said Bryant was just one more problem that had to be dealt with. We'll have to take him with us. Chapter 46 the only reason I knew I wasn't dead was because I was pretty sure I would have ended up someplace warmer. I lay still for a few seconds, waiting for the pain in my back and arms to die down and for the world to stop spinning. When I started to be able to breathe normally again, I rolled over from where I had landed and wiped snow off my face. It felt like I had lost some time, but the lights on the back of the Empire Builder, a few hundred yards away, told me it had been only a minute or so since I had fallen. The lights disappeared as the track curved into the trees, and the sound of the engine and the wheels on the tracks slowly died away to nothing. All of a sudden, it was very dark and very quiet. With some trepidation, I put weight on my arms and raised myself off the ground a little. Everything seemed to be in working order. Nothing broken as far as I could tell. So how in the hell had I managed that? I drew myself up to a sitting position and looked around. I blinked a few times to acclimate my eyes to the darkness until I could make out my surroundings more clearly. I was about ten feet from the tracks 
in a pile of snow that was a little deeper than the rest of the surrounding area. I looked above me and started to piece together what had happened. The track was lined here by tall pine trees. The one directly above me had had most of its snow knocked off. I guessed that when I'd fallen from the roof, I had smashed into the soft branches of the pine tree. Lots of give, lots of kinetic energy absorbed. From there, I had fallen through the branches, which had absorbed more of my momentum, and landed in the deeper patch of snow beneath the trees. All told, it had been just enough to save my neck. I patted myself down and found I still had the phone I had taken from Kowalski, but not the gun. I remembered I had tucked it back in my belt before making the final run and wondered if I had lost it before or after I left the roof of the train. I looked around me and saw no trace of it. I got to my feet, giving myself another once-over for any injuries that might have remained unnoticed while I lay on the ground. Other than an ache along my right side where I had hit the ground, I was fine. I reminded myself that, for a couple of reasons, that was likely a temporary condition. For one thing, I probably didn't have long before company arrived. Ordinarily, leaving a moving train at a random point cross-country in the dark would have been an excellent way of making a clean escape, but not with these guys, not with the resources they could call on. The men who had followed me onto the roof had seen me plunge from the train. They would be open to the possibility I'd been killed in the fall, but they wouldn't be close to satisfied until they saw a body. The only thing in my favor was the thick clouds would make live satellite surveillance impossible. But that only reminded me of the other immediate danger. I was in the middle of God knows where, at four in the morning, in the middle of a blizzard. I cursed myself for leaving the gloves I had bought in Seattle in the roomette. Now that the immediate threat to life had passed, I realized how cold it was. I buttoned the coat and yanked the collar up to protect my neck from the freezing air. I rubbed my hands together to get the circulation going. From my extremely limited knowledge of the geography in these parts, I tried to work out exactly how dire my situation was. The last stop had been Detroit Lakes, scheduled for 3.10. The luminous dial on my watch read just after 3.40. Half an hour at roughly 50 miles an hour was 25 miles, which meant that the next stop was another 25 miles down the track. That information was academic anyway, even if it had been two miles. I couldn't follow the track unless I really wanted to make things easy for my pursuers. I knew there were small cities and towns dotted throughout Minnesota, and I just had to hope I was within range of one of them. The tall pines lined both sides of the tracks. On my side, I could see lines of trees marching back until the darkness became absolute. On the other, I could make out slivers of snow between the trees. Open ground. Perhaps somewhere I could see more of the lay of the land. I spent a few seconds kicking loose snow over the depression I'd left in the ground, knowing I could do nothing about the noticeably snow-free branches of the pine directly above it. Perhaps enough fresh snow would have fallen to disguise it by the time anyone else found the spot. When I had made my landing zone blend in as closely as possible to its surroundings, I climbed the slight incline back toward the tracks, scuffing my feet to obscure the footprints. I stepped across the tracks and jogged down the incline into the woods on the opposite side. The air was slightly warmer in the shelter of the trees, but my breath was still visible in clouds. The stand of pines extended about a hundred yards or so, and then I emerged at a field that sloped upward gently. I stopped before I hit the open snow-covered ground at the far side of the wood, and jogged along the line of the sheltered patch for a couple of minutes. There was no way to avoid leaving footprints, but it wouldn't do any harm to prevent my entrance and exit points lining up. When I had gone as far as I thought would make any difference, 
I stepped out into the field. It was hard to orient myself in the darkness, with the snow falling all around, but then a gap in the cloud cover passed under the moon, and I got enough of a glimpse of my surroundings to get me started. The field was bounded by pines on three sides. On the fourth, it sloped upward to a near horizon. I started up the hill, the deep snow making each step ten times harder than on the dry ground in the forest. The effort of lifting my feet and the all-pervading cold seemed to sap my energy the way driving a car with the pedal to the floor will drain the gas tank. What had looked like a five to ten minute hike to the top of the rise seemed to be taking me all night. The ache in my side faded into a painful stiffness as the bruising started to set in, making the going even tougher. Finally, as I got closer to the crest of the hill, I saw my first promising sign of the night. There was a slight orange glow in the night sky, the reflection of streetlights on low clouds. The sight was like a shot of adrenaline. I redoubled my pace, forging ahead to the crest of the hill. A couple of minutes later, I'd made the crest, and my hopes sank again. The land dropped into a wide valley. All around were fields and lines of trees. There was a town ahead. I could make out the small cluster of lights, but it had to be at least ten miles away. I estimated it had taken the best part of half an hour to cover a mile to this point, and I hadn't been as cold or as tired when I had started out. But the town ten miles away was all there was, so I crossed the crest of the hill and started walking down toward the valley, keeping the distant glow of salvation within sight. Chapter 47 Minnesota With Blake gone, there was no need to maintain their anonymity on the train. As soon as they had gotten Kowalski back on his feet, Stark had simply walked to the head of the train, knocked hard on the driver's door, and demanded, with the help of his Homeland Security ID, that the train be stopped. The driver, a small dark-haired woman in her late forties, was so surprised and intrigued by the break in the routine that she had gone along with the order with only the most minor of questions, questions that Stark answered easily and with an authoritative air of irritation. They were hunting a pair of suspects who had been passengers on the train. They had already taken one into custody, but the other one had managed to jump from the train, and they needed to go back to the right spot. He covered all of this in the time it took the train to slow to a gradual halt, probably a couple of miles down the line from where the driver had started applying the brake, and four or five from the area where Blake had jumped. That was all right, though. Others were on their way. Does this thing back up? Stark asked. The driver grinned indulgently and shook her head. Not unless you have a couple of hours to spend, officer, and you'd have to make the call to my boss, and no offense, but you'd need more than that little ID card. Stark left her and turned to head back down the train to Ortega, Usher, Kowalski, and their prisoner. Whoa, hold on there, the driver called after him. What do I do about this? Who do I call? Stark shrugged. We're good here. You can get on your way. She looked suddenly suspicious. What department did you say you were from again? Thank you for your cooperation, Stark said with finality, and headed back to the others. They left Bryant's hands free on the understanding that any attempt to run would only result in a bullet in one of his kneecaps, and the five of them disembarked the train and started to backtrack. It took them a few minutes just to draw level with the rearmost car of the train, which still showed no signs of getting underway again. Getting everything reset to start up again was probably a job for twenty guys, Stark thought, knowing that the driver was probably cursing him right now as she thought about explaining to her boss why she had stopped the train for a random guy waving an ID card. Usher checked the GPS coordinates and informed them they had a 5.2-mile walk ahead of them in the snow. Ortega grabbed his phone and checked in with the second team, who had been en route to the next stop. 
They were 30 minutes away from the location where Blake had jumped or fallen, maybe a little longer, depending on how much the weather slowed them down and how far off-road they had to go to reach the exact spot. The snow on the ground alongside the track was shallower and lay on top of gravel, so it was relatively easy going. They moved at a quick clip, just below a jog. Bryant moaned about the pace a couple of times before Ortega slapped him across the back of the head and reminded him he was low on options. In the end, they made the coordinates only ten minutes behind the second team, who had had to backtrack a significant distance to find a route through the woods. Their two cars were parked alongside the tracks, the headlights dazzling in the darkness. Stark heard the barking of the dogs from a couple hundred yards away as their handler finished removing them from the off-road vehicle. As Stark and the others approached, the passenger door of the nearest vehicle opened, and a tall figure in a long coat got out. It took Stark a second to recognize Murphy, silhouetted against the lights and the falling snow. What kept you? I like being fashionably late. The second team had already identified the landing area. One of the tall pine trees at the side of the track had its snow cover noticeably depleted, as though a very discerning gust of wind had hit it hard recently, while ignoring all of its brethren. With that signpost, they found that the snow directly beneath showed signs of impact and of an attempt to cover tracks. There was no blood. The pair of black Doberman strained on their leashes, their eyes on the woods across the tracks. Murphy watched the dogs with interest. He bent down to look one of them in the eyes, baring his teeth in a grin. The dog emitted a low, pissed-off growl. He straightened up and looked across the track to the woods beyond. Let's run this rabbit down. Chapter 48 I had been walking for about an hour when I reached the stream. It bounded a line of trees ahead of me, cutting diagonally across my path. It was too wide to jump, and I didn't relish the idea of wading through the freezing water. I was shaking underneath my coat as it was. My hands were jammed into my pockets, but I had lost the feeling in my fingers. I knew I was in trouble. If I gave in to the screaming urge in my joints to stop walking, to sit down and rest, it would be fatal. So I started to walk along the bank in the direction of the flow. Perhaps the stream would narrow farther along, or maybe there would be a bridge. Where there was a bridge, there would be a road. How far had I come? It was impossible to say. The snow continued to fall, making it difficult to judge the ground I'd covered. The only sounds accompanying me for the last hour had been my breathing, the sound of my footsteps in the snow, and the noise of my pulse thudding in my head. When a new sound echoed across the landscape from far behind me, I thought it was my imagination at first, a trick of exhaustion. But then I stopped and listened. Barking. Not the barking of a single guard dog at an isolated farmhouse. Hunting dogs. I looked at the water. It would be freezing, would hasten the onset of hypothermia, but I didn't have a choice. I tensed and jumped in, barely feeling the cold as the water covered my legs below the thighs. I splashed through the stretch of deep water until I reached the shallows on the other side. I started along the edge of the water. There were enough loose rocks and branches that the snow had fallen unevenly, making any tracks I left indistinct. My steps became more faltering as the freezing dampness bit into my legs, and a couple of times I almost stumbled headlong back into the water. When I had gone a reasonable distance from the spot I'd crossed, I started to look for a place where I could climb onto the bank, and then I saw the bridge. It was a narrow, humpback bridge, its walls covered with snow. I hurried to the edge of the bridge and climbed up the bank, a narrow road led out from the woods, turning into a plain strip of white as it emerged from cover. I stopped at the side of the road for breath and listened. 
I could still hear the barking. It was a ways off, but getting closer. I hoped the stream would give them trouble following the scent, but I wasn't betting on it. I steeled myself to keep going, but just as I was about to start walking again, I heard a sound, different from the barking, more regular, a low, droning noise. An engine. I shrank back into cover, behind the parapet, and watched the road, considering my options. Could it be more of them? A pincer movement from the opposite direction. Anything was possible. On the other hand, I wouldn't last much longer out here. A moment later, headlights appeared through the trees. The engine was louder now. It sounded a little rough, in need of tuning. As I watched, a pickup truck appeared out of a bend in the road fifty yards into the woods. I could stay behind the bridge, or I could take my chances. The biting cold wetness around my legs made the decision for me. I stepped out onto the road and walked forward, raising my hand as the headlights washed over me. Chapter 49 The pickup rolled to a stop beside me, the wipers working hard to clear the snow on the windshield. In the rainbow-shaped gap over the driver's side, I could see an old man behind the wheel. He was the only person in the vehicle as far as I could make out. I approached the passenger door and glanced inside, seeing no one else in the car. The old guy nodded at the door impatiently. I pulled the handle and swung the passenger door open. Thanks for stopping, I said, hearing my voice stutter through chattering teeth. Well, don't just stand there, son. You're letting the cold in. I was reassured when I heard the unmistakable Minnesotan accent. Lots of long vowels. Gratefully, I slid in beside him. The heat blasting from the dash felt incredible. I was chilled to the bone, so I wouldn't feel the full benefit for some time. But already, my face was beginning to regain some of its feeling. So, what the hell are you doing out here on a night like this? He demanded as I shut the door. His voice was caught between annoyance and curiosity. I guessed he was in his early seventies. He was wrapped up warm and his wrinkled face was covered by a straggly gray beard. Car broke down. Three words at a time was about all I could manage, which was good, as it saved me coming up with a more elaborate excuse. Jesus, he remarked. Ain't you heard of Triple A? I grimaced and shook my head. Flat tire? he asked. I got a jack if you need. How far down the road you parked? I shook my head. Think I broke Axel. Go back in morning. Can you g g g g I kept stuttering around the G, but he caught my drift. Give you a ride? He nodded. Reckon I can do better than that, son. Maybe only a little better, but better. My place isn't too far. Hell, I'll let you out up in Stockton right now. Might as well put a bullet in your head. No place to shelter this time of night. First bus doesn't leave until seven on a Saturday, and that one don't come back this way. I'm grateful, I said. Name's Preston. Sam Preston. Sam took his right hand from the wheel and held it out. I took it with some difficulty. He shivered at the coldness of my hand, and his brow creased in concern. Damn, son! Jerry Robinson, I said. Sam turned in the road and started back the way he'd come. After we'd gone a little way and I'd started to regain the power of speech and warmed up a little, I asked him what he was doing up this time of night. I'm a light sleeper, son. Don't sleep much these days. And I heard those dogs. Sam asked me a few more questions about my breakdown as we drove, 
and I answered as nonspecifically as possible, hoping he wasn't trying to catch me out. He lived in an old farmhouse a couple of miles from the bridge. As we got out of the car, I heard the barking of the dogs again from much farther off now. I tensed at the noise. I saw Sam watching me with interest. I covered my reaction by rubbing my arms, pretending they had stiffened during the car journey. He told me I was welcome to use the shower and found me some of his old clothes to borrow, both of which I received gratefully. The fit wasn't perfect. He was an inch or two shorter than me and a little thicker around the waist, but all in all, I'd been very lucky. It was only now in the stove-heated warmth of the house that I realized just how lucky. If Sam hadn't happened by at that moment, it was a dead cert that either the cold or the dogs would have done for me. You can rest up on the couch tonight, I reckon, he said, indicating a well-loved brown leather couch that had been patched multiple times. Tomorrow we'll call Dave Marshall over in Stockton and see about getting you towed. The couch looked inviting, but I knew it wasn't to be. I had a rendezvous in Chicago in a little less than 14 hours, and I didn't want to miss it. I would need Banner's help if I was to get back home before Winterlong caught up with me. Actually, Sam, I'm in kind of a rush. I'm grateful for the offer, but I need to get back on the road. He said nothing, waited for me to continue, as though I would need a better excuse than that. Kind of a life-or-death thing, in fact. He said nothing for a minute his eyes unwavering in the flickering light from the wood burner. You know, that road hits a dead end half a mile from the bridge. A hundred years ago, it used to go all the way to Greenville, I guess, before the railroad cut through. No way to get onto that road coming from that direction. Your car didn't really break down, did it? and your name's not really Robinson. I shook my head slowly. I'm sorry I misled you. I may be old, but I'm not senile. Who's chasing you, son? How do you know somebody's chasing me? It's the only reason you'd pass up a warm couch on a night like this. And besides, I told you, I heard the dogs. A pack of them. Trained, hungry, hunting dogs. Not much to hunt out there in weather like this. Not anything, really, except maybe for you. I smiled ruefully. I'm sorry, Sam, you're right about the dogs. Somebody is chasing me. Somebody I don't want to risk leading to your door. It's not the cops, if that's what you're thinking. Figured that. Nearest prison is fifty miles away, and you don't got the look of an escaped con. I wasn't sure at first, but... He looked me up and down again. Well, when I saw the shape you were in, I decided I was on the side of the man running, not the man hunting. Does that make sense? I nodded. And, truth to tell... I make up my mind about a fellow pretty quick, and I've decided you're an okay guy, Robinson, or whatever your name is. But that doesn't mean I'm about to let you walk back out there. I opened my mouth to protest, but he waved a hand to stop me. Stockton's ten miles away. There's a bus station. Can you get to where you're headed from there? I think so. All right. The bus for St. Paul leaves at seven. You take my truck. You'll have plenty of time to make it. Just park it by the general store and put the keys through the mail slot. I can get them back from Eppy Davis in the morning. He tossed me the keys, and I caught them. I stared down at them in my palm, still red from the cold. Why? because Eppy delivers my groceries on a Saturday and she can take me back into town. I shook my head, 
Why are you helping me? Sam looked as though he hadn't considered the question until now. He thought on it for a second, and then shrugged. Good to be neighborly, and like I said, you seem like an okay fella. Two hot cups of coffee later, and I was behind the wheel of Sam's pickup. He'd told me the road only went one place, so I followed it at a steady thirty miles an hour, taking care in the snow and constantly checking the landscape for men with dogs and flashlights. I saw nothing for the whole ten miles. If I was lucky, the dogs would have lost my scent at the river. Perhaps the men chasing me would think I'd fallen in and been carried downstream. Either way, if the dogs picked the scent up again, it would be lost at the point I got into the pickup, and the tree cover meant there were no tracks in the snow. Sam's house was outside any realistic search area for a man on foot, so I didn't think he would be troubled tonight. Later, I would make sure they knew I was out of the area, but for tonight, it would be better if they thought I was dead. I made Stockton at half past six. It was a one stoplight town. The bus station was a bench at the side of the road with a schedule fixed to a post. I kept going and found the general store a little farther ahead. I turned into the lot, parked the truck, and wiped the steering wheel and the gear shift down. Then I locked up and put the keys in the mailbox of the general store, as Sam had asked. Thirty minutes later, I boarded the bus to St. Paul. The only other passenger was a teenage girl with a backpack who kept her headphones on and her eyes pointed out of the window at the dark pre-dawn landscape. The heating was lousy, but it was a lot better than being out there. I wrapped my coat around me like a blanket, put my head against the window, and let myself drift off to sleep with the motion of the bus. Chapter 50 Bryant didn't know how long he had been locked in the small, dingy motel room. He was exhausted, but the combination of the hard plastic chair and the flickering fluorescent light seeping through the blinds conspired to deny sleep. He didn't know exactly where he was. All he knew was that somehow his situation had actually gone downhill since the point where he was facing a lengthy jail sentence. After the forced march back along the railroad tracks, he had been handed over to another two men with clothes and demeanor similar to that of the four on the train. He was bundled into a black SUV with one of the men sitting in the back with him, while the other drove them cross-country until they hit a dirt track. The track led to a small country road, which led to a larger country road, which led to a highway, which eventually led to a town and then another. From the signs they had passed, Bryant knew they were still somewhere in Minnesota. They sped through a series of small towns before slowing their pace and pulling into the parking lot of a beat-up motel. Before he had time to draw breath, the door had been flung open by another man and he had been hustled inside. He only had time for brief impressions, an almost deserted parking lot covered in a blanket of snow, a red, white, and blue neon sign with some of the letters missing. The rooms were arranged in a row facing the lot. The two men took him to the room at the far end and locked the door behind them. Boards had been securely screwed over the front-facing window and even the small window in the bathroom. And now he was alone with his thoughts, wondering how in the hell he was going to get out of this situation. Nobody in the world knew where he was, he realized with grim humor that this very same thought had comforted him just a couple of days before. But this was different. Now it was looking likely that no one would ever know where he was again. He wondered what Jasmine would think as the months and years passed. Most likely she would assume he had simply disappeared with his illicit retirement bonus. Alyssa would grow up believing that her father hadn't cared enough to stick around or even to contact her again. Thinking about that future scenario was more painful even than the contemplation of his imminent demise had been. Instead, he tried to focus on the here and now. 
He considered the men in whose custody he suddenly found himself. He already knew they wouldn't hesitate to use lethal force. Blake hadn't been particularly chatty about these guys, either because he didn't want Bryant to know too much for his own good or because Blake just wasn't a particularly chatty guy. Except for that brief period back on the train, of course, when he'd opened up a little. Bryant had been wondering about that. After keeping him well and truly in the dark for more than a day, Blake had given him a couple of interesting pieces of information about himself and his plans. He wondered now how far Blake would get. He found himself hoping that he would make it all the way. The sound of a key in the lock startled Bryant, and he stood up from the chair. The door was opened, and a man he hadn't seen before stood in the doorway. The man was definitely one of them, so he knew not to raise his hopes. He was around six feet, older than the others, but a toned physique was evident beneath the suit and shirt. Sorry to keep you, he said. Bryant guessed that was an attempt at humor. The man in the suit stepped into the room and carefully locked the door behind him. Bryant tensed, his mouth suddenly dry. He tried to swallow, thinking of something to say. Was this it? He saw the next few moments in his mind's eye, like some kind of grisly home movie, the man in the suit pressing the barrel of a gun to Bryant's forehead and pulling the trigger twice. His body being discovered in the morning by some maid, hours after the men in the dark clothes had vanished into the night, as though they had never existed. The man was watching him with amusement, seeming to read his thoughts. Relax. We're not going to kill you yet. Yet? Is that a joke? That's a joke, right? The man ignored the question. He examined the duvet on the mean single bed carefully, swiped his hand across it as though removing dust, and sat down opposite Bryant. We didn't find Blake yet. Okay. I am sorry about the rough treatment, he said, sounding almost sincere this time. My boys get a little overzealous sometimes. My name's Jack Murphy. We're going to need to keep you around for a while. I told your men. He didn't tell me where he was going. Believe me when I say I wish I'd never met the guy. Two days ago, I was set up for a two million dollar payoff and a sweet retirement. Thanks to Blake, I've been shot at, dragged halfway across the country, and now I'm being held who the fuck knows where by a CIA death squad or something. He paused and reconsidered. No offense. Murphy waved away the comment amiably. The man's got a way of endearing himself to people. I'll give him that. What did he do anyway? You people have to want him bad to go to all this trouble. You could say he broke a promise, Murphy said. Or he broke a confidence, at least. The other thing is he took something that didn't belong to him and I'd like to get it back. He was talking about the black book, the flash drive Blake had told him about. Bryant made sure not to show any reaction, but he picked up on the way Murphy had said, I, rather than we. He shrugged and held his hands up. So, what do you need from me? Murphy considered the question. He put his hands on his knees and leaned forward. Blake left you behind on the train. I noticed. I mean, it's not like he had much option. But if I know him like I think I do, that's going to bother him. Bryant snorted. Hardly. Blake doesn't give a shit about me. He was going to turn me into my old boss. Headshake from Murphy. That may be the case but he went to an awful lot of trouble to keep you with him. He wanted to keep you alive, is what I'm guessing. He wanted to keep his chance at a paycheck alive, Bryant shot back, though he knew Murphy was right. Murphy straightened up and folded his arms, 
staring at him appraisingly. Ortega said you mentioned an item that we're interested in. A flash drive Blake has stashed somewhere. Shit. Bryant had completely forgotten he had let that slip. He said nothing, and Murphy waited a minute before nodding. That's right. So he did tell you something. But what else did he tell you? That was it. He said you wanted some files he took. Nothing else. You sure about that? I'm sure. Murphy looked at him for a long moment the good-humored smile slowly draining from his face until there was nothing but a dead-eyed stare. That's disappointing. I wonder if we can jog that memory, Bryant. Bryant shivered involuntarily and opened his mouth to say something. He closed it again when he realized his mind had gone utterly blank. Murphy got to his feet and took a step toward him. You've probably heard stories. Enhanced interrogation is the official term. It's got its uses, I have to admit, but I'm kind of old-fashioned. Murphy reached into his coat, and then there was a pistol in his hand. With one smooth motion, he raised it and pressed the barrel against Bryant's forehead. You're scared, right? Bryant nodded. But your head's clear. No pain distorting your thinking. No physiological desperation to tell me exactly what you think I want to hear. Just the certain knowledge that I will pull this trigger if I think you're lying to me. Bryant's eyes met Murphy's. His expression was calm, patient. It was Bryant's turn to talk now. Chapter 51 New York City Faraday sat down in front of the monitor screen and clicked on the icon to pick up the video call. The little clock in the corner told her that it was 8.56 a.m. and an hour earlier in Minnesota. More than four hours had passed since they had lost Blake, and with each minute, it became less likely the news from the team was going to be positive. The screen went black for a second, and then Stark's face appeared. He looked tired and pissed off his face reddened from the cold. We lost him. She kept her face composed. Another setback, just when they thought they were in the endgame. What happened? He had nowhere to go. He shook his head. He definitely survived the fall from the train. The dogs picked up the scent clear at the jump point. We tracked him a couple miles cross-country until they lost the footprints and the scent, like he vanished into thin air. He could still be out there, holed up somewhere. There's a lot of woodland about. Weather's still a mess. Otherwise, we could get a bird in the air with thermal imaging. Until that changes, we're working old school, dogs and flashlights. And we've already taken the casualty. What do you mean? Ortega ran into some trouble in the woods. He slipped on a concealed verge, broke his leg. He'll be fine, but we're a man down. Faraday said nothing. She trusted Stark could guess her thoughts on this latest disaster. Anything on Kowalski's phone? Stark asked, keen to change the subject. Faraday looked over at Williamson, who was tapping away on her keyboard, working on her third can of Red Bull, with two empties standing at attention. Faraday turned back to the screen and shook her head, noticing how tired she herself looked in the smaller rectangle at the bottom right. He switched it off on the train. If he still has it, he'll be too smart to turn it back on in range of a cell tower. I guess it was worth a try, Stark said with zero conviction in his voice. We have another complication, which you may not be aware of, Faraday said. There's a chance Blake may have some leverage over us. She explained about the Black Book, not mentioning that she had only become privy to this information a few hours before. Stark took the information in without comment. It didn't really change things from his point of view. They still had to find Blake. Faraday thought for a minute, 
and then came to a decision on something she'd been mulling over for the last couple of hours. We're going to release an image of Blake to the FBI, not a photograph. We'll go with a facial composite. We need some more eyes on the ground. That's an excellent idea, Stark said at once. He had been pushing for her to release more information on Blake all along. I'm glad you approve, she said, not overdoing the sarcasm. Now, what's happening with Bryant? Stark considered the question and shook his head. I don't think Blake would have told him anything useful. So what the hell do we do with him? Had it been Usher or Otega she was having this conversation with, it would have been a question she would never have asked, because she probably wouldn't like the solution they would come up with. In reality, there was no need to do anything drastic. Bryant could probably be debriefed and safely dumped at a bus station with a warning not to talk. If Stark was right, if Blake had told him nothing, he would have no idea who they were. He would have no proof even if he did. Her instinct said it was too early to make any firm decisions in that direction, though. Stark's expression seemed to say the same thing. Murphy's talking to him now. He thinks we can use him. Faraday was confused. Use him? How? He thinks Blake will deal if we let him go. You don't sound convinced. Stark nodded. That's because I'm not. This guy was a target, a job. Why would Blake give a shit about him? She thought about it. It would certainly have been easier for Blake to cut Bryant loose back in Seattle. Why hadn't he? I don't know, but Murphy might have a better insight. See where it goes. We're working on the big picture back here. There have been some promising developments. Oh, yeah? When you need to know, Stark. When you need to know. Five years ago, Kandahar, Afghanistan. The man who was not called Ahmad opened the door. When he saw my face, his dark brown eyes filled with anger, turning to shock when he saw my bloody handcuffed hands clutching the hole in my side. He glanced around the alley outside the door and then jerked his head to tell me to come in. A minute later, I was in the same back room where just a few days before I had exchanged money for information. It was too uncomfortable to sit down, so I leaned against the desk while he gave the hole in my side a cursory inspection, shaking his head. I'm going to patch you up so your insides stay in, but after that I don't ever want to see you again. Is that clear? Don't worry about that. I'll make it worth your while. This, I said, indicating the wound with my free hand. And one other thing. You push your luck, American. Whatever else you want, we discuss after we deal with that little scratch. I shook my head firmly. No. First. He persisted for a minute, insisting that my wound needed immediate treatment. He was right, but I knew the hole in my side could wait just a little longer. At last, he shook his head and gave me what I wanted, leaving me in the back room with a fresh burner cell as he went to fetch his first aid kit. I dialed the number from memory. Carol's personal cell, not her work one. I held my breath as I waited for the call to connect between continents, and then held it a little longer as I heard one ring, two, three. The pain in my side was utterly forgotten. The only thing in the world for me was that crackly electronic buzz. On the fourth ring, the call was picked up. Hello? Carol, it's me. There was a pause, and I realized... I hadn't thought through exactly what I was going to say. While I was coming up with something, she spoke again. Where are you? Her voice sounded a little strange, out of it. Then I remembered it was late in New York, going on midnight. I'll tell you later. 
This is really important. I need you to get out of your apartment and... She said my name. And all of a sudden I realized that it wasn't the time zone or the quality of the connection that made her sound off. She had been crying. I'm not in my apartment. I'm on my way to... I thought you were calling about... About... About what? Haven't you seen the news? The news? It's on every channel. The senator's been shot. His wife's dead. He's in surgery, but it doesn't look good. Wait a minute. What do you mean I need to get out? Why were you calling if you didn't know? The words caught in my mouth. I didn't know what to say or how to say it. Are you still there? I think I know the people who did this. I think you could be in danger, too. There's a... What the hell did you do? Who are you? Listen to me. I'll explain later, I swear. The people who did this just tried to kill me, too. They know about you and me. I don't know if they'll come after you, but we can't take the risk. You have to disappear. Just for a little while. This is your fault. Oh, my God, this is... She sounded dazed, like she'd been hit a second time while reeling from an initial blow. Carol! I yelled. Listen to me. You can hate me later, but right now we've got to get you someplace safe. Where are you right now? I'm with Claire from the office. We're on 8th, headed down to the office. It just seemed like... Have her drop you off. Tell her to go home. What are you talking about? I gave her the address of an apartment building in Hell's Kitchen. Made her repeat it back to me. Get into the lobby. The mail slot at the far right on the bottom row is unlocked. There's a key taped to the roof of the slot. The key is for apartment 62. Are you getting this? What are you? I'm not going anywhere. John would... You can't help him right now. I need you to listen to me. The people who did this are very dangerous, and the office is the last place you should be right now. I thought about Carson's file the pictures, names, and dates. They would make sure that disappeared, coordinated with the hit. They had probably visited the office already. But I wasn't taking the chance. Carol started to protest more, and I cut her off. You don't ever have to see me again. You don't ever have to speak to me again. But do this one thing for me. There was a long pause. I heard a female voice in the background. Are you okay? Carol didn't answer. With an effort of will, I gave her time to think without saying anything else. Eventually, she spoke. Okay. This one thing. I felt a surge of relief. Thank you. Tell your friend to stay away from the office, too. Get the police to clear it first. You remember the address? I've got it. Tell me again. I've got it. Good. Get rid of your cell and go there now. Try to stay put until I get back. Back from where? I'll tell you. No! Her voice suddenly lost its dazed quality and I felt the full force of her anger directed at me. Not later. Tell me now. Where are you? Who the hell are you? I took a breath. Afghanistan. It'll take me a few days to get home. She made a noise that sounded like she was trying for a sarcastic laugh, but it came out more like a sigh. You didn't answer my other question. It was a good question. Who was I anyway? Maybe I don't know the answer right now, I said. I'll see you in a few days. 
Stay safe. There was a silence for a moment, as though she was thinking of something to say. And then she settled on a simple, Goodbye. As the line went dead, I took the phone from my ear and looked at the blank display. Then I glanced down at the bloody mess of my shirt, my left hand clutching the wound in my side. Now that the message had been delivered, the pain rushed back with a vengeance. I looked up, and I saw Ahmad had returned with bandages and disinfectant. You look even worse than you did a couple minutes ago. I nodded. Feels that way. Chapter 52 St. Paul, Minnesota The bus got into St. Paul just before half past nine in the morning. I had managed to sleep for most of the journey, although somehow that had made me feel even worse than I had at the outset. I got off the bus with the rest of the passengers who had accumulated during the trip from Stockton. After checking the options for the next leg of my journey, I put some distance between myself and the bus station. I was still 400 miles from Chicago, and I had less than $100 left. I invested some of that in buying another pair of gloves and a baseball cap. Then I used the last 10 bucks to buy coffee and a cheeseburger and fries at a bustling travel diner. The calories helped, replenishing my energy after the long night, and I started to go over the next few moves I had planned. I would need more money. There was no getting around that. I didn't think Winterlong would have been able to make any link between me and the backup checking account I could access with an ATM card, but I wasn't 100% certain either. There was only one way to find out. I had almost finished eating when someone changed the channel on the TV attached to the wall of the diner. I stopped chewing when a familiar-looking face appeared on the screen. The caption said, SeaTac shooting, and above that was a computer-aided artist's impression of my face. The pic had clearly used my driver's license ID photo as a starting point, but I knew they had deliberately not used the picture itself. That would have made it too easy for a helpful police or federal facial recognition expert to match it to my DMV record, get my name, and start to unravel the whole thing. With my newly close-cropped hair and three days of stubble, I didn't look a whole lot like my computer-generated avatar, but still, it was not an encouraging development. After I finished eating, I crossed the street to a branch of Western Union and presented the card to the smiling clerk, asking how much I could withdraw in cash today. As I watched her tap on the keyboard to call up my account, I had a flashback of the airline ticket clerk's sudden change of demeanor when she typed the name from my driver's license into the computer. It would have been safer to use the ATM outside, I guessed, but it would also have limited me to withdrawing a couple of hundred. At least, this clerk wouldn't be typing the name Carter Blake. You can withdraw $1,000 standard today, Mr. Grant, or up to 10000 with two forms of ID. I shrugged as though that was no problem. Go for the thousand, I said. I don't have my license with me. She smiled. Certainly, sir, and quickly produced ten crisp hundred-dollar bills, sliding them under the glass partition. Twenty minutes later, I was looking at another face behind glass at another counter, this one at the Union Depot Transit Center. This face was male, middle-aged, and unsmiling. He acknowledged my request with a curt nod and provided me with a one-way ticket on the Megabus to Chicago. I waited until the driver was behind the wheel before I got on, watching the bus ramp for anyone who seemed too interested in the other passengers. I took a free seat at the back and pulled the brim of my cap down low. The bus started to pull out exactly on time, 24 minutes to 11. Chapter 53. New York City. You wanted to see me? Williamson hovered by the door, her eyes pointed at the carpet. She looked a little uncomfortable away from her natural element. Faraday didn't make a habit of inviting people into her office. Murphy 
was generally the only regular visitor. Faraday looked up. First of all, I wanted to thank you for the work you've been doing, particularly over the last couple of days. Williamson nodded. I'm making progress with the house. I just need... This isn't about that. Williamson stopped. She looked up for the first time, waiting for Faraday to continue. This is about something else, and it goes without saying it is not to be discussed with anyone outside this room. That includes Murphy. Especially Murphy, she thought. Okay. The fingerprints hit in Iowa that was deleted. Is there anything else like that in the system? Williamson looked confused. Any other fingerprint hits? Anything that's been purged? Williamson smiled. You're asking me to find things that aren't there. Is that a problem? Williamson thought it over. It's a challenge. The DR-17 was a lucky break. I had to reverse engineer the trail, go back to the deletion. I could only do that because I knew what wasn't there. So the first question I'd need to ask is, what else isn't there? Faraday considered. How did one find something that no one knew was missing? The fingerprint hit was an unusual event. It had allowed Williamson to trace the deletion, and that deletion had suggested a pattern of behavior. If Trakakis hid that, perhaps he'd hidden other things. Look at the patterns. Eyes only reports for the director. Look for anything different. Anything that looks like a gap. I don't have... Faraday typed a password into her computer and stood up, offering Williamson her seat. You have full access now. Level 12. Williamson's eyes lingered on Faraday for a second and then dropped to the screen. She sat down and began to hit the keys. Ten minutes later, Williamson sat back from the screen, her brow furrowed. Well? She shook her head. If you need details, files, I can't give you anything. But you can give me something. She shrugged. Dates, file sizes. There was a subfolder in AAR restricted to Dracacus's user ID. Someone with level 12 access purged everything from it a year ago. When, exactly? December 31st. The date of Dracacus's suicide. It had been his last act. The opposite of a suicide note. Instead of leaving a last testament behind, maybe he had erased one. How long will it take you to recover the deleted files? Williamson shook her head. Can't be done, she said firmly. Faraday was taken aback. She had never heard Williamson say that before. Generally, everything could be done. It just required time and resources. What do you mean? You retrieved the fingerprint hit. That was different. That came through the main server. It left a trail. This was completely local to Drakakis. Technology-wise, it's as close as he could get to keeping it in a notebook, then burning it. We're lucky he carried out the deletions in this office. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see that there was once a folder. Everything's gone. Purged. She hit a couple of keys, and an exported CSV file appeared on the screen. Columns showing creation dates and file sizes and deletion dates. The date was identical in every row. 2014, 12, 31, 23, 37. A man who was about to die had cared about it. You say this... Ghost folder was in the local AAR file? Williamson nodded. After action reports. It was customary for these to be edited, polished, before they went anyplace else, even at the classified level. But this was another level even more locked down. 
This is what really happened, Faraday said to herself. Excuse me? Thank you, Williamson. That'll be all. She nodded again and left. Faraday kept looking at the door for a minute after it closed, thinking about the tear-shaped bloodstain beneath the new carpet. She opened the secure file space on her desktop computer and started going back through, comparing the dates of the deleted files with the final classified AARs on her system. Every one of the deleted files corresponded with a logged AAR, which meant that the files she and her superiors could see were not the whole story. She looked at the list, identifying locations just by the reference number. Bakuba and Mosul in 2009, Kandahar, 2010. And then she noticed that one of the files did not have a corresponding record on the official list. But the date was within days of the Kandahar mission, the mission on which Carter Blake had gone AWOL. Chapter 54, Chicago. The bus from St. Paul to Chicago was scheduled to take a little more than eight hours. Despite the weather warnings, the snow had abated for a few hours. It was like Mother Nature was taking a deep breath in preparation for the storm to come. At first I was sure I would be too wired to sleep, but as the bus joined I-94 and headed east, I began to feel drowsy. With some time to kill, I didn't fight it. As I slept, we passed out of Minnesota and into Wisconsin. I awoke as the bus made a stop in Madison and then snoozed lightly for another hour. I forced myself to wake up fully at five o'clock. The sky had been dull and gray all day, a kind of perpetual twilight that now began to darken as night approached. The snow began to fall again, and all around us, the traffic began to slow. I glanced at my watch and hoped we wouldn't fall too far behind. Just after seven o'clock, we came into view of Chicago. The memories surged within me, as I saw the skyline rising up ahead of us. All at once it seemed like years since I'd last been here, and like yesterday. We made it into the city only a half hour behind schedule. The final stop was at Van Buren Street. But as the bus passed the Willis Tower, I got up and made my way down the aisle to the front of the bus. Mind if I hop off here? I asked the driver. I mind a lot, pal, he began and then he turned his head and saw the hundred-dollar bill in my hand. I hopped onto the sidewalk on South Wacker and glanced around the street to make sure nobody was paying me any undue attention. I bought a map and a large black coffee from a 7-Eleven and worked out that my destination was only a couple of miles away, a quick ride in a taxi, but I had spent way too long sitting down. The walk would let me work the ache out of my legs and get some fresh air into my lungs. I headed west and south, making my way down to West Roosevelt Road and crossing the park. I reached my destination with two minutes to spare. The name on the sign had changed since last time, but there was still a coffee shop there. It looked like it was in the process of emptying for the night. The lights at the intersection turned red, and I waited for the evening traffic to bunch up before I crossed the street and pushed the door of the coffee shop inward. I couldn't remember what it had been called the last time I'd been here, but it was named McGrady's now. The interior decor had changed, dark wood was out, bright orange walls were in. I cast my eyes around the interior, seeing lots of empty tables. I breathed a sigh of relief when I saw a familiar face in the back of the shop. Special Agent Elaine Banner was sitting with her back to the wall, with a good view of the doorway and the window looking onto the park. She had spotted me first, of course, and was looking at me with an expression that was hard to read. It wasn't quite a welcoming smile. A waitress called out a greeting. 
I nodded and pointed at where Banner was seated to let her know I didn't need to be directed to a table. As I pulled out the chair across from Banner, the waitress asked if she could get me anything, and I ordered another coffee. Banner had a bottle of sparkling mineral water in front of her, half of it poured into a glass. We waited for the waitress to leave, watching each other over the table. I was smiling. Banner still wasn't quite. Hi, I said. Hi. You look great, I said, meaning it. Banner was 32 years old, 5'8", slim, shoulder-length brown hair, styled slightly differently since I'd last seen her, incredibly dark brown eyes that gave you the nagging sensation that she knew what you were thinking. She didn't return the compliment, and although I hadn't looked in a mirror in a while, I thought I knew why. What happened to your friend? She asked, her eyes flicking to the street outside, and then back to me. We ran into some problems. We got separated. I'm trying to fix that. Banner shook her head. Jesus, Blake. Do I even want to know? Every field office got a want sheet today with a composite on it that looks very familiar. She slid a sheet of paper in front of me, the same facial composite I had seen on the news in St. Paul. No name, I asked. She shook her head. Very vague. You're wanted for questioning in connection with the airport shooting, and there's a national security implication. You're not believed to be a live terrorist threat, which has to be the nicest thing anyone's said about you lately. I do my best. Banner sipped her glass of water to cover up a smile and then looked at me expectantly. Thank you for doing this, I said. Not a problem. I don't think we should leave here together, so I'm going to give you an address. It's an apartment we used for witnesses. It's not on the regular rotation, and I trust everyone who knows about it. You can hide out for a couple of days. Give yourself a chance to... I shook my head. The safe house was for Bryant. I have to keep moving. Blake, whoever is after you means business. No offense, but you look like shit. You need to lie low for a while. Get some rest. I glanced down at the worn clothes I had borrowed from Sam Preston and slept in and ran my fingers over the three days of stubble on my face. She wasn't catching me at my best. I can't do that. Chances are they'd find me and it can't come back to you. I need to finish this. She shook her head slowly and a frustrated smile appeared on her face. You know, I had this conversation in my head before I got here, and a couple of times while I was waiting for you. I returned the smile. How did it go? Pretty much exactly like this. More small talk first, though. I'm sorry. How's Annie? Her smile became warmer at the mention of her daughter. Ten, going on forty-seven. She's doing well in school, almost never has nightmares anymore. Works good. Donaldson is retiring next year. I'm very busy, thank you. Yes, it has been a mild winter up until now, but how about this weather? There. We've caught up now. We'll skip the part where you tell me nothing about yourself. Are we at the part where you threaten not to help me? Will it do any good? I shook my head. She sighed and sat back in her chair. All right, then. She reached down and picked up a backpack by one strap, handing it to me under the table. I took it and glanced behind me to make sure the waitress wasn't hovering around before I unzipped it and examined the contents. A change of clothes, jeans and a sweater, an envelope with $500 inside, a cell phone, and a Glock 19 with three spare magazines. I closed the zipper and put my hands back on the table. She had laid two keys on the table. That one's for the safe house, she said, indicating the one on the left. 
Are you sure? I put my hand down on top of the key on the right. Thank you, I said. She put her hand on top of mine. I can't go any further down this road, Blake. I know that. I don't want you to. Are you sure about this? That it's the only way? I sighed and thought about my answer for a minute. I had to be honest with her. I owed her that much. I don't know, I said. Maybe not. Maybe I could go to ground, spend the rest of my life looking over my shoulder. It might not be the rest of my life, even. Things change. Priorities change. Maybe in time they would forget about me. If you decided to disappear, I think you could manage it pretty well, Banner said quietly. Perhaps it's worth a try. I thought I disappeared before. And they found me, because I was out there. Eventually, you have to stick your head out of the door and see the world again. I could hide for a while, but eventually, I'd be back in the same position. I had a friend who thought he was safe. He went to the ends of the earth. Pretty much literally. Des Moines? Siberia. They found him, and they put two bullets in his head. And now he's another unclaimed body that nobody misses. That could be me in a year. You do it your way, and it could be you tomorrow. That's the difference, Banner. It would be on my terms. Her dark brown eyes fixed on mine and held them for a long minute. This time it felt like the other way around. I knew what she was thinking that she should volunteer to come with me to help. But I knew she wouldn't, just like she knew I wouldn't let her. She had a daughter, a career, things I wouldn't jeopardize even if I thought her coming with me would make any difference. She was putting her neck on the line enough as it was. We had spent only a short time together and hadn't spoken since. But all the same, we knew each other too well and respected each other too much to indulge in the meaningless bullshit of that phony discussion. She lifted her hands from mine. I curled my hand around the key, palmed it, and slipped it into my pocket. I left the other key, the one for the safe house, where it was. Take care of yourself, Blake. I felt a sudden chill. Elaine Banner, didn't know that that was pretty much the last thing I had said to Coop three nights ago. And I answered in the same way. I always do. Chapter 55 Minnesota Stark's cell phone rang just after 11 p.m. He and Murphy were in one of the two rooms in the motel. Ortega was in the adjoining room guarding Bryant. They had made the decision to stay put for the night, just in case they got a lead on Blake, or his body, in the vicinity of his last known location. The rest of the Minnesota team had split. Half of them were headed for the biggest urban conurbation in the area, the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. The others had gone straight ahead to Chicago. In the absence of any other information, it made sense to cover the intended destination of Blake's train. Stark reached for his phone and looked at the display, his eyes widening when he saw what was on it. The number of the caller, the first few digits denoting a cell rather than a landline, plus a single letter, K, Kowalski's phone. Murphy looked up from the small desk, where he was in the middle of his tenth game of solitaire. A jack of spades poised in his hand, midway to the table. Are you going to answer that? It's him, on Kowalski's phone. Murphy said nothing, but a satisfied grin appeared on his face. He tossed Stark the compact digital recorder they had ready for this occasion. Stark caught it one-handed and switched the recorder on. He turned away from Murphy, put the call on speaker, 
and answered with a curt, Hello? There was no immediate answer, but he could tell someone was there. While he waited for a response, he looked back at Murphy, who was tapping out a message on his own phone, no doubt telling Central Command that Blake was calling. They would be able to pinpoint his location in real time. Unless Blake had done something creative, which was always a possibility. Either way, Blake had made a deliberate decision to contact them using Kowalski's phone, which meant he was doing it for a reason. Am I speaking to Mr. S? The voice on the other end of the phone asked quietly. Stark glanced at Murphy. The phones they used were burners, always discarded following a mission. They contained only the numbers of the other field ops, plus a generic number that automatically rerouted to central command. Because the numbers changed so frequently, there had to be a simple way of identifying them, so each was listed according to initial. Kowalski's phone would have contained four numbers, O for Ortega, S for Stark, U for Usher, and H for Home. It wasn't exactly an impenetrable code, but it didn't need to be. He considered his next words carefully. Negotiation is easier when both parties have names. I'm here, Blake. Call me Stark. Where are you? Bora Bora? You? What a coincidence. That's where we are. Buy you a drink? Some other time. Who else is listening in, Stark? Anyone I know? Murphy smiled and spoke in the direction of the phone. Long time no see, Hoss. Murphy, Blake said after a second. Stark caught an undercurrent of cold, burning anger in his voice that hadn't been there a moment ago. Wish I could say I've missed you. Likewise. Stark cleared his throat. Thanks for calling. I take it you want to discuss terms of surrender? Smart move. It'll go easier for everyone. New on the team, huh? Blake said, a hint of amusement in his voice. Not exactly. Then you've been around long enough to know why I'm not going to give myself up. I have an aversion to being shot in the back of the head. Come on, Blake. Doesn't have to go that way. In the corner of his eye, Stark saw Murphy smile as he said this. He ignored it, listening as Blake started talking again. Can I ask you something? Why now? I don't have to tell you anything, Stark said. Blake spoke again immediately, his voice breezy, as though politely dismissing a sales call. Well, good luck. It was nice talking. Wait. Stark said quickly. Why did you call? I wanted to make a deal. The two of them exchanged a glance. Murphy's grin widened at the confirmation of his theory. No deals, Blake, Murphy said, his voice resolute, giving no hint that this was exactly what he wanted. You're coming with us. Your call if you want to be vertical or horizontal. It's not as simple as that, though, is it? You don't just want me. You want the black book as well. Stark looked at Murphy again. The amusement had drained out of Murphy's eyes at the mention of the black book. So he did have it. I don't know what you mean, Stark said. Cut the bullshit, Blake said. I don't have time for this. We're listening, Murphy said. Good. But before I talk about the book... You're going to tell me why this is happening. No mystery about that, Blake, Stark said. You're a rogue element. You need to be taken out of circulation, one way or another, just like you said. We had an arrangement. Change of management, Stark said. We do things differently now. It doesn't look good to have an assassin running around, putting the unit at risk. There was a long pause. Blake, are you there? Stark asked. I don't suppose it would do any good to tell you whatever they told you about me is a lie. I'm talking to you now, Mr. S. I know Murphy knows it's bullshit. I didn't kill the senator. 
Stark glanced at Murphy, who was rolling his eyes again. That's right, Blake. You're a poor, innocent victim, Murphy said. None of us are Boy Scouts, but you crossed the line and you're on the other side now. It's nothing personal. You know that. Now it was Blake's turn to sound amused. I've heard you say that before, remember? You mentioned a deal, Stark said, cutting in. Let Bryant go, back off, and I hand over the black book. Stark opened his mouth, but Murphy got in first. We can talk about Bryant, and maybe we'll give you a head start if you tell us where the book is. Stark fixed Murphy with a stare that he hoped conveyed the message, what the hell are you doing? If Murphy noticed, he didn't acknowledge. Stark said, we'll discuss it, then call you back in an hour. I'll take that as a joke, Blake said, because if I didn't, I'd have to assume you're insulting my intelligence. Wait a minute, you can't... New York City, Tuesday night, Blake said, talking over Stark. Bring Bryant to Grand Central at 9 p.m., just one of you. I'll be able to pick your people out of any crowd. You know it, I know it. Blake, Murphy began, Grand Central, Tuesday, 9 p.m., see you there. The line went dead, and Stark and Murphy looked at each other. New York, Murphy said. Fits with our intel. Looks like we're in the right neighborhood. What intel? Stark said. It was the first time he'd heard the city mentioned in relation to Blake. You know, I spoke to Faraday a couple of hours ago. One of her pet cyber monkeys thinks they've narrowed down Blake's base to somewhere in New York. Probably upstate. Stark bit his tongue against the urge to make a comment about need to know. Instead, he focused on what this new development meant. If he's serious about making the trade, he'll need the Black Book first. If he told Bryant the truth, he stashed it at home, which means he's going to need to swing by en route to the city. Stark considered the new information. They had two locations. One a wide search area, and one a very specific location, and a rough time frame in which Blake would need to hit both over the next three days. But in the meantime, they could find out where he was right now. Stark dialed H, got the switchboard, and asked to be put through to Williamson. Murphy tapped him on the shoulder, and he remembered to put the call on speaker again. There was a click, a couple seconds of silence, and then Williamson's bored Midwestern drawl appeared on the line. Chicago. Chicago? Stark nodded. So they had been right to cover the destination of the Empire Builder. If only they hadn't been spread so thin. There were only two men in Chicago, both stationed centrally, as near as possible to the main transportation hubs. Uh-huh, Williamson agreed disinterestedly. Location is showing up bright and clear, South Lafayette Avenue. He's not running a bounce? Murphy asked. No way. This is crystal clear. Hasn't moved in the last five minutes. I take it you just finished the call? Stark bit back the impulse to make a sarcastic response. What the hell else would they have done before calling Williamson? Go out for a leisurely breakfast? Instead... He quickly asked, How close are Markham and Kowalski? He was unable to keep the excitement out of his voice. Kowalski is five minutes away and closing. Markham a little farther, only I haven't sent him there. What do you mean? There's a Greyhound station on West 95th, a quarter mile from the location. Markham's headed straight there. Nice work. Call me back as soon as anything's confirmed. Stark hung up and looked out of the window at the frozen fields outside the motel room window. He turned his head back to Murphy. This could be it. Murphy wore a troubled expression, as though this was a setback instead of an opportunity. He shook his head. He's not that stupid, Stark. With that, he opened the door 
and headed across the hall to the other room. Whatever happened next, there was no longer any reason to stick around this place a moment longer. Stark started packing his equipment, calculating how long it would take them to drive to the nearest airport. He knew Murphy was right to be skeptical, but he couldn't help wondering. Could Blake have finally slipped up badly enough to let them catch him? A Greyhound station made sense, after all. Another form of anonymous mass transit. Cash. No ID. A direct bus, leaving Chicago now, would get Blake to New York by tomorrow evening. Blake knew they would be able to pinpoint the phone's location, of course. But perhaps he wasn't banking on them having any kind of rapid response presence in that particular city. Of course, there was no way Blake would be in the same place by the time Kowalski arrived at the location, whether he made it there five minutes or five seconds from now. But Markham... Markham might well arrive at the Greyhound station on 95th at the same time as Carter Blake. And then Blake's trip would be cut short one way or another. Chapter 56 Chicago. As soon as I hung up, I put the phone down on the table and headed for the door, checking my watch. 11.17 p.m. I had picked my spot after careful thought. The back room of a bar within easy reach of the Greyhound station. I knew they wouldn't necessarily believe I was stupid enough to leave them a trail. But that wasn't the point. I wanted to give them some more loose ends they couldn't ignore, put some possibilities in front of them that would make them spread their resources more thinly. I knew it was likely they would have somebody in Chicago. Again, it was what I would have done. But unless that somebody happened to be standing right outside the bar, it wouldn't do them a lot of good. Even then, I wasn't leaving by the front entrance. That was the other reason I'd picked this spot. Assuming they had started tracking the phone the moment they saw Kowalski's number flash up, I estimated I would have a matter of minutes before they arrived, depending on how close they were. I opened the fire door and stepped out into the alley outside. It was deserted, just as it had been half an hour earlier when I had timed my route. I closed the door behind me until it locked, and then I jogged down the alley to where it opened on West 93rd Street. I waited for a gap in traffic, and then I crossed the street and entered the alley across the street, heading north via alleys for another two blocks, until I hit 91st, where the black Toyota sedan Banner had provided me with was parked at the side of the street. I took the key she had given me in the coffee shop from my pocket as I crossed to the car. I unlocked the door and got behind the wheel. My watch told me, that I had made it here in less than four minutes. I had already covered twice the distance I could have had I been driving. If it were me, in the absence of any other information, I would ignore Kowalski's phone and head for the nearest transport hub, which was the 95th Street Greyhound station. Misdirection. They would suspect it, but they'd have to check it out just the same. I twisted the keys in the ignition, and the engine grumbled to life. I pulled out into a gap in traffic and headed south and then east, scanning the road ahead and the mirrors for police cars or black SUVs. As the second hand hit the 12 to make it 11.33, I was on I-90, headed east, matching the brisk 60 of the other cars in my lane. The towers of Chicago reflected back at me in the rearview mirror. I hoped my pursuers would be there for a while yet. Five years ago, Cleveland, Ohio. How did you find me? Jake Martinez looked like a condemned man as he stood in the doorway of the unassuming suburban house on the outskirts of Cleveland. I simply stared at him for a while. I didn't want to admit to myself how much satisfaction I was taking in his discomfort. Eventually, I spoke. This isn't what you think, I said. I want to talk. He looked confused. I know about the senator. He sounded me out, too. I guess his mistake was to cast his net a little too wide. Murphy found out about it. 
I was marked before we shipped out. Why should I believe you? Because you're still breathing? I lifted my shirt from my belt, exposing the long, inexpertly stitched scar in my side. I winced as the fabric rubbed against the still raw skin. A retirement gift from Winterlong. He glanced at the wound and then opened the door wider. A couple of minutes later, I was sitting on the couch while Martinez brewed coffee in the small kitchen unit. I took my phone out for the millionth time and tapped into the new email account I had set up. Nothing. I didn't want to be here. I wanted to be in the apartment in New York, confirming that Carol was safe and well. I had emailed her as soon as I'd managed to get back into the country. I had told her that I would be there as soon as I could. But there was something I had to do first. Something that could keep us all safe. The first few stages of the long journey home had been fraught with close shaves. Only once I reached the border with Pakistan did I let my guard down enough to start looking into what had happened stateside. On the plane out of Karachi, I had caught up on the stories via half a dozen newspapers, reading between the lines of each one. The senator had died a few hours after his wife, following a last-ditch attempt at life-saving surgery. It had been a charity dinner, nothing particularly newsworthy, until a concealed gunman took the Carlsons down with three shots, two in the senator's head, the other hitting Elizabeth Carlson in the chest, rupturing her aorta. It was assumed she was collateral damage, but I knew better. It was a message. The hunt for the perpetrator hadn't taken long. An Iraq veteran with a long history of mental health issues named Evan Froelich had been found dead in his apartment shortly after his fingerprints were found at the scene of Carlson's murder. He had had some kind of grudge against the senator, as a file full of angry letters from him had attested. The story was he had lain in wait, killed the senator, gone home, and shot himself, open and shut. And nobody seriously questioned it, but the conspiracy nuts, who busied themselves blaming Mossad or the lizard people. I was looking at my blank inbox again when Martinez spoke from the kitchen. So, if you're not here to kill me, why did you take the trouble to track me down? It was the first thing he had said since inviting me in. I didn't have that much trouble, Martinez, I said, which means after we finish this conversation, you need to get the hell out of here and go somewhere you didn't spend successive vacations in 2002 and 2003. He nodded. My grandparents lived out here. If there's a consolation, I know there'll be a couple of days behind you, as usual. He came back out from behind the service island and put a mug of coffee down in front of me. Black, right? I nodded. The mug was red, with a picture of Pac-Man on it. So why are you here? He asked. Not that I don't appreciate the warning, you understand, but... I'm guessing this wasn't on your way. I took a sip of the coffee. I want to know what you took from the safe house. There was only one reason you would have vanished in the night rather than waiting out the mission. You didn't know they were onto me. So the only reason you would have risked attracting attention was because it was the only chance to get your hands on something you needed. Interesting theory. Senator Carlson told me he needed evidence that would give him Dracacus and the others. That was what you took, wasn't it? He drank his coffee, considering. It's over now. Carlson's dead. That's what happens to people who mess with him. We're not going to bring him back by risking our own necks, too. I know that. But we can split the risk. If Dracacus knows we both have the goods on him, we can make a deal. What kind of deal? The only deal open to us right now, as far as I can see. Forget we ever existed. It won't work, he said, shaking his head. So what's the alternative? Sit here and wait for them to come and get you? I'll do the talking. I'll make Dracacus understand. He's a pragmatist. 
and I'm not going to give him any choice. Martinez stared out of the window at the quiet suburban street outside. A trio of kids sailed by on bicycles, wrapped up well against the cold. We're dead men, you know that? He said, not looking at me. All we're doing is delaying the inevitable. We're all delaying the inevitable, Jake, I said. Doesn't mean it's not worth the effort. When he didn't respond, I asked him the question that had been niggling me since Afghanistan. Why me? What do you mean? It had to be you who told the senator he could trust me. What made you so sure? He shrugged, as though it was the first time he had considered the question, though I knew that couldn't be true. I know people. You were the only candidate. And later, over there, when the others were discussing detonating those car bombs and you talked them out of it, I knew I had the right guy. Martinez put his mug down. He got up and walked through to the hallway. I stayed put and listened as he ascended the creaking stairs. A couple of minutes later, he reappeared. He held out the palm of his hand, in which there were two tiny black flash drives. It's called the Black Book. Offline orders for operational commanders. There's a sunset script that lets you access it five times before it's wiped. One of these drives has two more access windows left, the other only has one. It may be technically possible to copy it, but it's beyond my skills, and I can't risk taking it to a third party. I take it you viewed them? Yeah, and I took screen prints for what they're worth. Without the metadata, they don't prove anything, but it's more than I expected. Between them, they have the details of the hit on Carlson together with a profile for Froelich, the guy they framed. Date stamps will confirm this was all planned out way in advance of the assassination. You're right. This is our ace in the hole. He handed one of the drives to me. That's the one with the Senator Carlson material. It's also the one with two windows remaining. You'll need to use one when you talk to Dracacus as proof. What's on your drive? I asked. Everything else. I held it between thumb and forefinger, wondering if this was the right thing to do, or merely the best thing to do in a bad situation. In the end, I decided saving my own skin was better than going out in a futile blaze of glory. I told myself I couldn't change anything anyway. Even if Winter Long was shut down, it would only be replaced by something just as bad. Let's get out of here, I said. Sunday, January 10th. Chapter 57. New York City. It was four o'clock in the morning when the car dropped Faraday off directly outside the anonymous office building on West 40th. Hank was her driver again. Hank had three ex-wives and five kids. This was more personal information than Faraday retained about anyone else in her working life. Unlike the other two drivers, Hank liked to talk. He was entirely unintimidated by her and chatted away like a cabbie while he drove. Faraday had been irritated by him at first and had come close to having him reassigned, but gradually she had warmed to his constantly upbeat attitude. Occasionally, she even engaged him in conversation. But not tonight. Tonight, even Hank had seemed to sense that silence was what was required. As he opened the door for her, he offered a smile. Hope you have a good day, Miss Faraday. She murmured a thank you and hurried through the main door to escape the chill wind cutting down 40th. She nodded to the security guard at the desk and swiped her pass to get through the barriers. She waited for the priority elevator and, once she was inside with the doors closed, withdrew a second pass, which allowed her to access the 27th floor. She had been away only long enough to go back to her apartment, shower, change into fresh clothes, 
and consume part of an uninspiring meal of sea bass and wild rice delivered hot to her door by Dean and DeLuca. When she realized she was far more interested in the fact her phone had not rung than the meal, she had scraped the remainder of it into the trash and called for a car. As she waited, she thought about black books and black boxes. Four hours on from the call from Kowalski's phone, and it had become abundantly clear that Carter Blake had managed to pull one more disappearing act. The phone had been found exactly where Williamson had pinpointed it during Blake's call. Kowalski had made the scene within minutes, eager for a rematch with the troublesome target who had broken his nose. It was a bar, quiet for a Saturday night. It had a back room that was empty of customers. On the table, nearest the entrance, was Kowalski's phone, placed carefully on top of a note that said, See you soon. Naturally, there were no cameras. The barmaid looked up from her magazine long enough to answer a couple of Kowalski's questions. She vaguely remembered a guy in his thirties with a crew cut buying a coffee, but she couldn't say when he'd left. There was a fire door in back, which meant Blake could have gone that way, or, just as likely, he could have left by the front door without the barmaid noticing. Meanwhile, Markham had arrived on scene at the 95th Street Greyhound Station. It was busy, but not so busy that he wouldn't have noticed Blake arriving in a hurry. The bus terminal was a long strip beneath a canopy. Markham had been able to position himself where he could see the passengers joining the various buses and the ticket booths. After twenty minutes had passed, there was still no sign of Blake. He called Kowalski, confirming he had retrieved his own phone from where Blake had discarded it. On Faraday's instructions, Kowalski had gotten back in his rented Ford and made circuits around the streets near the bar, while Markham kept watching the bus station, gradually becoming more and more certain he was wasting his time. They called up a list of the buses leaving the station within the window before and immediately after Markham had arrived on the scene, just in case he'd narrowly missed Blake, and found only two possibilities, headed for Memphis and Columbus, respectively. Faraday arranged for men to meet the two buses at their next scheduled stops and give them the once-over, putting a four-man team on the Columbus bus as the most likely option. She suspected it was a red herring. But a bus would be considerably easier to check than a train, at least. The elevator doors opened, and she crossed the corridor, tapped the code into the keypad, and entered the ops room. Aaron Kent, one of the three deputies beneath Murphy, was staring at the main display, satellite feeds showing various areas of the country. He turned when the doors opened, and Faraday looked at him. She didn't need to ask a question. Kent shook his head. No developments. Had there been any, she would have been contacted. She walked across to her office, leaving the door open so she could hear any changes in atmosphere from the ops room, and sat down behind her desk. No developments. Four hours on. She had ordered all of the technicians except Williamson to access security cameras around the general area of the bar. Unfortunately, the neighborhood was camera light, which was undoubtedly another reason Blake had selected it. There was nothing covering the front entrance to the bar, nothing covering the alley out back. With all of the resources at their disposal, the only thing they had established for sure was where Blake had been up until 11.17 p.m., Chicago time. Where had he gone after that? Thin air. Which was exactly the point. Of course, he hadn't been stupid enough to tell them exactly where he was without first making sure he had a guaranteed exit strategy. But equally, he knew they would have to take the bait. They would have to waste time and manpower making sure. Meanwhile, Blake was in a stolen car or hitching a prearranged ride or in a taxi already miles from the city. Or perhaps he was holed up somewhere safe in Chicago, knowing they were faced with a dead end on his movements. Perhaps the business about trading the black book for Bryant had been another ruse, another misdirection. 
Faraday shook her head. She couldn't help admiring the bastard's tactics. She wondered if he was enjoying himself a little. Blake was a master of the meticulous art of unpicking the diversionary tactics of a wily quarry. Perhaps it was exhilarating for him to be on the other end of the equation for once. After all, Blake knew every trick in the book. But then she reminded herself it was they who had written the book. And Blake would be too cautious to take this for granted, of course. He knew that they would have other, more indirect ways to track him down. As though in answer to her thoughts, Williamson appeared above her, an expression of barely concealed glee on her face. The house? Williamson didn't reply. She simply turned and walked back out into the ops room. Faraday followed, too excited to be irritated. This was not easy, Williamson said as she sat down at her computer. I had to chase up every cash sale individually. I narrowed the list down to 50 potential properties purchased in upstate New York in the last five years. Then I accessed power company records to look at billing patterns. Six of them show extended periods with minimal usage. Suggesting those are periods when the property's empty, Faraday said. Right. Only one of them shows drops in power usage around the times we know Blake was in other places. Utilities are billed to a John Kirby, and guess what? On closer inspection, there's one big difference between John Kirby and any of the other bill payers. Kirby doesn't exist? Bingo. Williamson punctuated the word by hitting a key that brought up a satellite image of a house set into a clearing, surrounded by dense woods on all sides. A narrow access road led out to a main road. Faraday took a breath to steady herself and leaned in over Williamson's shoulder. Where? It's a few miles outside of a town called Wilston, about a hundred miles north of Albany. For the first time in days, Emma Faraday smiled. Chapter 58 New York City We go in, secure the house, find the black book. Faraday looked up from the table screen in the ops room and raised an eyebrow. You make it sound very simple, Murphy. What are you going to do with the rest of the day? If your people have the right house, we'll do the rest, Murphy said. So I guess the real question is, how sure are you? It was a good question. Faraday disliked issuing absolute guarantees, and Murphy knew it. Sure enough that we're having this conversation, she replied. It tallies with your interrogation of Bryant, doesn't it? That it does. When Murphy had revealed what Bryant had told him about the house and the bookcase, Faraday had been skeptical. Why would Blake trust a petty thief with his secrets? But when it emerged that Blake had held back some key details, it started to sound more in keeping with his reputation as a strategic planner. This in itself was a matter of concern. It suggested Blake really was considering leaking the contents of the Black Book. Not for the first time, Faraday wished that she knew exactly what information was on that drive. She had a pretty good idea, but no specifics. When Murphy had told her about Bryant's description of a farmhouse in upstate New York, she knew Williamson had found the right house. Too much of a coincidence for this not to be the place. From the moment Williamson had pinpointed the farmhouse, Faraday knew they would have to move fast. Luckily, the objective was not complicated, even if Murphy was making it sound easier than it was. They had had months to make plans for an assault on Blake's home in the event it was located. All that was required now was to plug the new information into the plan. Their first priority was to secure the location and ensure that any sensitive material in Blake's possession was reclaimed. It was likely Blake was headed for home, but the fact he was forced to travel by road meant they would beat him to the punch. The clock was ticking, though. With the knowledge of the location, they had narrowed down to several potential strategies 
for deciding on an expedited ground assault, time to ensure they took the house before Blake could reach it. Faraday had convened a small group of the men who would be involved. Murphy, Dixon, Usher, and Stark. Murphy and Dixon outlined the assault plan, while Usher and Stark red-teamed it, coming up with holes in the strategy. Somebody referred to it as Operation Homecoming, and since nobody could come up with a more apt name, it stuck. Easier to come in on a Black Hawk, maybe two, Stark said. I know you don't want to. Helos are out, Murphy cut in, nodding at one of the screens, which was displaying weather predictions for the next 48 hours. The blizzard is going to be bad and getting worse by the time we get out there. Which means satellite surveillance is out, right? Usher said. What about other comms? I'm assured they should hold up, Faraday said. Stark said, what's Blake's ETA, assuming he really is coming home? He's coming home, Murphy asserted. Faraday tapped on a tab at the bottom of the screen to switch to a map showing the ground Blake had to cover. We have a last fixed point of Chicago at midnight eastern, almost 900 miles, assuming he's able to take the most direct route. Even if he has a car, and not accounting for traffic, bad weather, or needing to sleep, the fastest he could possibly get there is 2, 3 o'clock this afternoon. Realistically, we're talking tomorrow evening. By which time, we'll be bedded in and ready to welcome him back, Murphy said. Stark tapped another tab and brought the satellite image of the farmhouse back up. He stood back and examined the knot of buildings. What about security precautions he may have taken? Nothing we can't handle. We've taken way more heavily defended places than this, Dixon said. What if he doesn't live alone? What if the house isn't empty? Then we'll take prisoners, Murphy said smoothly. Or we won't. Depends what the welcome is like. Faraday looked at the group of buildings, the house and a series of outbuildings. They looked like monopoly houses from above. She looked at the timeline. She looked at the weather reports. They would have to go soon if they were going to go. Anything else? She asked the four of them. If somebody's thinking about something we haven't already gone over a dozen times, now is the time to say it. She looked at the four men in turn. Nobody said anything. Murphy was watching her with a weird intensity. Dixon simply shook his head. Usher was staring back at her impassively. Stark? He said nothing for a moment, and then shook his head slowly. I think we covered everything. She turned back to Murphy. Once again, she wondered if he knew what was in those missing files Drakakis had purged. She had come close to calling him in to ask him about it, deciding against it. Whatever Murphy knew, it could wait. How many in your team? Murphy answered immediately. Other than the four of us? We'll need Markham. Kowalski wants in on it. He owes Blake a bloody nose. Three more. One to set up on the main road and look out for Blake. Two to babysit Bryant and the cars. Ortega's out of action, so I'll take Walker and the twins. Faraday's eyes narrowed. Abrams, Jennings, and Walker, then. And you're set on taking Bryant along? Murphy nodded. He's on the level with what he's telling us. You think he could be holding anything back? Murphy thought about it. I'm not sure. That's part of why I want him there. This thing with the bookcase is interesting. Besides, if Blake shows up, it could be handy to have him around. Faraday moved on. Nine men. You don't think you need more, given how much trouble this particular subject has already caused us? Murphy put both palms on the edge of the horizontal monitor and leaned over it, as though surveying a pool table before a break. You don't need an army for this kind of job. You just need the right team. Small footprint. Faraday said nothing. 
surveying the four men as they waited for her word. She turned away from them and looked at the clock on the wall. The seconds ticked past, like a countdown. Then I guess you had better ready your team, Murphy. Let's all hope this goes as smoothly as you expect. Chapter 59 Upstate New York The Northeast was bracing for the worst. The governors of New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island had ordered states of emergency in advance of what was being called a potentially historic blizzard. In New York State, a curfew of 5 o'clock was instituted. All vehicles had to be off the road or their owners would face arrest. All businesses, schools, and government offices up to the Canadian border were closing. Air traffic was grounded. Emergency services were on high alert. The entire region was on lockdown. Emergency preparation plans had been put into action. The various services coordinated to respond quickly to weather-related incidents. Thousands of municipal workers dug in for a long shift, gritting their teeth and thinking of the overtime. Everyone else shut the doors, closed the drapes, and settled in to make the most of the unexpected confinement. There was a holiday atmosphere for most, a tense, game-time feeling for those who were working to maintain the most vital infrastructure. The freezing air sang with the invisible trails of a hundred million phone calls and emails and text messages and public service tweets. Nobody paid much attention to the brief, three-sentence communication instructing all personnel to keep clear of a series of roads within a five-square-mile area of upstate New York. If things hadn't been so hectic, somebody might have been curious enough to ask for more information. There might have been speculation about why a particular stretch of country with barely any homes and no obvious danger spots should be temporarily put off limits. And whoever was doing the speculating would probably conclude that there was some sort of military operation underway. Moving equipment or sensitive material from one secure location to another, maybe. Or perhaps some sort of drill. That would make sense in the severe winter conditions, after all. But everyone was too busy to have time for such speculations. And so the road crew responsible for that particular grid sector simply shrugged and crossed one more problem off their list. So it was that the team assigned to mount the incursion on Carter Blake's house found themselves entirely alone on the stretch of State Route 73 after the intersection with Highway 9A. They traveled in two black SUVs. Each vehicle carried five men. Stark drove the lead car. Dixon sat alongside him, Usher, Kowalski, and Walker in the back. The rearmost car was driven by Abrams and contained three other operatives, Murphy, Jennings, and Markham, and one reluctant passenger, Scott Bryant. The snow had been coming down on and off all day, and if the National Weather Service was right, it was about to get a lot worse. The storm front approaching from the east was about to drop up to 30 inches of snow across the area, with conditions being particularly bad north of Albany. Stark glanced up at the darkening sky again. The sun had been concealed behind storm clouds all day, and night was on its way. The drive had taken much longer in the conditions. He was actually glad that an approach by helicopter had been ruled out. The road conditions were getting worse and worse, not just because of the new snow falling, but because the farther north they got, the more severe the conditions had been earlier. At times, the convoy had to slow to walking pace to negotiate big drifts blocking the road. Stark thought about the briefing back in the city, going over all the information they had on the house. It was another of the advantages about working stateside. They had a lot more data to work with than they were used to. This wasn't some compound in a war-torn corner of the Middle East, something that had been built in secret and had to be surveyed using satellite images and educated guesses. The house had a name, Hamilton Falls Farm. It had been built at the end of the 19th century 
and owned by the same family until the last descendant had died in the 90s and the property had lain empty for a few years, quietly going to seed. It had been restored following a small fire in 2008. This was a lucky break for them because it meant they had access to the architect's plans, lodged with the county before the refurbishment project began. There were even photographs of most of the interior rooms, albeit from a few years before, when the house was last on the market. There were full details of utilities and phone lines to the house. With one signal to Central Command, they could cut the house's life support. No lights, no phone, no internet. But that would likely be a mere precaution. All available intelligence suggested that the owner of the house would not be at home. Not yet, anyway. There were two objectives to the incursion. The primary objective was to go in fast and secure the house. With luck and Bryant's help, they would find the black book and Blake's one remaining item of leverage would be gone. There were only two possible outcomes to that objective. They would find it, or they wouldn't. Either way, the secondary objective would be the same, to dig in and wait for their unsuspecting target to make it to what he almost certainly believed was the safety of home plate. And then there would be nowhere else to run. They passed by the access road to Hamilton Falls Farm and continued for about a mile. There was a logging trail that entered the woods off the main road. It was just a dirt track entirely covered by the snow. Stark only found it because he was looking carefully and identified the gap in the trees. The lead car made the turn and bumped onto the track, the four-wheel drive getting them over the initial snowbank and coping easily with the trail once they made it beneath the partial tree cover. Even so, the snow was still finding its way through the canopy. The black and white verticals of the forest created a strobe effect in the headlights. Running according to the plan, they followed the trail for almost two miles, angling northeast away from the house at first before curving south to bring them within a half mile of the house cross-country. The two SUVs came to a stop at the prearranged drop point, a clearing beside a ramshackle wooden bridge. The bridge crossed the river, marking the boundary of the land that belonged to the house. Although they were reasonably sure that Blake lived alone, no one had given any consideration to simply driving up to the main entrance. Even if, as they expected, the house was deserted, there was no telling what defenses or early warning systems Blake might have put in place. And besides, if, as the intelligence suggested, he was headed back here, they wanted to extend him a surprise welcome. They debarked from the SUVs and prepared to move. Abrams and Markham were positioned with the cars to guard Bryant until they'd secured the house, as well as to make sure no one else approached from this angle. Walker headed back out to keep eyes on the main road. The men pulled on white snow camouflage winter combat jackets and gloves. They checked their equipment. Night vision goggles, AR-15 assault rifles, flashbangs, and incendiary grenades. Stark checked the coordinates on his GPS tracker. Across the bridge, and then half a mile due south through the trees. When the preparations were complete, there was one last thing to do. Abrams opened the back of the second SUV, and Stark and Jennings collected two additional loads, backpacks weighing around 20 pounds. Stark grunted as he hefted the additional weight. He was grateful that this extra load would only have to be taken on a one-way trip. Carter Blake had tried to leave the war behind a long time ago. Now it was time for the war to come home. Chapter 60 Stark had been walking for five minutes when he saw the slivers of open ground between the trees ahead, and he knew they were in reach of their goal. The trek through the woods was hard going in the darkness, with the snowfall filtering through the branches above. The snow on the ground helped by amplifying ambient light, but hindered by obscuring deadfalls and 
on one occasion, a small stream. The men, although more used to enduring the heat and dust of desert warfare, adapted themselves quickly to the terrain, and they made swift progress. They had split into three two-man teams, approaching the target in triangle formation, with Team 1, Stark and Murphy, taking the apex of the triangle. They slowed as they reached the edge of the woods. Although it was just after 3.30 in the afternoon, it felt like dusk had already fallen. The buildings of the property lay ahead across a large expanse of level ground, a barn, some unused stables, and the house itself. The house was a sprawling structure, two floors and an attic, with a sharp pointed roof in the center and a series of jutting outposts where the first floor had spread out for comfort. It was almost completely in darkness, except for a single light burning in a room on the second floor. Stark hunched down and cast his eyes left and right until he saw the other two pairs get into position, equally spaced across the edge of the open ground. One by one, each man called in his position over the open channel on their headsets. Team Two, Usher, and Jennings, their signals op, were roughly west of Stark and Murphy's position. Murphy addressed Jennings, not needing to raise his voice above a whisper, though the other man was thirty yards away. Welcome, Matt. Stark could see Jennings's head was down, scanning the screen of the device in his hand. He responded in an equally quiet tone, his voice carried to the rest of the team crystal clear over headsets. Motion sensors at twenty yards out. Looks clear otherwise. Can you jam the sensors? Murphy responded. Already done. Murphy turned his eyes to Stark and nodded. Time to go. Okay, let's just hope the son of a bitch doesn't have landmines. Stark didn't think he had been addressing that to anyone in particular, but Jennings responded anyway. Negative on that, as far as we can tell? As far as we can tell. The words echoed in Stark's head. Good to have certainties. Jennings completed the sweep and reported no other security on the approach. Stark saw him tapping out a short signal back to base, knowing that he was sending a simple one-word message. Dark. Almost instantly, the solitary light on the upper floor winked out. The big house lay before them, as black and uninviting as a freshly dug grave. Stark suppressed a shiver that had nothing to do with the cold. Murphy told Team Two to be ready to provide cover before signaling for Team Three's approach to begin. The pair of men east of them, Kowalski and Dixon, began the advance. Dixon hung back, covering the windows of the house with his rifle, as Kowalski approached the house at a weaving run, his footsteps crunching softly in the deep snow. You could lay the groundwork as well as possible. You could make sure your firepower was overwhelmingly superior you could confirm to within a 99% probability that there were no hostiles. But an approach over open ground to a target location was always nerve-wracking. Spacing out to present distinct targets meant that you would get advance warning of any hostile action, but that was of little comfort to the unlucky one on the receiving end of that action. Stark breathed out, as Kowalski made the cover of the awning hanging over the north side of the house. Dixon covered the same ground just as quickly, and the two men paused before splitting and circling the perimeter. Stark waited until both men had vanished around the sides of the building before looking back to the spot where he knew Team Two was. He saw Jennings quickly, but it took him a second to find Usher, who was almost invisible in his cover spot. He glanced at Murphy who was staring straight ahead, intently focused on the house, as though he expected it to start moving. South side clear, came Dixon's voice a moment later. Murphy spoke softly into the mic on his headset, and a few moments later, two more white shapes split off from the tree cover 
and began to approach the house. Jennings and Usher gained the perimeter of the house quickly and moved into their assigned positions at the front entrance. As soon as the two called in their positions, Murphy and Stark left cover and approached the house. As the others had done, they split out into a widening V formation, headed for opposite ends of the north side of the house. Stark kept his AR-15 raised, his eyes on the window that had been lit. He knew it had been a security light to make the house look inhabited, but he had to focus somewhere. Stark made the shelter of the awning in front of the big picture window of the living room. Peering through it, he could see by the meager light still in the sky that the room was sparsely furnished. Couch, television, books lining the entirety of the opposite wall. A door in the bookcase wall was closed, and he knew from the floor plans it led into the central hallway. Murphy joined him at the window, the two of them exchanging a glance that said, so far, so good. Murphy nodded toward the northeast corner of the house. They moved in single file toward the corner that would take them around to the front of the house, the side that faced the main driveway. When Stark saw a moving shadow, he called out the passphrase in a low voice. Tango! Disco! came the reply, equally quietly. Stark rounded the corner and came face to face with Dixon. They passed by each other, and Dixon continued his circuit of the perimeter. When Stark and Murphy reached the wraparound porch and the front door, Usher and Jennings were waiting for them. Murphy tapped the square button on his earpiece again. Kowalski, Dixon, are you in position? There was a pause before Kowalski answered in the affirmative. Back door is secure. Dixon had completed his circuit and was with Kowalski covering the back door, just in case somebody was at home and tried to sneak out. The advance intel showed that the previous owner had installed an Axiom burglar alarm about a decade before. It was an expensive model. Battery backup, so it wouldn't be affected by the power cut. There was no reason for Blake to have changed the alarm, other than extreme caution. Jennings was prepped for the Axiom. They examined the door. It was solid wood, maybe with steel behind it. The lock was six-point contact. Nothing out of the ordinary, but certainly secure enough for a normal household. It took Jennings 30 seconds to pick it. On standard ops like this, they wouldn't bother with such niceties. But there was no need to blow the door, and this way would mean the house looked undisturbed. That would be important later. Jennings glanced at the others when he was ready. The others trained their weapons on the door as he turned the handle. Before he had gotten it open two inches, the noise started. Deafeningly loud in the silence, a dog was barking within. Jennings' gun jumped up in his hand. The four of them exchanged quick glances. Nobody said anything about a dog, Stark said, eyeing the door. Shoot it? Usher suggested indifferently. His gun was raised, and he was peering into the darkness within. The dog, wherever it was, had yet to come into the light. Stark shrugged and nodded. He liked dogs. He didn't like them enough to get bitten trying to restrain one or to waste time they'd need to deactivate the alarm. Stark, Usher, and Murphy trained their guns on the door as Jennings pushed it open. Stark's eyes narrowed as they saw an empty hallway, but the barking continued, sounding as though it were right on top of them. It took a second to locate the source, a small speaker attached to the wall beside a keypad. The barking sound was obviously rigged to activate when anyone approached the door, or perhaps when the handle was turned. A cheap security device, more a novelty toy than anything else. The keypad beside it was the entry device for the real alarm, and Stark suspected that would be anything but. Jennings was examining it, shaking his head. A wire led from the keypad to a sealed white box on the wall. This ain't an axiom. Can you turn it off? Stark wasn't too perturbed if the answer was no. 
If they could get in without leaving an obvious trace, so much the better. But the main thing was, they now had access to the house. Jennings nodded, not looking happy. Of course I can. As he spoke, he was shining some sort of black light over the keypad, presumably to check if Blake had made the classic mistake. He shook his head. He taps the keys. Meaning, Blake either changed the code regularly, or he made a point of periodically tapping all nine number keys on the pad so that an intruder would not easily be able to narrow down the specific set of numbers that compose the code. Jennings reached into his pack and withdrew a couple of small handheld devices. Discarding one, he held the other up to the keypad and tapped a couple of keys. After a pause, the device beeped and a five-digit code appeared on the screen. Jennings' fingers danced quickly across the pad on the wall. The red light switched to green, and the low electronic whine that was barely audible under the barking cut out. Irritated, Jennings reached up and yanked the speaker off the wall, silencing the barking noise. Absolute quiet descended, and the four of them took a moment to listen for any sounds from within the house. After a couple of seconds, Stark heard a series of soft clicks as the others turned on their night vision goggles. The intelligence all but guaranteed they were alone. But intelligence can be wrong. Safer to clear each level of the building without flashlights to ensure they had an edge over anyone who could be lurking within. Stark and Jennings slid their additional packs off and left them in the hallway. They would unload the contents later. Relieved to be unencumbered by the pack, Stark slid his own goggles down over his eyes and clicked the switch at the side, blinking his eyes as they adjusted to the pixelated green wash that lit the darkened hallway up as bright as a summer noon. He moved his head from side to side, taking in the surroundings in the amplified ambient light. His breath caught in his throat as he saw movement out of the corner of his eye from a direction away from the other three men. He jerked his head around, raising his gun. A familiar figure duplicated his actions precisely. Stark smiled. He had been about to open fire on a hostile full-length mirror. He lowered his gun and let out a relieved breath as he took stock of the layout, ticking off comparisons to the schematic in his head. The hallway was large, three doors to the left, the farthest of which had to lead to the attached garage on the west side of the building. Ahead was the stairs to the second floor. On the right was the door to the living room. The floor was wood, looked like the original floorboards. The walls of the hallway were unadorned. There were no furnishings beyond a coat rail by the door that held a raincoat and a leather jacket. All right, Murphy said. We secure the building first, then we see what we can see. Stark realized he was holding his breath again as he approached the stairs. Chapter 61, Upstate New York I made pretty good time from Chicago, spurred on by the apocalyptic tone of the weather reports on the radio. I drove 500 miles straight through the night, knowing that the heavy flurries of snow were merely a curtain raiser for the main event farther east. I was dead tired by the time the sky began to lighten, and a near miss with an articulated truck outside of Buffalo convinced me that I needed a break and a lot of caffeine. I pulled into the next rest stop and went into the diner. I took a booth and ordered French toast, bacon, hash browns on the side, and a large pot of coffee. While I waited, I wound my watch ahead for the hour I had lost on the trip. It was just after 9 a.m. local time. I took out the phone Banner had given me and switched it on. I connected to the diner's Wi-Fi and checked the weather again. It wasn't looking good. I checked one other thing before the waitress returned with my order. I drank the first cup of coffee so fast that it scorched my tongue and took it easier with the second one 
feeling my senses sharpen as the caffeine started to do its work. I poured a third cup before I started on the food. Half an hour later, I was feeling just about comfortable with the idea of being behind the wheel again. It was technically daylight by then, but not so you would know it from the sky. I had found a Coleman Hawkins CD in the glove box and listened to it on repeat for a hundred miles or so. As dark gray morning became dark gray afternoon, I switched back to the radio. The East Coast was on lockdown. All public transportation was to be suspended from five o'clock. All businesses closed. I took the news of the strict curfew after five with mixed emotions. It would keep the way clear for me, but it would also make it riskier to complete the trip. Then again, the curfew was focused on the big metropolitan areas, where a lone car on the streets would be far more noticeable. I had hoped to make my destination in daylight. Now, I would be grateful just to get there. It was after four when I hit the outskirts of Wilston, and it was clear that the Toyota Banner had provided me with was going to be a poor match for the incoming weather. An SUV would have been better, but I reminded myself that beggars can't be choosers. I pulled over and took Banner's phone out again. No 4G, not even half a G. Coverage was patchy at the best of times out here, but in these conditions, you could forget about it. It had been more than an hour since I had been able to access the Internet. I pulled back onto the road, the tires spinning a little, struggling to get traction, and drove down Main Street. The deserted sidewalks behind the walls of plowed snow and the rows of shuttered stores on the main drag made me worry I'd left it a little too late. An hour ahead of the curfew, and barely one in five businesses on the street seemed to be open. I guessed most folks were headed home to batten down the hatches or, already there, relaxing in the warmth and watching the action on the news. I was starting to give up hope when I saw exactly what I needed. An outdoor supply store. The only problem was, there was a guy outside pulling down the shutters. I pulled the car to the side of the road and parked. The five-foot-high frozen mound of plowed snow at the side of the road meant I was actually parking close to the middle of the road, but there wasn't enough traffic for that to be a problem. I opened the door and yelled a greeting at the guy pulling down the shutters. When the figure turned around, I saw it wasn't a man at all, but a woman wearing a bulky gray coat. Her pink face peered out at me from within the hood. She waved the hooked pole she had been using to draw down the shutters in the direction of the door. Sorry, we're closed. I shut the door of the Toyota and hurried around to where there was a dip in the snowdrift, half stepping, half stumbling over it. She watched me as I approached, shaking her head vehemently and gripping the pole in one hand. I'm sorry, she repeated. Come on, I said, smiling and trying to look cold and desperate. It wasn't difficult, a method performance, you might say. It's kind of an emergency. She didn't say anything. Her eyes looked me up and down from behind eyelashes that had caught some flakes of snow. I need to get to my mother's house, before the curfew. She lives alone. She remained tight-lipped. I just need a proper code and a couple of other things. I'll be five minutes. If you want me to make it worth your while... Well, I don't have much extra money, but... She let out an exasperated sigh, and I knew then she was going to give me my five minutes. I hoped I could talk her into something else, too. Chapter 62 New York City Williamson called Faraday over without looking up from her screen. They're in. No resistance. Faraday nodded. The update had to have come in on the sat phone. There had been a tense few minutes when the communications had gone offline on the team's approach to the house. The storm had knocked out cell towers across the region, so they had had an hour or so to get used to not having standard phones. It was frustrating. She had run operations on the other side of the world with far greater real-time information than what she had access to this time. Is Murphy on the line? Stark, Williamson replied. Put him on. 
Williamson handed her the headset, and she addressed Stark. Talk to me. House is secured. Security was as expected, and we have finessed it. Nothing bent, nothing broken, no welcoming committee. Excellent. Come back to me if anything develops. Stark signed off, and Faraday handed the headset back to Williamson. The adrenaline rush of the approach to the house was over. It was a waiting game now. She would receive hourly updates unless one of two things happened. The team found the black book, or Carter Blake arrived home. Five years ago, New York City. Martinez and I laid out a plan of action, and each of us took one of the black books. We shook hands outside of the little house in Cleveland, and I knew I would never see him again. On my trip back to the city, I prepared a short video presentation which I sent by secure email to Dracacus's address. I laid out the salient facts in the video. The first point was indisputable. I was alive and well, and so Murphy had screwed up in his task of killing me. I knew they would suspect that anyway, given that no bodies had been found at the scene. Second, I confirmed what I imagined were their worst fears. Martinez had gotten out of Afghanistan, too, and we had been in touch. I didn't talk about where I was, where he was, anything like that. I simply held up the black drive Martinez had given me so the viewer could take a good look at it. And then I switched to a series of screen grabs from the data on the file. I had had to burn one of the two remaining view windows to take these, but that was unavoidable. I ran through various screen grabs as a slideshow. I didn't talk over this part. The slides told the story for themselves, the real story of the Carson assassination. I finished the clip with the camera back on me. I'll talk to you soon. I gave Dracacus half an hour to sweat after I sent the email, and then I dialed his number on the burner cell. I'm speaking to a dead man, he said, in lieu of a hello. I got that message, back in Kandahar, I said. Somebody ought to have told you that threats work better before you fail to follow through on them. I want that fucking drive back. Be more reasonable. Otherwise, you get it back via the front page of the New York Times. You wouldn't dare. Why not? What have I got to lose? There was a pause, and his voice was more controlled when it came back. What do you want? You already know what I want. Forget I exist. Forget about Martinez, too. As far as you're concerned from this moment forward, we never came back from Afghanistan, which is just the way you planned it, of course. As long as you leave us alone, we'll keep quiet. But if I get a hint that you're trying to come after either of us or anybody else connected to us, if that information comes to light, you'll be jeopardizing. I don't think you realize the severity of this situation, Dracacus. You made a bad situation a hundred times worse. You turned a worst-case scenario of bad publicity and a career setback into a grade-A clusterfuck. You ordered the murder of a United States senator and his wife. I leaked this file, and you and your friends aren't just fire going to jail. Remind me, is it the gas chamber or lethal injection at Leavenworth? He didn't say anything for a minute trying to calculate a way out of this that didn't involve him having to trust the word of a man he'd just tried to have murdered. There wasn't one. You're lucky I'm offering you this deal, Dracacus, I said. You think this sits right with me? You think I want to let you get away with this? The only reason we're having this conversation is because I know the only course of action that makes sense is stalemate. Like the old days, mutually assured destruction. Neither one of us is going to win this war. You walk away, I walk away. Clear? I heard the sound of Dracacus clearing his throat when he spoke again 
It was like he was spitting the words out through his teeth, with a gun to his head. In a way, he was. You have a deal. And I take it it goes without saying. You know what will happen to you if those files ever see the light of day. They won't find us all. They won't find me. No matter where I have to go. And I'll hunt you down to the fucking ends of the earth and cut your heart out. I'm glad we see eye to eye. I cut the call and dropped the phone in a nearby trash can. I walked two blocks south and then flagged down a cab. I told the driver to take me to an address in Hell's Kitchen. The apartment was a sixth floor walk-up. I had leased it as a precaution after my first meeting with the senator, paying six months' rent in advance. I had a feeling I might soon be in need of somewhere in the city that was off the grid, held under a different name. I didn't know how right I had been. As I approached the building, I tried to blank my mind, to not think about why there had been no emails from Carol. I had tried calling her cell several times over the last few days, as much to reassure myself that she really had gotten rid of it as anything else. Each time the call had gone straight to voicemail. I checked the mail slot downstairs. The key was gone. I climbed the six flights of stairs and took my gun out, holding it by my side. I stood to one side of the door and took my own key from my pocket and slid it quietly into the lock. I twisted it and pushed. The door swung silently inward on hinges I had greased two months before. There was a short hallway terminating in a window that looked out into the air shaft. Bathroom and bedroom on one side, combination kitchen and living room on the other. All three doors were closed. I stood in the doorway listening for sounds. No footsteps, no springs settling on the couch, no TV noise, no cooking sounds. Nothing. Hello? I called. It's me. There was no response. Either nobody was here, or somebody was here, and was deliberately keeping silent. I held my breath and turned the handle on the nearest door, the bathroom. It swung open, and I brought my gun up, checking the tiny cramped room and shower cubicle. It was empty, but there was a pink disposable razor in the trash that I was pretty sure wasn't mine. Bedroom next. The small double bed was made up more neatly than I'd left it. But there was nobody on it. Under it or in the minuscule closet. So far, so good. Carol had made it here by the looks of things, and there were no signs of struggle so far. But I still had one room to check. I held my breath and twisted the handle on the living room door. The door swung in, and I stepped into the room, covering the space with my gun. It was empty. I breathed out at last. I had been worried about finding evidence of a struggle, or worse. Instead, the place was much as I'd left it. Couch, television, bookcase, all of which had come as part of the lease. The tiny kitchen took up the westernmost quarter of the room, separated from the living space by a breakfast counter with two high stools. There was a sealed, cream-colored envelope on the surface. I holstered my gun and walked across the room in three strides. I ripped open the envelope, knowing in my heart of hearts what the letter would say. The message was briefer than I had anticipated, but I had guessed right. It was a single sheet of notepaper, clear, concise. Carol had said it all with four words in her inimitable curling script. Don't look for me. I took it to the couch and sat there for a half hour, occasionally reading the note again to see if it had changed. It never did. After a while, I realized that the light in the room had changed, 
as the sun sank below the skyline, and that time hadn't really been standing still after all. I had done everything I'd come back to New York to do, and it was time to move on. I went into the bathroom and took a shower. I found a pair of scissors and my own razor in the cabinet and started to work on the beard that had grown back over the past few weeks. When I was done, I looked like a new man, a man with no past and an uncharted future. I examined the new man in the mirror as I toweled off my face. I wondered what his name was. Then I locked up, walked back down the six flights, and out onto the street. I walked a couple of blocks west and descended to the 50th Street subway. I took the E-line south to Penn Station, and then I stood below the departures board, watching the destinations flash up on the screen and deciding where I wanted to start my new life. Chapter 63, Upstate New York. It took them what felt like a long time to clear every room of the house. It was somehow larger than it looked from outside. Perhaps there was some kind of optical illusion where the vastness of the sky and the woods and the hills outside somehow diminished the house itself. But the layout conformed to the plans they'd studied ahead of time. Three bedrooms, only one made up. A study with every wall lined with books. A living room with even more books, a large dining kitchen, two bathrooms, one upstairs, one down, an attic that was entirely empty, and a large cement-floored basement. On the south side of the building was a small garage that contained a battered ten-year-old jeep. The basement was accessed via a locked door and a set of stairs. There was a work desk and tools, some boxes full of stored junk, and a single wide steel bookcase on the wall. Jennings examined the edges of it and knocked on the wall. He looked at Stark and Murphy, who were waiting for his verdict. Could be something back there, he said. We can blow it to find out. Bad idea, Stark said, examining the edges of the bookcase. We don't know if it's rigged to prevent forced entry. Murphy nodded in agreement. Stark knew he wouldn't want to risk losing the contents within if there was another option. He tapped the square button on his headset. Markham, bring our guest to the house. Murphy's instincts had been right about Blake offering to deal for Bryant. Maybe he would be right that Bryant could help them open the secret door if there was one. While they waited for Markham to escort Bryant from the cars to the house, Stark left Murphy and Jennings downstairs and made another tour around the above-ground floors, spending more time to take in the details, the little things about a dwelling that told you about the owner. Books aside, it was striking how spartan the house was. There were no pictures on the walls, no ornaments, no interesting kitchenware beyond the basic implements. It was so devoid of clutter that Stark might have described it as a show home, except that a show home would have been artfully dressed to suggest more of a personal touch. He supposed it made sense. Blake was a man used to being on the road. He had carried this aesthetic with him when he'd left Winterlong, maybe even without realizing it. This was a place to disappear from the world when he needed to, to relax and recuperate hence the books, but not a place to live. Before they found the bookcase, Stark had started to worry that Faraday and Murphy had miscalculated. They had banked on Blake's homing instinct, bringing him back here, to where he would think he was safe. But what if they were wrong? Maybe Blake would simply drop off the face of the earth, cash in his chips, and start again with a new name. He had done it before, after all. The next few hours would give them the answer to that. Taking Blake's last known position in Chicago as a starting point and extrapolating using various scenarios, excluding flying, of course, Blake would be getting here at some point in the next few hours. The weather and the official curfew might have chased him off the road, of course, 
but Stark doubted it. A little heavy weather wouldn't dissuade a guy like Blake, not when he had a self-imposed deadline at Grand Central on Tuesday night. The one unknown quantity was the Black Book. If Blake had it on his person, he could head straight to New York City. Might be there already, in fact. But that was unlikely. Something so valuable would be stored safely, not carried around on every job, where it could be lost or stolen or damaged. It made sense that it would be here, and the bookcase in the basement existed, just as Bryant had described. In a little while, they would get their answer. Chapter 64 Bryant sat in the back of the SUV and watched the snow come down outside. The last of the daylight filtering through the tree cover had vanished. He had shelved any ideas of going anywhere long ago. The doors were locked, the safety mechanism engaged so they could not be opened from inside. Even had they been unlocked, he knew there would be a bullet in his head before he could fully open the door. It had been more than an hour since the other men had left for the house. Again, he felt guilty for talking, for telling Murphy about the bookcase Blake had spoken about. But then... They'd evidently known about the place already. It wasn't as though Blake had given them an address. When he'd talked about the farmhouse in upstate New York, he realized he was just confirming.